All right, and we're recording. Hey gang, Andy here, and welcome to my brand new series called Andy Before Japandi. Now, in this video series, I'm going to be talking about various facets of my relationship with Japan, as well as document my return to the country in 2019 to go back to college. So, in this series, we're going to be talking about such things as Will Japan fix my problems? Why am I going to Tokyo instead of other parts of the country? As well as what I'm going to be packing for my study abroad in Japan. So in addition to that, we're also going to be going over some stories of my original time out in Japan from 2013 to 2015. But in today's video, we're going to be going over why I even want to go back to Japan in the first place. Now, to best answer this question, it's, well, best to uh, give you guys a brief history of my relationship with Japan, which we'll be getting into more detail in a future video, but just going to go over the brief Cliff's Notes version here to uh, give you guys some context. So, back in the early to mid-90s, my cousins were stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan, and they would send me home a bunch of little trinkets and souvenirs and stuff. And then in the late 90s, early 2000s was the big anime boom of America and then in the mid 2000s is when YouTube came around and that's when a lot of the early J vloggers like Tokyo Kuni and Tokyo Swan came onto the scene and then in 2013 was when I got orders out to Yokosuka Japan and from 2013 2015 was stationed out there made a ton of videos when I got out of the military in 2015 I went back to school in Michigan and then eventually came back home to Ohio. And then from there, came out to where I am now, in North Carolina, to save up for my eventual return to Japan. But to basically boil it down, as far as why I want to go back to Japan in the first place, is that even though I was there for two years, um, I was very busy in the Navy, doing Navy things. And I was also out to sea a lot, so um, I wasn't even in the country for a lot of time uh, during my time I was stationed out there. For the time that I had out there, I did get to see a lot. And I feel like there's still a lot more of Japan for me to see, you know, in addition to the Tokyo area. I also want to visit other parts of Japan as well. Um, I just got a small taste of what life is like outside of the Tokyo Kanagawa area. You know, I visited my friend Moli out in Shizuoka uh, we got to do a couple port visits in southern Japan as well, so I got to go to like Hiroshima. There's a lot more of Japan to explore, and I want to get out there and do it. And even just within Tokyo itself, Tokyo is massive, and there's always something to do. There's never a shortage of things to do out in Tokyo, and whether it's little timed events, or if it's just going to a place out in Tokyo, or meeting somebody, you know, hanging out with my friends, and in addition to, to that, you know, getting out there and seeing the sights, making the videos, and especially now that I've learned so much about uh, making videos, I want to apply that knowledge to future videos. I want to do some more networking out there because uh, for those that don't know, I'm also a freelance video editor and I've worked for such channels as Eric Sir 6 and Ramen Adventures. And I've also worked with Tikio Sam, as well as done a couple little one-off projects here and there. But I want to expand my network out there, edit for some more people, and just get my name out there, man. <laughs> you know, I feel like uh, Japan is definitely the, the right environment for me, because like I said, there's never a, a real shortage of things to do or things to record out there. And it's also one of the safest places to be as well. You know, something I've, you know, really thought about, you know, when I entered my 30s was more about my own personal safety as well as health. And, you know, Japan has a really good healthcare system. Coming back to America after being in the military for over five years where everything was taken care of medically. So if something were to happen, I wouldn't have to worry about the bill. Uh, to come back to America and you know, trying to look for uh, insurance and just being shocked at the uh, the price of everything just to have basic coverage. And, you know, even if you get the basic coverage to 
just go and either get dental work done or whatever the case may be is going to cost tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the extent of the work. And, you know, Japan has socialized medicine and it's a lot cheaper, significantly cheaper. Um, health is something that I'm really paying attention to more because in my 20s, I didn't really care so much. But, you know, now that time is starting to catch up with me, um, it's something that I'm going to be prioritizing a bit more. I really like the transportation system out there. I find it really efficient. Sometimes the trains are really crowded depending on what time you go and where you're going. So that can be a bit bothersome, but it is a lot easier to get around in the train versus a car and a lot less expensive too. You don't have to worry about your car breaking down and that's it for you. <laughs> Whereas in America, you absolutely need a car to get anywhere unless you live in like a really big city. And even then the public transportation system. And I also want to get out on my bike a lot more, my bicycle. So I think that's going to be a good way for me to lose some weight <laughs> that I've gained from eating all this American food and, you know, only driving around in my car and stuff like that. So I think it's going to be a good way for me to uh, lose some damn weight. But uh, yeah, those are some uh, basic reasons for why I want to go back out to Japan. And just, you know, ultimately, it's just to be happy. You know, I felt like despite how hectic my work schedule was out in Japan, you know, I could always take, take solace in just knowing that I live in Japan. This is what I've wanted to do since I was a little kid. And even just going to a park or going to a convenience store, department store, just walking around, you know, um, it just it filled me with just that that feeling of this is where I need to be. And it's not something I can really convey in a video without sounding like super weebish, you know. Like America, Japan has its own problems too, and I'm not blind to those problems. Uh, Japan's not a perfect country, just like America's not a perfect country. No country is perfect. But for me, the pros outweigh the cons in living in Japan. You know, I want to really scratch that itch again and live out in Japan without having to worry about adhering to the military policy of living out in Japan. I want to just live my life, do my thing. Thankfully, I've been given the opportunity to do so. I just need to work my ass off, save up a bunch of money because, you know, that plane ticket ain't going to pay for itself. And also got to save up for living expenses until the GI Bill kicks in. But that's a video for another time. So with that said, guys, this is Andy S. Signing out for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, I'm recording. Hey, gang. Andy here. And welcome to today's episode of Andy Before Japandy. And in today's episode, guys, we're going to be talking about what got me interested in Japan in the first place. So strap your seatbelts in because it's story time. So we begin our story in the early to mid 90s. Now, my cousins who growing up were like a second family to me, they were a primarily military family, um, mostly Navy, and they got orders out to Yokosuka, Japan. And during that time, they would send me back home in America a bunch of little things that they would get from around town, little trinkets and souvenirs and stuff like that. And it was really cool to see those sorts of things because keep in mind, back in the early to mid-90s, there really was no internet as far as in the mainstream goes. Uh, certainly not in Midwestern Ohio back, back then. The only real resources I had that were Japan-related were stuff I could find at the library, you know, books, encyclopedias, things like that, and the stuff that my cousins would send me. So I thought it was just like really super cool to like look at stuff like the coins and I remember getting some Lego sets from over there and then reading the little pamphlets and stuff inside but it was all written entirely in Japanese and I'm just like whoa this is so cool. So fast forward to the late 90s early 2000s and that's when the big anime boom in America happened so we got a whole bunch of cool anime from Japan like uh, Dragon Ball Z, Sailor Moon, the whole tsunami block. 
basically during that time. And, you know, got into anime in like middle school slash high school, um, which has continued even today. So, you know me, super weeb. Fast forward a little bit more to the mid 2000s, and that's when YouTube first came onto the scene. And from there, we got a lot of the early wave of J vloggers, Japan vloggers. So, guys like Tokyo Kuni, uh, Tokyo Swan, uh, My Argonauts, uh, Busan Kevin came a little bit later, but he was around that time ish. And of course, you had such people like Miss Hannah Manx, who was uh, studying abroad in Japan at that time. So, and from there, the whole dream of coming out to Japan became a lot more relatable because I would see these normal people just going out to Japan and having a good, good time. And before, I had always wanted to visit Japan, but、uh, the plane ticket money was just too high, and you know, we didn't have enough money growing up to be able to support something like that. So, I always thought it was just kind of a far off dream in the distance. And when I saw all these new wave of J vloggers,、um, it became a lot more、um, relatable. You know, it became you know, less of a dream and more of a, I can do this. I just gotta save up, contact a school, see if I can do a study abroad program, get the ball rolling, make it happen. You know, I went through some stuff in school during the first time around as far as university goes, mostly、uh, financial problems. And then the American recession happened. In the late 2000s, very early 2010s.、Um, then from there, joined the US Navy 2010, and in 2013, got orders out to Yokosuka, Japan, and was there from 2013 to 2015. Recorded a whole bunch of videos. The original Anti Japan series was recorded all out in that area, and、uh, just had a great time. And then when my time was up in the Navy in 2015, Came back here to the States. You know, tried to make my post Japan life really work out, but、uh, I still felt like I had that, that itch to come back out to Japan and, you know, continue to do my thing out there. Just even though I left Japan, I felt like Japan really never left me. That's why I'm creating this series to help document my eventual return to Japan in 2019. So this is kind of. Giving you guys some context as to who I am, why I like Japan so much, and、uh, you know, what I'm doing to get back out to Japan. So, yeah, that's pretty much all I got to say in this video. So, with that said, this is Andy S. Signing for now, and as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey guys, Andy here, and today on Andy Before Japandy, I'm gonna give you an end of the year 2018 update on. My trip back to Japan in 2019. Let's get on with the uppy dates here. So, the main update as far as it relates to my return to Japan in 2019 is that I've officially applied to the school that I want to go to out in Tokyo. Now, the reason that it's taken me so long to actually officially submit my、uh, application is it does cost a lot of money to apply to the college that I want to, but it doesn't cost money to initially apply. It just costs money once your application has been accepted. The thing is, they usually require the payment like immediately. So I just wanted to make sure that my、uh, savings was in order and that I had the money on hand. So if they give me the go ahead, I can just give them the money and then we can. Continue on with the application process, including visa application and things like that. So that way there's no holdups or anything like that on my end, at least. So that's where it stands right now. As far as the next goal, is、um, I'm going to be submitting some more paperwork for the application process. Thing is,、uh, it's currently winter break here in America. So all the high schools and Colleges and stuff are closed, so I'm not able to submit any kind of transcripts until they reopen. But、uh, with my high school, though, I was able to submit my transcripts to them because they go through a third party service. So I was able to just submit some paperwork online and then just send it out. But I do need proof of graduation because the school that I'm applying to in Japan requires that I have either a copy of my diploma or basically like a letter. Called like a proof of graduation, basically saying, yeah, so and so graduated on so and so date and signed by principal, secretary, whoever. 
Uh, that's where I stand as of now, at the time it's recording. Next goal after that is going to be to continue to save up for my return to Japan. So main thing is plane ticket money. It's going to cost about thousand, maybe eleven hundred USD to uh, get me from here in North Carolina out to Tokyo, Japan. And in addition to the plane ticket money, I'm also going to be saving up for living expenses until the GI Bill kicks in. Now, usually the GI Bill usually kicks in as far as uh, house payments and things like that about a month after you start school. So you do need a little bit of savings or like a job or something to rely on until it kicks in. Now, sometimes, especially with international stuff, it may take a little bit longer. So it's always good to have a very solid uh, savings uh, just in case there's delays in payments, whether it's initial payments or subsequent payments down the line. Little tippy tip from the Andy San Samadeshta. Now I am doing freelance work. I'm also selling a lot of my stuff on eBay. And I just recently got picked up for a new uh, work at home job. So I'm currently submitting paperwork for that. So that's kind of been my life for the past couple weeks now. It's just paperwork and getting documents lined up and just all this stuff. But again, it's part of the process. And I realized that if I want to get back out to Japan, got to play the game. So yeah, that's basically where things stand uh, currently. I'll be sure to give you guys more updates as things roll on. But uh, as far as new stuff for Andy Before Japan, I uh, just wrote down a whole bunch of different ideas, got some ideas from friends. Uh, so I'm looking forward to making new episodes of Andy Before Japan D, uh, very soon. And I can't wait to continue on with this series to document my return to Japan. So with that said, guys, this is the Andy sign. Signing for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Before Japan D, I'm going to be sharing with you five ways Japan has changed my life. These are in no particular order, so let's get on with it. So, number one, I apply a higher attention to detail in my work, no matter what it is. So, one of the things that really struck me living in Japan for the two years that I did was the extreme work ethic that the Japanese have. It doesn't really matter, like, what job it is. They always put their best effort forward and just have an extreme attention to detail. So even just going to McDonald's, the amount of detail and care in preparing the sandwiches, making sure fries were always fresh, and just the meal and everything, just the presentation was always top notch. The higher end restaurants and stuff, you kind of expect that, but from kind of the lower end fast food, just kind of grab and go sort of dealio, um, <laughs> hey, that rhymed. Uh, you don't really, at least as an American, uh, I didn't really expect that and it was one of the things that I really appreciated during my time in Japan. And so the second thing that has changed my life uh, in living in Japan was that I take baths to soak every couple days. Uh, one of the things that I did uh, whenever I get home from work, I would you know shower and then just take a nice long soak in a hot tub to uh, just kind of relax the muscles, let all the worries and stuff from the day dissipate. And one of the nice things was the Japanese tubs are a lot deeper, much deeper than American tubs. So I could actually like pretty much fit my whole body. I mean, I'd have to like kind of have my legs up a little bit, but I could like fit up to my neck as far as water goes. So I could just like really kick back and like take it easy after a long day. And then, you know, after I towel off and stuff, got a nice cold chew high waiting for me in the fridge. And so the third thing that has changed my life from living in Japan is that I enjoy walking and riding my bike. Well, in Japan anyway. I did enjoy doing those things in America before I left, but since I came back, um, it's gotten a little crazy as far as uh, traffic and stuff like that goes. It's hard for me to get around by walking or biking and stuff in America, but in Japan, it's like super easy. I really enjoyed just biking across Japan, going to different places, whether it's just down the street to the Kibini to pick up some stuff, or even biking all the way down to Jogishima, which is at the uh, tip of the Mira Peninsula in Kanagawa. So that was a fun trip. And so the fourth thing that has impacted my life since living in Japan is that I drink unsweetened tea. It wasn't really anything that I did before I arrived in Japan. Um, in fact, I remember 
when I was stationed in San Diego, I picked up a uh, thing of unsweetened tea out in the uh, the import market, which is very common in Japan. I remember when I first had it, it was like super bitter, and I'm just like, ah, this is disgusting. I can't handle this. And when I got out to Japan, I you know became more accustomed to that taste palette, and it just became easier for me to drink. And you know, tea is like everywhere. You can get it at the, at the uh, convenience. You can get it at the vending machines. You know, you get green tea, friggin' uh, barley tea, all different kinds of teas. Black tea, of course. Unsweetened tea and just kind of a lowering in the amount of sugar and sweetened things was something that I had uh, really become accustomed to in living out in Japan. And so the fifth and final thing that has really impacted my life from my time living in Japan is that I have a much greater appreciation for nature. I would walk around and stuff, before I left, but I really didn't take in just the aesthetic of nature, whether it's just walking around in like the forest or maybe just walking around by the uh, by the ocean near where I lived in Yokosuka. Just going to a park, like that was huge for me, you know, like <laughs> the parks in Japan are just so nice. They're a great place to just kind of relax, unwind at the end of the day. Or, you know, if you wake up early, go for a nice run. Uh, that's something I got to do to lose some damn weight. But, uh, you know, that's for a video for another time. So yeah, guys, that is five ways that Japan has changed my life. And with that said, this is the Andy San, sign up for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey guys, Andy here. And today on Andy Before Japandy, I'm gonna be answering the question for you, will Japan fix my problems? Now, I realize this is kind of a touchy subject and some people from some less, uh, how we say, less savory groups online may find this video. And uh, if you guys are from those groups and you're watching, hi. Hope you're enjoying a nice uh, can of cold chew high for me. I miss them a lot. And in any event, guys, um, welcome to the new episode. Just give you guys some backstory on me so you get some context to what I have to say. Uh, my name's Andy. I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. I served five years in the U.S. Navy and I served two of those years abroad in Japan. During my time in Japan, I was stationed out in Yokosuka, by the way, I went through a lot of personal hardships. Uh, just the operational tempo out there was really, really brutal for me. Went through a lot of shit, basically. And uh, when it was time for me to get out of the military, I had time to really think about the kind of stuff that was going on with me during that time. And that's when a lot of these like mental problems and stuff sort of crept up. Cause like when I was in, I was like, I'm fine, I'm bulletproof, blah, blah. But once I got out, I realized I kind of went through some shit. From there, I went through uh, college, two colleges. I just couldn't quite get my footing in there, you know, cause I was going through a lot of mental health type problems. I don't want to get too into it cause it's a little personal. So um, I decided to take a year off to really think about what I want to do in life and just, is college right for me? Am I going to the right college? Stuff like that. And um, one of my old shipmates actually got accepted to a university out in Tokyo. And at the time, I didn't know that you could use your GI Bill to study abroad. I thought it had to be within an American university. But I talked with him about it. And he's like, yeah, man, you just, you know, apply and do all this other shit. I'm like, what? How did I not know about this? Because like, had I known, I would have just applied straight away, you know, while I was out in Japan, hell, I probably would have took a train and like applied in person. But, uh, you know, it is what it is. Hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? I decided then and there to apply to a school out in Tokyo. And uh, that's what I'm going to be pursuing this year, 2019. Ooh. When I announced that I was um, applying to schools out in Japan, um, I got a lot of positive comments from my friends saying, yeah, Andy, way to go, you know, it'd be awesome you being out in Japan, stuff like that. But I also got a lot of, not necessarily negative comments, but uh, just some kind of concerned comments, basically saying, you know, like, Andy, I know you kind of went through some shit in the military. Are you worried that, you know, that kind of stuff is going to affect your performance out in, out in Japan, especially if you're going back to school and your visa depends on your performance in school. You know, I told him that that's a very valid point. But for me, I took that year off of going to school to really um, gather myself and figure out, 
what I want to do in life and find out reasons why I basically failed in going back to school. And that was a lack of a strong friend network. Like I did have some friends when I was out in school up in Michigan, but you know, I didn't really spend a whole lot of time with them and they were mostly uh, work friends. So, you know, you kind of have that sort of balance to maintain as well. Don't want to get too close. You know, I also lacked, you know, a strong network out there, not just with friends, but also uh, like a work network. So in finding jobs and stuff, I was basically on my own. When I was out in Japan the first time around, I managed to network with a lot of people and I made a lot of friends out there. Me going back to Tokyo, knowing what I know now, I think is going to be a really good thing for me, you know, because I have that strong network that I lacked when I was up in Michigan. And I just have a strong sense of purpose this time around. Because even when I was in Michigan, like my whole goal with going through college and stuff was to go to Japan, you know, whether it was to work for a couple of years and then come back to America or stay there the rest of my life. At this point, I don't really know yet. I'd like to say I want to stay there till I die, but you know, life happens, shit happens. So I do want to be open to other opportunities, but that being said, right now I do want to go back to Japan and I'm making the moves to, uh, to make it happen basically. Now, I tell you all this to give you the context of why I think Japan will or will not solve my problems. And the answer to that ultimately is, eh, it's kind of in the middle, to be honest. I don't think Japan will or will not solve my problems, but being in Japan will definitely help me in solving my own problems. Because at the end of the day, guys, you are the only one who can solve your own problems. Because uh, no matter where you go, there you are. So if I were to just like go to Japan to you know escape my problems, I'll still carry my problems with me. But if I have the attitude of, you know what? I got problems. I got shit I gotta work out. And I feel like, being in another country is going to help me with that. If anything, to encourage me to do the things that I like because I'm really passionate about photography, videography. I've been on YouTube for, what, 12, 13 years at this point. And I want to get out there, you know, meet up with my old friends, make videos, take pictures, and uh, just live my life, man. You only get one shot at this shit, and uh, I want to make mine count. At the end of the day, I'm the one that fixes my problems, but... That being said, being in an environment that will help support you, or at least not bring you down, will definitely help you in fixing your problems, but not necessarily directly. It'll just take less of a load on you. It'll ease some of the burden. So that's basically my thoughts on the situation. I'd happily encourage you guys to share your thoughts down below in the comments. Um, try to keep it civil, of course. You know, I intend to make this video as a good talking point. And I know a lot of foreigners, you know, they see new people fresh off the boat coming in and, you know, they see them as like, oh, they're just escaping to Japan. They're escaping their problems in America, Canada, Australia, wherever else in the world. And so I do want to make this video as like a talking point. And if there's some things, you know, that I didn't mention or kind of briefly covered in this video that you want me to go in more detail, as long as it doesn't get too personal, um, let me know in the comments down below as well. I'll be happy to make a follow-up video to this if need be. And with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sun. That's it for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey guys, Andy here, and today on Andy Before Japan, I'm going to be giving you guys an update on what's going on with my return to Japan. So let's get right into it, guys. And the main thing I wanted to let you guys know is that the last bit of my paperwork has been finally submitted. So I just received the last little bit of it um, earlier this week, so I went ahead and submitted it. So right now, we're just pretty much waiting on transcripts to get sent out. And uh, the caveat with that is there's a big winter storm going on up in Michigan, so it's kind of delaying some things at the moment. Uh, so I'm just basically waiting for the schools to uh, reopen and start sending out transcripts and stuff. So once the storm clears, should be getting some transcripts out to where they need to go. Uh, with one of the schools that I went to, I ended up owing a little bit of money to uh, due to a book loan I took out. Um, so I had to end up uh, paying that off before they would release my transcripts. So uh, the good news is they're going to be releasing my transcripts. Bad news is uh, <laughs> I pretty much have like no money right now. Um, I ended up having to 
use a lot of the money that I'd worked up and saved up over the past couple months to mostly fix my car. Um, there was some stuff that was wrong with it, a lot that was wrong with it, as it turns out, once we started working on it. Um, so I uh, had to use a lot of that money to pay for replacement parts and other miscellaneous things involved with that. And then, um, like I said before, um, I had to pay off the rest of that book loan, which took a pretty sizable chunk, too. So it feels like, in a lot of ways, I'm back to square one as far as savings goes. It is what it is. It sucks. But on the plus side, I do have a job now, whereas I didn't before. I was relying solely on freelance income, but now I have a part-time job that I'm working at, so I'm able to earn money that way, which gives me some time to work on some more freelance projects, which will in turn give me more time to save up money. Um, it's just a small little setback. I'm not super worried about it. You know, it sucks, but you know, it's a short-term loss for long-term gain. That's how I look at it. And I, I know this is Andy before Japandy, but I also wanna talk a little bit, just a little bit, about uh, some personal updates. Um, I've been kind of battling, not really depression, but mostly uh, burnout when it comes to making videos. Cause I just, I haven't really been having the energy to like make these videos. You know, I'm even in a different spot cause I feel like, you know, you gotta change the scenery up even just a little bit. Um, so I'm not at my usual uh, webcam desk setup. I'm actually on my bed just in the corner, literally in the corner of my room recording this <laughs> on my new little ultimate vlogging setup. I've been going through a lot of burnout as of late and uh, I've been trying to, um, you know, get the part-time job, you know, get training and stuff like that all taken care of, which is what I've been going through the past couple weeks. You know, they've been doing like full-time days for training, so I've had no time to work on freelance projects and thus I've been getting further and further behind on that. You know, just going through and learning the ropes for the part-time job, getting stuff lined up for selling, getting stuff for Japan lined up. It's just been really taking a toll on the old Andy San Sam Adishta. You know, I just want to let you guys know that's kind of why I haven't been making so many videos as of late, which if you guys have been following this channel, it's nothing new. I've been going through these uh, cycles, you know, ever since I came back to the States. But uh, I'm not going to let it drag me down. Um, you're gonna adapt and uh, overcome. So I'm just putting forward some new measures to help me meet the needs for my clients. And I'm going to be selling some stuff starting in February um, since the whole like January lull is almost over. Well, it's like literally a day at the time of this recording. I'm gonna be putting some more stuff up on the, on the eBay store very soon. And uh, we're gonna be getting things going, guys. So as far as new Andy Before Japan videos goes, uh, they're gonna be coming soon. Um, like I said, I got a whole bunch of ideas and stuff lined up. It's all just a matter of finding time, energy. It's the main thing. But uh, that's it, guys. This is the Andy Sign. Sign up for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey guys, Andy here, and today on Andy Before Japandy, we're going to be answering the question for you, how much Japanese do you need to know before you go to Japan? And so I have a lot of different thoughts about the subject. Feel free to discuss it with me in the comments down below in the boobity boops. Um, I'm always encouraging more conversation with these sorts of things, as long as you keep it civil, of course. But my ultimate answer for how much Japanese do you need to know before you go to Japan is ultimately... It depends, depending on several factors. Now, one of the factors being how long you plan on staying in Japan and also what you're going to Japan for. So if you're just coming over for a couple weeks to see the sights in the big cities and stuff, you don't really need to know a lot of Japanese, if any, really. Tokyo is one of the most foreign friendly cities in Japan, if not the most foreign friendly city in Japan. You know, there's English on the majority of sites and in uh, restaurants and you got pictures and all kinds of other stuff for the menus. So it's very easy to navigate around in Tokyo. And a lot of the train systems are laid out in English. And once you get kind of the hang of, you know, where the different train lines are and if you have like Google Maps or Hyperdia on your phone, it's pretty easy to get around Tokyo once you kind of know how things work. 
uh, at least it's very easy to get to the main sites. Um, if you go to some some place a bit off the beaten path, you might have some trouble, but uh, it is definitely doable in Tokyo. And also in other major touristy spots in Japan, you know, if you go to like Kyoto, I hear Osaka is pretty good, as well as Fukuoka. But if you stray away from the bigger cities, you might have a harder time if your Japanese isn't really up to snuff. Now, is it impossible to go to those places? Not really. It's just gonna be a bit more difficult to navigate and you know communicate to people what you want if your Japanese skill is lacking. As far as like how much Japanese you need to know if you want to be a student or if you plan on working in Japan, you know, ultimately it depends on your field and it depends on what school you're going to. Now, if you're going to an American style university like Temple University, uh, Lakeland University, or like Sophia or several others that are out in the Tokyo area, again, since you're in Tokyo, most foreign friendly city in Japan, you know, you could get by your entire time there without learning a single bit of Japanese. Will your quality of life be good? not knowing any Japanese? I don't think so. I think that the more Japanese you know, the better your time will be. And that goes across the board, whether you're visiting for a couple weeks, or you plan on working there, or studying abroad. Having a good grasp of the language, or at least knowing some basic phrases, will definitely help you in uh, your time in Japan. You know, for studying abroad and stuff, you know, obviously if you're going to you know, a Japanese university, you'll definitely need to learn uh, some Japanese and brush up on your skills there in order to even understand what the professors are talking about. But if you're going to an American university, like I said, you know, probably don't need to know much Japanese, but your time there will definitely be better if you know more Japanese. And that also goes for uh, working in Japan as well. Now, a lot of people when they come over to Japan, a lot of them start off as English teachers. And then from there, they either continue down that path or they go into other fields like IT, typically is what I see, and a bunch of other little miscellaneous niches in Japan. But starting off, most people start off as English teachers. You know, typically English teachers aren't really allowed to speak Japanese in school unless it's with other teachers. They aren't really allowed to speak uh, Japanese in front of the students. Now some schools might have different policies on this or might be a little more lax on it, but generally speaking of my friends that I've talked to who you know, teach English in Japan or have taught English in Japan, basically say the same thing. So your mileage may vary, ultimately. In that case, I would definitely recommend learning Japanese to, if anything, communicate with your coworkers. Discuss some things, you know, with, you know, the vice principal, principal, and so on and so forth, should some issues arise. So ultimately, guys, at the end of the day, as Tiko Sam would say, uh, the more Japanese you know, the better a time you'll have in Japan. But that's not to say you have to like know all the Japanese in order to even visit for a couple weeks. Now, if you guys are just coming over for a quick couple week visit, I wouldn't really worry about it too much. Maybe learn a couple quick phrases and you know memorize some kanji and stuff, just like some basic stuff, and you'll be fine. So, with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sun. Sign for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey, guys, Andy here. And today on Andy Before Japan, I'm going to be talking with you about my first two weeks in Japan. So, just a little backstory on me for those who don't know I'm a United States Navy veteran. I served from 2010 to 2015. And during that time, I was stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan. Now, for those who don't know, Yokosuka is in the Kanagawa Prefecture, which is right below where Tokyo is, the largest city in Japan, that's technically a city, not a you know metropolitan area, is in Kanagawa, it's called Yokohama. I was stationed out there for a little over two years, had a blast, made tons of videos. Check out the playlist in the uh, description down below. I'll also pin it in the comments as well so you guys can take a look at some of the videos that I made during my time out there. What led up to all that was basically my first ship, USS Kurtz, FFG-38, 
38 Special, was out in San Diego, but at the time we were on deployment in Central America. And the Kurtz was looking to decom at the uh, beginning of 2013. So coming up on six years now. Yeah, six years, wow, <laughs> that's crazy. But yeah, um, during the time we were on deployment in Central America, um, everybody was getting orders out to different other commands because the ship was decomming, that's decommissioning, meaning that you know nobody would be on the ship anymore and it would get sold to either a foreign fleet or be used for some kind of exercise where it would be sunk. So in other words, wasn't gonna be any need for us to be on the ship anymore. So we all had to go somewhere. And at that point, I had just graduated sonar school out in San Diego. They needed to put me somewhere. So they were originally looking to send me to another frigate because I went to a sea school, which is basically like extra training and became a specialist for a particular sonar suite that was exclusive to frigates. So they were looking to send me to another frigate, but I talked with my chain of command because I really wanted to go out to Japan. And I was like, is there any way you can send me out there? And they're like, well, there's no frigates out in Japan. So we can't really send you as is. I talked with a detailer and they also talked with a detailer about possibly sending me back to sonar school to learn a new sonar system so I could get orders out to a ship in Japan. The detailer looked through the different types of orders that were available and they didn't have anything for me for my particular sonar suite that was a specialist of. So, you know, they had to send me somewhere and I lobbied and my chain of command lobbied to send me out to 7th Fleet out in Japan. Eventually they got me orders to go back to sonar school, learn a new system for a couple months and then go out to USS Lassen, DDG-82, who at the time was out in Yokosuka, Japan. Now they've since um, come back to the States. They're now in Mayport slash Jacksonville, Florida. But at the time they were out in Yokosuka. So that's where I went after a couple months of learning the new sonar system. Uh, I guess we'll just start from when I went out there, right? So um, it was a pretty long flight, even from San Diego. It was the longest flight I'd been on at that point. I went from San Diego airport to SeaTac airport up in Seattle, Washington. And then from there landed in Yokota Air Force Base, which is kinda sorta-ish by Tokyo. Landed and uh, you know got on a bus to drive me out to Yokosuka. And the bus ride is about two, maybe two and a half hours long. And I was like so jet lagged at that point. But I was finally in Japan after all these years. You know, I've never been to the country before and I've always wanted to go. I just remember like being so incredibly tired but I couldn't sleep because I was finally in Japan. And I remember, you know, once we got through the, uh, the debrief, once we got off the plane, just going to the little lobby area right before the buses. And there was a little old Japanese lady that was filling up a vending machine. And I'm just like, oh my God. The Japanese vending machine. And then, you know, went all on the bus because, you know, I didn't have any yen at the, at the time. There was no place to exchange it in that part of Yakota. So then we had to get on the bus anyway. So, you know, what you gonna do? So, uh, hopped on the bus and just stared out the window the entire like two, two and a half hours, just looking at Japan, you know, just, you know, buzzing by different houses and restaurants and businesses and just seeing Japan life, you know, everything that I'd hoped for and stuff. And it was just so cool to me, you know, even though it's kind of mundane in some aspects, but just the fact that I was in Japan was just so awesome for me. You know, I was just filled with so much euphoria. I couldn't, I couldn't sleep no matter how tired I was. And after the bus ride over, I met with uh, someone from my ship, from my division, actually. Um, he went and met me at the uh, drop-off point, and uh, this uh, this guy, his English, his accent was uh, really strong, and I couldn't at first tell like what nationality he was. Um, it was just very thick. Closest I could think of was like maybe Russian or like a very thick kind of French accent, but it wasn't like the French accents I was used to. So, you know, we got to talk in, eventually learned that he's actually originally from Belgium, which is right next to France. Really nice dude, he helped me out a lot. So can't say any bad things about him, but it was kind of an, an awkward first moment because, you know, I thought it was like really jet lagged, you know, talking to him because I'm just like, 
dude, I can barely understand you. Like, what's going on? <laughs> you know, I thought it was like the sleep deprecation, like finally kicking in, and then you know everything's starting to sound all like wah 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 wah. Yeah, after we met up, uh, we went over to McDonald's to get some food, and uh, went back to the ship, met the division, met my LPO, said, you know, all right, you're pretty much good to go. You know, quarters is at. 0730, Liberty expires 07, make sure you're on the ship by then. Went after I uh, got my rack, which is like where you sleep on a ship. You know, after I got that and I uh, got everything all packed in, packed away, um, just took a little couple hour nap. And then uh, once Liberty went down, um, just went out in town and explored. You know, got to see the haunch, which is uh, the main watering hole for the uh, Military personnel around Yokosuka. It's literally right outside the gate, so can't miss it. Went out to a little ramen restaurant that was out that way. It was probably the best ramen restaurant in that area. Not the best that I've ever had, but certainly the best in that area. And uh, might be getting into that in future videos as well. But yeah, had some ramen, explored around, went back to the ship, and uh, next day, you know, finished checking in and all that other stuff. That was basically the essence of uh, my first week in Japan, was just a matter of checking in, going and exploring little bits and pieces here in Yokosuka. And then once the weekend hit, I went out and uh, explored Tokyo for the very first time. That was a little intimidating at first because like, I didn't really know how to operate you know, on the train system or anything like that or navigate myself around. You know, I just basically watched a whole bunch of like, old J vlogs and tried to piece things together and looked up stuff online and like okay it's it's not so hard and turns out it really wasn't you know just had to do a little research the following week was interesting because uh new personnel checking into yokosuka have to go through this program called aobicr which is basically an intercultural briefing where they talk about the different uh cultural differences in japan you know, maybe go through some like really quick Japanese, you know, like sumimasen or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Biru o hitos, hitos, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> Once we've, you know, gone through and learned a bit about Japanese as well as different members of the chain of command on base and like where different uh, things are on base, you know, where's the post office, where's the gift shop, you know, this, that, and the other. The big event was a, a day-long trip to Kamakura, which is also in Kanagawa. It's kind of like a mini Kyoto, I guess. And it also has some nice beaches and is generally just a nice place to be. We took a day trip out there, seeing the sights, doing things like that. Loved being out there, it was awesome. Later on, I went to go see the Daibutsu, Great Buddha, in a town over called Hase. I'm definitely you want to check that out if you're in the Kanagawa area. That was basically my first two weeks out in Japan. For those of you who have been to Japan before, let me know what your first week or two was like in the comments down below in the booty boops. And uh, that said, guys, this is the Andy San. Sign up for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Before Japan, I'm going to be talking with you about some obstacles that I faced in my return to Japan, as well as give you guys some updates on my return to Japan this year, 2019. Woo. Just a little quick, brief history, uh, backstory on my return to Japan. So after I got out of the US Navy in 2015, went back to school 2016, um, didn't really do so well, and I decided to Try some classes at the community college in the area I was at. Um, didn't do so well there either, so I decided to take a break from school to kind of, you know, get my priorities in order. I uh, went back home to Ohio. I was there for several months and decided at the end of 2018 to pursue going back to Japan to study abroad. Moved out here to stay with my brother, save up for my return to Japan. It really hasn't been easy. I've gone through many uh, different obstacles in my return to Japan. You know, one of them being financial. There wasn't really a whole lot of job opportunities in Ohio. And in Michigan, I just knew that since I wasn't really going to school there anymore, there wasn't really a point to me being there anymore. And there wasn't really a, a wide job market to really help me save up anyway. It made sense to, uh, to come back home, at least for a little bit. 
And plus, uh, my folks were starting up a production company down there, so I wanted to help them out and, you know, get that going. So I uh, decided to move back with, in with them back in Ohio. Over time, got to talking with uh, some old shipmates of mine who made the move out to Tokyo to study abroad, and I was like, I didn't know you could use a GI Bill to study abroad. Or, you know, I figured that, you know, your spending power would be very limited because you only get so much to spend in schools abroad and you know your BH may fluctuate wildly so I just kind of put it off as like a I don't know I don't want to get caught in another country with like a low amount of money or anything like that you know when I heard one of my shipmates was getting accepted to a school out in Tokyo on the GI Bill you know I reached out to him and we got to talking and you know he was telling me all about how to do it and stuff and it was just like you know you'd basically be going to a school in America but they have a campus in Japan and I'm like that's awesome, you know? I want to get in on that action. And I kind of wish I would have known about that back while I was still stationed in Yokosuka, because, like, hell, I probably could have just taken a train out to Tokyo and applied there in person. You know, I was kind of in a, in a weird point in my life at that point, you know? It's just like, you know, I wasn't really going anywhere. The job market in my local town in Ohio wasn't really doing so well. And, uh, you know, I was always worried about my car breaking down or something like that. So it's kind of funny considering that I moved uh, almost across the country in that car. But, eh, yeah, sera, I guess. Yeah, decided to shift my focus to studying abroad in Japan and really taking it seriously this time. Because, you know, I've had these little bouts of like, well, maybe I could study in Japan or something like that. And, you know, it just it never really came to be because I'd always talk myself out of it or I'd have somebody else talk me out of it and just kind of accept my fate, but I'd end up just being miserable. But I decided at the end of 2018 that in this year, 2019, I was gonna make it out to Japan. Packed up all my stuff, put it in a car and a little tiny U-Haul behind me and made the trek out from Ohio to where I'm at now, North Carolina. Been saving up, working jobs here and there, doing freelance work, ended up selling a lot of my old camera gear on eBay, made a good chunk of change there but uh, unfortunately had to end up using it all due to car repair costs because, you know, <laughs> as I guessed, the car I rode in on had some problems and once I arrived here and after a while it just uh, stopped working, basically. Uh, my brother and I got to fixing it. You know, I don't know anything about cars, so like I couldn't tell you anything about exactly what was wrong with it, but the basic gist is that there was a lot more wrong with it than we'd initially thought. So I ended up dipping into my savings a bit more than I'd originally anticipated. Between that and, uh, you know, paying off a book loan that I took out back when I was at Western in order to release my transcripts to the college I wanted to apply to in Japan, that ended up pretty much wiping out my entire savings. So I had to start from square one. But thankfully, at the beginning of this year, I got a job working at home. I was able to uh, have some consistent income while I was working on uh, some freelance projects as well. And I also got some, uh, some new clients too. So I was really excited about that. And yeah, man, it was starting to look up. But uh, about a week ago, I got let go from the work at home position because it's a little complicated and I don't want to like give away like where I worked. Basically, I worked for a company who had uh, clients in different service sectors, I guess, one way to put it. So I essentially got let go from a particular project. The company's policy was that if you get so many low survey scores, then uh, you're let go. But a lot of times when I would get the low survey scores, it wasn't for me and the service that I provided for the customers, it was for the product. You know, they were complaining about that the product didn't do this or charged them too much or you know, whatever the case may be. So like all the negative surveys, even though they were more about the product or the company in general, I ended up taking the hit for because I was the one that answered the call. Even though like I did just fine over the phone and when my supervisor pulled me aside to kind of tell me that they were letting me go, like she was kind of confused about it too because like she didn't want to let me go because like she listened in on some of my calls and they were like, you're doing just fine, you know, you helping out customers and you got some positive surveys, but uh, you know, it's the client's policy that you get so many negative surveys, you gotta end up uh, letting you go. And I did get some negative surveys at first, 
and I was pretty new at the time so I didn't really know like the workflow of everything just yet. Those ended up kind of weighing me down after a while so that's part of the reason why they ended up letting me go. But she did highly encourage me to reapply to a different uh, client that they have so that's what I've done. I ended up using her as a reference so we'll see where it goes from there. It's gonna be okay I think and plus you know I got some new freelance clients so you know worst comes to worst just continue to do freelance work and uh, save up from there and so the next thing I want to talk about which is the main reason I'm even making this video is about uh, the college that I'm applying to as you guys know I've already submitted in all the paperwork that they needed and then they requested an interview with me so we did a little Skype interview at 2 o'clock in the morning my time but it was like 4 in the afternoon their time you know, I studied up on some stuff I wanted to ask them as well as, uh, you know, studied up on like, what, what's a college interview like? Because I've never done an interview for college before, so I have, like, no idea what to expect. So, like, I had all these different questions and stuff lined up, and I figured it was just going to be, like, kind of like a job interview in a way. Just like, a, so tell me about yourself, and what makes you a good fit for this school, and blah, 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 you know, stuff like that, right? But it ended up being, for like 13 minutes, them pretty much just asking me about why my grades were so terrible, why you ended up transferring schools and still getting even worse grades and all this other stuff. And they were like really concerned about the viability, I guess, of my success if I were to get accepted at the school in Japan. They just ended up making me feel like a complete piece of shit. Cause like, you know, I'd understand if it was at the end of 2017, and I was applying. I was just in a, a way different headspace back then. You know, a lot of that contributed to my failure in those schools, you know? It was a really bad headspace, a lack of social support, because, you know, I didn't really have any friends in the area. My family was all pretty far away, and they were kind of busy doing their thing anyway. I felt like it was just kind of me against the world, and uh, the world was winning. And I also, you know, as I talked about before, you know, I was dealing with a lot of adjustments reverse culture shock and stuff like that, you know, because I was getting used to being a student for the first time in 10 years, getting used to being a civilian for the first time in five years, then, you know, getting used to being an American in America for the first time in like two years, you know, granted I visit and stuff, but like being in the environment actually living here versus visiting here is totally different. So I had a lot of adjustment to go through when I was, uh, First going back to school. I had a major I wasn't really all that jazzed about, did really poorly, uh, then switched majors, did a little better, but then you know the depression, anxiety started setting in, ended up screwing my grades up even more, ended up going to the community college to kind of help build my GPA back up and in, in addition to that they had like an Adobe course so I could learn more about like Photoshop and Premiere and all this sorts of stuff. So that was the big hook for me, was to learn more about how to edit videos and maybe learn some good workflow tips and things like that. But uh, I wasn't solving my core problems. Figured like a change of school would help me, but it didn't really. I just ended up taking my problems to that school. So I decided to take a break at the end of my fall semester over there come back home for a little bit, get my head on straight, and then just kind of figure out the next move. And you know, it was in that time I had a lot of personal growth. You know, I had a lot of downs in 2018, but I also had a lot of ups as well. You know, I felt like it was the first time in my life I felt like I can actually do this, not necessarily a YouTube thing, but like making videos, whether it's sitting behind a desk, editing them, or actually, you know, out in the field, you know, recording stuff on my camera, doing some pretty good camera work. like. You know, the stuff I did for my folks' production company was really top-notch. It ignited that fire and that confidence in me saying, you know, I can do this, and I want to do this. And that's one of the reasons why I want to go back to Tokyo so much, because all my clients are out there. I want to network with some more people, get to work with them, get to do some camera work, editing, all that stuff, you know, because I recognize that my strengths aren't necessarily being an on-camera presence. You know, I mostly just do do this YouTube stuff just for fun and if anything documenting and legacy and things like that but I realize it's not my strength but I still do it because I like doing it 
but my strengths lie within that, or that more specifically. <laughs> Sitting down, editing, putting things together, or also just being behind the camera and just kind of getting good close-ups and you know, nice sweeping shots and things like that and just kind of getting what the scene needs, basically. And so that's why I wanted to pursue something in film production because that seems pretty up my alley and it'll give me a chance to network with some people and get hands-on gear that is way, way out of my budget and get some time to, to work with it. So if I do end, end up landing a production job or something like that, I'm not all like, ooh, what's this button do, you know? Wow, I really went off topic there. But basically, um, that interview um, didn't go so well. They talked about my grades a lot. That was pretty much the driving force of the conversation. And you know, I kept on telling them, you know, I, I took that year off. I was working with my folks at a production company, kind of helped clear my head. And then I decided, you know, I wanted to go back out to Japan. But they didn't, they didn't really give me enough time to kind of clarify that position of why I wanted to go back. It kind of painted me in a pretty bad light. You know, it made me sound like I'm escaping my problems. You know, the reality is I'm putting myself in the best possible position for success because I feel like environment plays a huge role in whether or not we succeed. You know, it's like I said in one of my earlier videos, you know, some plants do really well in the desert, others not so much. So you just gotta find the environment that's right for you. And for me, I feel that right environment is back in Japan. I have a lot of friends that are still out there. I mean, granted, they have jobs and stuff, so it may not be as easy to hang out with them, but you know, we can still go for a, a little brewski or two at, in Shinjuku at Golden Guy or out in Shibuya or something like that. We'll, we'll figure something out. So it's not impossible to get a hold of them. And uh, there's just a whole burgeoning scene out there. So there's like a whole bunch of new people to talk to and make movies with and stuff. And it's just, it just seems to be like my scene. And plus with the uh, 2020 Olympics coming up in Tokyo, you know, it just seems to be like, you know, it's time. It's time for me to get my ass back to Japan. Know what I'm saying? <laughs> I think I've rambled and raved long enough in this video, wow. So I think we'll, uh, we'll end things here. Um, like I said, TLDR version was, interview didn't go so good, but I am holding out hope. Never say never. We'll see what happens, man. I mean, just because I didn't do so good in the interview doesn't mean that I'm not gonna get accepted or whatever the case. So I'm just gonna kind of ride this out until I get word from them on whether or not I'm accepted. And if I am, awesome. If not, then I'll know the main factor in the decision was because of my low grades and I'll just apply to the local community college, get my GPA back up, reapply, and go from there. So, in any event, with that said, this is the Andy San. Sign for now, and as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey guys, Andy here, and today, on Andy Before Japan, I'm going to be giving you a little update on my return to Japan. So I decided to do today's episode raw because I'm kind of in the middle of working on some stuff. Uh, right now I'm working on my tutorial for this coming Friday on how to enhance performance in Adobe Premiere Pro. So that's going to be coming out this Friday. Um, got the main cut of it done. Just got to work on uh, some keyframe stuff, a little zoom in on critical info and things like that. But other than that, should be ready to go by uh, the end of this week. Actually, it'll be maybe like an hour or two. <laughs> but it's going to be coming out on Friday. So I hope you guys check it out when it, uh, when it drops. So, And then after that, I'm going to be working on some stuff for my friend Brian from Robin Adventures. I'm going to be working on some videos for him. Um, really looking forward to how those videos turn out. Um, he had a, a long trip out to Europe a while back, and I'm just working on some videos from that. So really interesting to see how ramen is uh, presented in a completely different continent. So be sure to uh, check that out as well when it drops. So yeah, now on to the nitty gritty stuff. So I decided to wait a little bit to post a new episode of Andy Before Japandi because uh, if you guys saw my previous episode, um, I had an interview with the college that I wanted to go to, but it didn't really turn out so well. So. They said they'd get back to me within a week or two with uh, whether it was a yay or a nay. And it's been over two weeks and they haven't gotten back to me. So I'm just gonna assume that I didn't make it in. 
Now, I know some of y'all might be wondering, well, Andy, why don't you just, like, contact the college to see if you for sure didn't make it in? You, you know, you could have made it in. And you're right, it's possible. But, truth be told, I'm just not, uh, not ready for it yet. Um, as you guys know, if you've been watching the Andy, Japan, Andy Before Japan D series, excuse me, it's raw, baby. But if you've been watching the Andy Before Japan D series, you'll know that I faced some financial difficulties the end of 2018, beginning of 2019. Um, I saved up a whole bunch of money and ended up using pretty much all of it for repairing my car, as well as um, paying off a book loan that I owed to a previous university that I went to in order to release transcripts and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, between those two things, pretty much wiped out my whole savings and I had to pretty much start over from square one. But beginning of 2019, started a new part-time job. It was, uh, it was really nice, but uh, at the end of February, um, they decided to let me go. So they did, uh, like the company I worked at, it was a little strange because like I was let go from the client that they were working for, but I was considered rehirable. So they actually highly encouraged me to reapply. So I did and I got rehired by them. So I'm gonna be starting my new job at the end of this month in March. So in between now and then, I'm pretty much just doing freelance stuff and uh, just waiting basically for the next two weeks that I'm recording to get to work. So yeah, kinda is what it is, you know. I didn't expect this, this return to Japan to be easy and so far it hasn't been. Run across a lot of different obstacles and stuff on my return to Japan. Um, but you know, that's going to make it all the sweeter once I actually do manage to get myself out there. And there was a couple comments on some of my older videos from this dude who was previous Air Force, got out, went to college, and now is in the Navy. Um, and don't go hunting this dude down. Don't be like flame him or anything like that. You know, I can tell he, he has his heart in the right place, but he just doesn't know, like, the full context of everything. And plus, you know, I've, I've changed so much over these uh, past few months, you know, much less past, like, year, basically. And, you know, I did, you know, go into a dark place when I got out of the military. You know, I can tell... You know, from his observation and even just looking back on it to see if it was valid. You know, there's a lot of things that I did, a lot of things I didn't do that, you know, but, but you know, like, uh, I don't know where I'm going with this. This is why I edit my vlogs. <laughs> but basically, you know, I, I did and didn't do some stuff in the military um, that, you know, eventually cost me my career. You know, hint, hint. But, uh, you know, got out, went back to college, didn't do so well either, and, uh, you know, decided to take a break from it to kind of figure my stuff out, figure out what I really wanted, and what I want is to go back to Japan. And I know he's kind of saying that, you know, why would you go back to the country that broke you? But, you know, really it was my job out in that country that broke me, not the country itself. You know, I really, I really did enjoy my time out in Japan. I mean, if I didn't, why would I make like so many videos of my time out there? You know, it just doesn't make any sense. Um, and of course, of course, the same could be said about the Navy, but uh, if you look at that timeline, I didn't exactly make a lot of Navy videos during that time either, so, you know, <laughs> kind of add some things up here, right? But, you know, I enjoyed my time out in Japan. It was everything I ever wanted and more. Um, it's not all sunshine and rainbows over there. I know that. No country's perfect. But uh, for me, Japan was, uh, was where I want to be. That rhymed. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. I swear to God I don't plan these things. But Japan's the place I want to be. And uh, I want to do what I can to make it happen. And GI Bill seems to be a pretty good good method of that, you know, allows me to go to school, allows me to have a housing allowance, 
and uh, you know it's just a good opportunity for me to get my learn on and in this case in another country and without it wouldn't really be possible for me because I don't have the money for it but uh, thanks to GI Bill I'm able to do it and I want to take full advantage of it you know and I realize that I've made a lot of mistakes in my past you know during my Navy career after Navy as well and a lot of that was because I was doing stuff that you know was kind of a compromise between what I really wanted to do you know I felt like I had to compromise what I want in life because oh it's the sensible thing to do or oh it's the logical thing you know of course you want to have some money and stuff and then you can go and do your little fancy thing and stuff like that you know but uh, you know <laughs> this is where compromise gets you you know end up living in a bedroom you know so <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that but uh, yeah uh, basically you know I feel like my head's in the right spot now I realized that I made some mistakes in my life and I'm seeking to correct those mistakes and you know I feel like going back to Japan because I have a lot of unfinished business there there's a lot of videos I want to make out there you know I feel like that's the place to do it and plus I have a lot of contacts out there a lot of people I want to work with so it's not just a well you know let's send this fat weeb out there to get his fucking Japan boner up and make up a whole bunch of cool pictures and stuff and then send him back home to be you know a real America gen working at a factory or something like that you know um, but I got skills that do pay the bills okay that one I did plan but you know I do have editing skills and editing experience you know doing the freelance video editing thing and I want to see that through you know planted the seed for that about two years ago starting to see some returns with it and I want to see that through man you know there's uh, like I said a lot of people out there I want to work with and a lot of things out there in Japan that I want to see and make videos of you know not just the touristy stuff but also some practical stuff as well you know like you know covering some key elements in living moving out to Japan working in Japan stuff like that you know a lot of the stuff that may not be as popular as going to you know the latest place in Shinjuku or other spots in Tokyo but is equally if not more important you know I definitely want to cover that stuff when I get back out to Japan so yeah you know that's kinda of where I'm at at the moment so just a quick recap I'm gonna be taking some summer courses out here in North Carolina um, get my GPA up get some BAH put that away in savings so I can properly save up for my return to Japan uh, reapply before the fall semester ideally I want to get in for the fall semester um, I should have enough saved up by then to uh, to be able to afford it um, but if they're like well, well wait another semester so you have like a continuous history basically then so be it you know I have to wait till 2020 to get back to Japan that would not be ideal but you know Japan's gonna be there and uh, you know it's all up to me on when I come back so just gotta do what I can to make it happen and you know just uh, keep on keeping on basically so Anyway, I know this video is a bit longer than I initially anticipated, but this is what you get when uh, you don't edit your vlogs. So, with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sun. Sign up for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey guys, Andy here, and today on Andy Before Japani, I'm going to be giving you a tour of my old Japanese apartment. So, just a little bit of context if you don't know who I am. My name's Andy. And from 2010 to 2015, I was in the United States Navy. And from 2013 to 2015, I was stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan, on board USS Lassen, DDG-82. And I had a lovely apartment overlooking Tokyo Bay. And I'm going to be showing that to you today. Hey, that rhymed. In any event, um, the footage, keep in mind, 
It's about four to five years old, and it's gonna be a compilation from three of my Japanese apartment tour videos. And it wasn't really the best cameraman at the time. That said, I'm gonna be giving you kind of a best of from those videos, but if you'd like to watch the videos in their entirety, links down below in the description as well as pinned in the comments, so be sure to check those out. And without further ado, enjoy. Hey guys, Andy here, and today on Andy Before Japandi, we're gonna be doing something a little different. So, as you guys know, uh, currently on YouTube, there's this trend about putting things on a tier list. I've seen all kinds of different ones, ranging from like fast food to like Pokemon and other things. But today on Andy Before Japandi, we're gonna be ranking some uh, well known and not so well known. Uh, Japan YouTubers. So right now I have a list of 70 that I personally watch or have watched. Uh, some of them don't make videos anymore, but I wanted to include them on the list because I think you guys should check out their stuff regardless. And keep in mind, this is a pretty big list. 
But if you or your favorite YouTuber isn't on this list, I'm sorry. Get good. So with that said, guys, uh, we're going to be going in alphabetical order. So that way it's nice, fair, balanced, CNN, whatever. Anyway, so here we go. Starting off strong with probably the most well-known of the Japan-based YouTubers, uh, Chris Broad from Abroad in Japan. Um, Chris has really been killing it for you know the past couple years now. Um, his production value is really strong and it just keeps getting better with the more videos that he puts out. But that being said, um, my few criticisms of Chris and his, uh, his work on the Abroad in Japan series is that I feel like he's kind of trying to be more of a low rent PBS documentary and less of a high quality YouTube show, if that makes any sense. Um, I feel like there's a bit of a disconnect between him and his audience. Um, it just seems to focus more on kind of the cool shots of Japan rather than how he feels about it. And it's kind of less about him and more about the location. Um, if that makes any sense, I don't know. I just feel like there's a bit of a disconnect between him and his audience. And we don't really get to see his personality shine as much as we used to in his uh, older videos. Um, but we do get to see it every once in a while. Um, his most recent video at the time of recording uh, where he showed his uh, college friend around town uh, was pretty good and it was kind of reminiscent of the old school abroad in Japan stuff. But uh, that aside, um, you can't go wrong with uh, his level of storytelling, pacing, production value, all that stuff. I just kind of wish he was a bit more uh, connected with his audience. So that being said, I'm going to give him an A for abroad. So, next up we have Akita Tom. Now, Tom um, is an old school YouTuber. He's been on the platform for years and years. Um, he originally started his YouTube channel uh, when he was a high school exchange student. I believe he comes from either Australia, New Zealand, I think Australia. Um, so he did an exchange program while he was in high school in Akita, <laughs> hence the name. And he made a lot of really good videos for the time. Uh, they're a bit dated looking now, because they're like 10, 12 years old. But uh, at the time, there was some pretty high quality stuff. And uh, a couple months back, he had his first kid. So he made a couple videos with his kid. And I hope that uh, he comes back and you know makes some more YouTube videos. Because uh, you know he's definitely got a nice, shining personality. So that being said, you know, since he doesn't make as many YouTube videos as he used to, um, he goes like months without making anything. Uh, definitely gotta give him a D rank here. And next up we have Andrew Higgins of Higgins in Japan. Now, Andrew's a good friend of mine. I first met him uh, at a YouTube summer get together back when I was living out in Japan. Uh, good guy, uh, he kinda goes, uh, his videos are kind of from the Busan's Kevin school of video making where it's very raw, not a whole lot of cuts or anything like that, uh, for better or worse. Uh, so I don't really see his production value getting much better, but again, he's a friend and uh, I'll have to say, I really wish he would kind of, you know, pace his stuff a bit better but that's just my own personal feelings. So, Andrew, we're gonna give you a nice C rank. So, there you go. And next up, we have Asagi from Asagi's Life. Now, she's really been making the rounds on YouTube, doing collabs with all different kinds of people, and she's also into fitness, so that's really interesting to see um, because not a lot of Japanese people are into fitness. So it's definitely an interesting angle. And uh, she does a lot of the, you know, very similar stuff that you might see on YouTube of like going to Tokyo and things like that. But uh, yeah, you know, she's definitely got some, some good stuff, clapping with the right people. So I'm gonna give good old Asagi a nice B rank. Next up, we have a newcomer onto the scene, although she's been making 
Japan videos for about three years. We got Bethany, and she's from England. I recently subscribed to her, and she did a study abroad in Tokyo a couple years back. Then she went back to her home country, and now she's back again in Japan. So I'm um, really hoping that she's going to be making some good videos again. Um, but she just recently moved back, so she hasn't really made a whole lot since coming back at the time of this recording. But again, looking forward to seeing more good videos from her. But as far as new stuff, generally have it. So I'm going to give you a C rank. And so next up we have Bunny Tokyo. I first found out about her through uh, the Tokyo Creative group of people. I guess she works with them. And she was originally kind of, you know, more active on Instagram. But she's recently come back to YouTube and is making YouTube videos a bit more consistently. But uh, she doesn't have a whole lot up as of yet. Time's recording. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing uh, what she does moving forward. Um, she's got a good sense of pacing. Uh, the videos look great. And it's of some interesting, not as well covered stuff in Tokyo, which it's kind of hard to do since like every YouTuber goes after, you know, the trendy stuff in Tokyo. So it's pretty interesting to see. And I want to see her do well. So I'm going to give you a nice little B rank right there for money. Next up, we got a YouTube ledge right here. We got Busan Kevin, otherwise known as Jalen Kevin or Jalen Kev, Kevin O'Shea, uh, the host of the Just Japan podcast, everything you want to know about Japan, as well as some other things. Uh, the man is <laughs> one of the hardest working, uh, not just on YouTube and in podcast land, but uh, in real life. Uh, he's been pretty much all around Southeast Asia. So he might as well just call himself Southeast Kev, or Southeast Asia Kev, C Kev. I don't know, because like, he originally started in Korea, where he got the name Busan Kevin, because he was living in Busan, Korea, South Korea at the time. Then he moved to Kobe, Japan to be with his wife, um, had some kids, and then after a while moved to China, and now he's moving again within China to Shenzhen, I believe and just teaching English to the kids, living life. And I like Kev because, you know, his videos, um, they're not very well edited. He doesn't really, you know, edit his videos that much. Uh, it's mostly just like little clips of things, uh, but the videos are fairly short, so you don't really get that bored with them. So it's not just like a 10 minute, uh, just kind of rant about things usually. So even though the videos aren't very well edited, they're short, they're sweet, and uh, you can't deny this dude's work ethic and just like how many countries he's been to. The dude is very well traveled. So with that said, Kev, gotta give you a B for Busan. And next up, we have another newbie to the scene. We have Captain Catch and this guy has been making the rounds as of late. Uh, he's been collabing with some big YouTubers, been doing some live streaming and things like that. And I've really been enjoying his content. I can tell he's really putting uh, some effort into the cinematography, production value of things. And I'm just, I'm just digging his stuff. Um, so I can only see him going up from here. Definitely give this guy a look. So we'll put him in the B category. Next up, we have Chill with Lynn. Lynn. Um, she's a, a, a recent, recently subscribed channel for me. Um, she's originally from Thailand, or Taiwan, I believe. Yeah, Taiwan, I think. I don't know. <laughs> like I said, she's a recent channel that I've subscribed to, and um, She's, uh, you know, a foreigner in Japan, but she's an Asian foreigner in Japan, which is something you don't really see all that often on YouTube. It's usually Western foreigners. So it's really interesting to get that perspective from somebody. Um, she's recently gone, gotten through a, a battle with depression. So um, I definitely know how depression goes. So I definitely gotta give her props for coming out of it in one piece. And she's making videos again, so I'm really 
looking forward to um, seeing some more vids from her. So we're just gonna give her a nice uh, C rank right here. And then next up we have Crescendo L Design. And if I butcher these names, I'm sorry guys. Um, but anyway, this guy, or gal, I don't know, uh, this channel is a kind of a, uh, a recent trend on YouTube I've noticed with the uh, Japan YouTuber scene in that it's less about the person and more just about the place. So they kind of show some clips of Japan without like a host or any person in there. So with this particular channel, they focus mostly on drone footage. So they have a lot of wonderful Japan drone footage, which is a rarity as far as Japan goes because their drone laws are very strict, but they got some, this channel has some fantastic drone footage of Mount Fuji and like local temples and other things. And I can't recommend this channel enough. It's just a nice like, kind of chill out and relax sort of channel and just kind of watch. So I'm gonna give this one an A rank. Um, if we were doing like little marginal stuff, I'd probably give them like a B plus, but I'm just gonna round up and give them an A. Okay. So next up we have Doga TV. Now these guys, have really been doing some good stuff. Uh, they're a little inconsistent with the uploads for whatever reason, but you know, I really like their style. It's kind of raw and real and less kind of hosty, even though they are like two hosts. Um, but I really like the, the feel of the series and I just wish that they would do like more consistent uploads. So for that reason, I'm gonna give them a D. So, upload more. Next up, we have Dogen, not to be confused with Doga TV. Now, this guy, uh, first heard about him through uh, the late Roger Swan. Um, he apparently was a, um, he was in like the same school, I guess, with Roger. And, you know, since then, he's gone on and made a pretty lucrative business for himself and has really established himself within Japan. Um, Times recording, he's released a uh, like an hour long deep dive on finances in Japan. It's really long, but it's very in depth, a lot of detail. I uh, highly recommend you guys check it out. He's also got like Japanese lessons, all kinds of stuff. This dude is just, you know, a just a huge resource of Japan content. Now granted he doesn't have like the cool, you know, cinematography and stuff. It's pretty much just him in front of a camera, but just the amount of knowledge that he drops is fantastic. Dude is like super fluent in Japanese. It's definitely someone I look up to and respect. And um, sadly right now he's kind of going through some uh, physical issues. I guess he's got some nerve damage in his hands from holding his kids. So mm, my heart goes out to you, my guy. Um, so with that said, man, this dude's one of the hardest working YouTubers on the planet. Uh, I gotta give you nothing less than S. And speaking of hard workers, our next guy, Drift Hunter Albo. This guy, um, I met him through a friend of mine. So he's a friend of a friend. And you know, I've really enjoyed his climb up on the YouTube ladder. Um, he originally started off very small, like we all do, <laughs> but he's really progressed and I only see him going up from here. And the production value, the quality of everything that he does video-wise is just tremendous. And like, <laughs> I just, I'm in awe of the stuff that this dude puts out. And his goal is to make a Netflix series about um, car drifting, car racing in Japan. Um, kind of think like Initial D in real life. That's kind of the main hook of his stuff. Um, and I think like <laughs> the dude's already on his way. Like he doesn't need Netflix money to make that documentary. He's already on his way. So like, dude, Albo, you're killing it, babe. Like, 
Um, I only see you going up from here, but anything less than an S is a felony. Next up on the list is a YouTube OG, Eric Surf 6. Now, uh, just for some disclosure, I do work for Eric. Um, I edit his videos and stuff like that. Um, so I'm not going to use that as bias. I'm just going to remain as unbiased as possible, give my own personal opinions. So Eric is, like I said, an OG in the YouTube community. He's been making videos since, like, what, 2006, 2007? Long freaking time. He's had several viral hits that have been featured even on The Ellen Show. So um, I only see him going up from here. He has transitioned over to um, food content through the Eric Meal Time series, and he's also doing the Eric Vlog Time series as well, kind of documenting his life and kind of giving you behind the scenes of the Eric Meal Time shows and just all kinds of stuff. And he's also extremely active on Instagram. And he's, again, like Albo and Dogen, one of the hardest working men or just YouTubers um, that I know of. And I only see him going up from here. And I can definitely see him hitting a million subscribers before year's end. So um, with that said, I'll have to give him an S rank or six Eric Surf heads. <laughs> Eric Surf six heads. So next up we have Find Your Love in Japan, Nobita. Now this guy, I have an interesting story with him because I actually knew Nobita, um, that's the host's name, uh, before he started really on YouTube, when he like very first started his, uh, his YouTube channel. And it was my last YouTube get together in Japan the, at uh, summertime 2015, woo. And he came up to me, he was really nervous. He's like, could you introduce me to like some big YouTubers and you know, stuff like that. And I'm like, bro, I don't even really know you. But you know, we got to talking, he was telling me like about his channel and stuff like that. And I was kind of like iffy about it, but I could kind of see the potential. And I really liked his, his attitude towards it. So I was like, all right, you know, cool. And uh, eventually the dude like exploded as far as uh, subscribers and stuff goes. Um, he has had a little bit of controversy in the past involving some political opinions. So um, he has since kind of gone back to his roots of the Find Your Love in Japan series. And like, I'm happy with the dude. You know, I'm hoping that he continues to do good things. Um, definitely see him reaching 500,000 subscribers in the near future. So um, Nobita, definitely going to give him a B rank. And so next up on the list is Frame Hungry, my boy Josh, formerly known as J Hill Life. He has since transitioned over to more of a, uh, like a Peter McKinnon-esque channel. You know, he does like some gear reviews and talks more about the nitty gritty of, you know, content creation and things like that. Um, he's kind of, um, like I said, he's kind of going through a channel change at times recording. So, you know, he hasn't quite found his, uh, his uh, video shooting style yet, but he is very active on Instagram, posting a lot of great pictures, killing it, Josh. Um, so definitely recommend you check out his Instagram. Um, but as far as YouTube goes, you know, he's not really posting as much as I'd like him to. And he's still kind of like finding his niche on YouTube. Like he's getting there, but he's not quite there. So for that reason, we have to give you a D. So post more. Next up, we have Green Cyclist. So this guy is an interesting cat. So um, I found him through the Japan Circle Jerk uh, subreddit, and he's posted some um, interesting videos about certain J vloggers and things like that. And they're really like kind of funny and you know, I, I, I found them like really entertaining. So he's just basically like a shit poster, essentially. So I really like this guy's, uh, the cut of this guy's jib as it were. So I'm definitely gonna give him a nice B rank, right meow. 
And so next up we have Internationally Me. So um, she, you know, started rising onto the YouTube scene a couple years ago. Uh, she's not as prominent as she used to be because she doesn't really post as much as she used to. Um, but she does have some pretty interesting videos. Um, chances are you've probably seen some of her stuff if you look up like Japan content. Um, production values pretty good. Um, but she doesn't really post as much as she used to. So we're gonna have to give you a D rank. So post more. Next up, we have another new subscription in the box. We have It's uh, Nomers. So she is living in Tokyo, I believe, and kind of posting, you know, just kind of vloggy type stuff, you know, day in the life sort of dealios, you know, going to work and going to restaurants and things like that. So it's just typical, you know, daily vlog type stuff, but the production values pretty good for what it is and I can definitely see her really you know you know leaping forward as far as you know getting subscribers views things like that so I definitely see a lot of potential in her but uh, only time will tell so right now I'm gonna give you a solid C rank next up we got my man Dan from jadan.co.uk if you guys check out his channel, I'd appreciate it. So Dan is living in Osaka, and he's made some very informative videos. Uh, he doesn't really go out as much. It's kind of like, you know, maybe like 70% inside, 30% outside. Um, but the videos that he does make are very informative. So if you're looking to like study abroad in Japan or like go to Japan to like teach English to the kids or whatever, especially outside of Tokyo. Um, Dan's got you covered, so definitely would recommend this dude. Got some good stuff. If you subscribe, I'd appreciate it. So we're gonna give him a solid B. Next up, we got my boy Joe from Joe Dro Productions. Uh, he's gone through some name changes over the years. He's originally known as Tokyo Joe Vlogs. They changed to Tired and Determined. Now he's back to Jodro Productions. So, um, like me, he's a U.S. Um, military veteran. Uh, he was in the Air Force, though. He wasn't in Navy like me. But uh, he's a veteran living out in Japan. I think he's uh, going to school and working in Japan right now. Maybe doing some contract work. I'm not sure. But uh, he's out there doing some good things. Uh, Video-wise, since he's made the, the transition out of the military, he's been a little inconsistent with the videos, and he's still, like with Josh from Frame Hungry, he's still trying to find himself as far as like what his niche should be. So I'm hoping that he does some good things. Of the videos that I've seen of him recently, they've been pretty decent, but I just kind of want to see like where he uh, takes it from here. So gonna give him a D. Next up, we got my boy Jonesy from Jones in for Japan. Now, this dude is a second generation Japanese. Uh, he was born in America, he was born in Michigan, uh, living out there with uh, his mom, who also is on this list. We'll get to her later. Um, but he's most no known for his Twitch streams. So he doesn't really have a whole lot up on his YouTube channel. Um, he is looking to move to Japan, like me, and I'm hoping once he does, he'll make some good content. Um, he does have some stuff of his trips to Japan, um, so I definitely recommend checking this guy out, but he's most known for his Twitch streams, so if you're looking for more consistent content, go there. But since he doesn't uh, make a whole lot of stuff on YouTube, I'm sorry Jonesy, but you gotta go in the E rank. Make some vids, my dude. So next up, we have a very recent subscription. This dude I actually just subscribed to today after finding his stuff. Um, he was featured on a video from Find Your Love in Japan and found his channel and been really liking it. It is Kantan Japan. So this dude is a guitar teacher in Japan. He's originally from England. 
and he his style kind of reminds me a lot of Jadan. It's just a lot of like indoor stuff with little bits of B-roll here and there. Uh, but of the B-roll that he does show, it's really good. And, you know, it's just really interesting to see like different occupations in Japan. Because like typically with foreigners, you see them like teaching English or working in IT or, you know, maybe like being a student or something like that. Those are the, the typical occupations. But being a guitar teacher in Japan, eh? <laughs> so I think that's really interesting and like I said I've just subscribed to him so I can only see his potential going up from here but uh, since I've only seen a couple vids I'm gonna give him a solid C so next up we have K this dude is uh, a member of Tokyo Creative I believe and I found him when I was looking up videos for Yokosuka because I guess uh, either his parents or his relatives or whatever are in the military, so he has base access. So I saw him kind of running around base and stuff. So I'm guessing maybe he's like an like a like a navy brat or something like that. I'm not quite sure, um, but you know, this dude's production value is kind of eh. You know, it's just like clips and stuff. Um, he kind of goes on like the you know that like trendy like hype beast type culture um you know it, it can kind of range from like charming to just like cringy uh it just kind of depends so i'm gonna have to give this dude a solid e because every kiss begins with k you know the following letter is e so there you go so next up we have another YouTube OG, someone I've been following for a very long time, Loretta from the Kamushi Chan channel. So she is just a phenomenal, you know, I can't recommend her enough. Um, she has studied abroad in Japan. She has gotten her master's degree recently from a Japanese university. Her Japanese level is just tremendous through the roof like incredible she also runs her husband's channel uh boom lore who would also recommend but it's essentially a secondary channel for her so i kind of lumped them in together um but anyway loretta has just been killing it on youtube uh, her production value has gone up significantly over the years she's not rested on her laurels at all she's just constantly improving and it's just tremendous to watch her succeed, you know. So uh, I can't give her anything less than an S. She is just like top tier YouTuber, top tier person. So next up, we got my man Jimbo uh, from the Kid Sure You Can channel. So like me and like uh, Joe from JoJo Productions, he is a fellow American veteran. Uh, he was in the Air Force, stationed uh, in somewhere near Tokyo, I believe. I forget the uh, the, 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 the base name. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Jim, I forgot. Um, but he was stationed out in Tokyo uh, area um, and made some videos out there. And then once he got out of the Air Force, he decided to go to college in Japan. So he went to... Lakeland University in Tokyo, and then later transferred to Temple University, also in Tokyo, and he's recently graduated from those places as well. So um, I can't wait to see what he does moving forward. Um, the focus of his channel is mostly on retro games, especially retro import games. So it's a very niche topic, but um, can't find anybody better than Jim to uh, discuss those things. He often does like Akihabara hauls and he also does like some food videos here and there. And, you know, there's a couple talking about his life in Japan, but it's mostly focused on the retro import games. So definitely got to give old Jimbo a watch. So we're going to put him at B rank. And so next up we have La Sweet Pea Paris. Um, she's somebody I've fairly recently started following in the past like couple months or so. Um, she's going out to a, a university out in Tokyo, 
and she's just kind of vlogging her life. So she's kind of doing the uh, like the day in the life type vlog. Um, the editing's pretty okay. Uh, she's just kind of going about her day and doing stuff. So nothing, you know, too out of the ordinary, I guess. So we're gonna give her a solid C rank. Next up, we got Greg from Life Where I'm From. And he also has a good channel called Lifeform from X, which goes into more deep dives of other Japan topics. But this dude, you know, like Dogen, he is just such a resource on things Japan. He also works at home, so he has a lot of insight as far as, you know, how to work at home in Japan, um, just kind of doing his business and things like that. So it's really interesting to get his perspective there. He's also got a family that he raises, you know, since he's at home. So he's pretty uh, hands-on with that. And, you know, the content that he has is top-notch. The editing production values definitely above average. Um, it's not like super-duper, you know, high-budget type stuff, but it is definitely up there. And he's just such a resource when it comes to things Japan. So, got to give him an S rank for sure. Next up, we have uh, Love Liz Kelly. Love Liz Kelly. Uh, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Kelly, help a brother out. How do you pronounce your name? Um, I'm just going to say Love Liz Kelly. Um, she was formerly known as Strawberry Mochi. Um, that's how I first found her her stuff. I also read her blog. That's kind of where I came back to her YouTube channel from. Um, she's got some interesting content, I guess. She does kind of do the day, day in the life, daily type vlogging stuff. But she also released a series called Girl, Girl Abroad, which I think is a really well put together series. Uh, a lot of you know, she, you can tell she really put some effort into it. So I've been watching that. And recently she got engaged to somebody in L.A. And they're moving, well, he's moving with her uh, to Japan because he's, he's Japanese. So uh, they're going to be moving back. Well, he's going to be moving with her to Japan. If that makes any sense. Jesus. Um, so I'm really happy for her. Glad she's doing well in life. I think we'll give her a C rank. Next up, we have Lyle Hiroshi Saxon. So this dude is an interesting cat because um, his stuff, he's been in Japan since like 88, 89. I think 89, so like tail end of the Showa era, very early Heisei. Um, and he's been documenting his, his journey there and everything else. So he has like a mixture of retro Japan footage as well as like some newer stuff. So it's really interesting to see how Japan has developed over these past 30 plus years and to see kind of the mixture of the old and the new um, from his footage is just really interesting. And the dude just like posts constantly so you'll get like two or three videos a day, um, which can be a little off-putting, I'll admit. And some of the clips aren't really that well edited. Again, he kind of went through like the Busan Kevin school of video making where it's just kind of like slap some stuff together. Um, but unlike Kevin, I think they are a bit long in the tooth. So um, as much as I like his stuff, I'm gonna have to give him a D rank here. And so next up, we got my man Tino from Mexican Samurai 100. He also runs another channel called Kyushu Danji, um, which I definitely recommend you guys check out. But um, so this timeline doesn't get all crowded with secondary channels. We just put his Mexican Samurai channel on there. And that's the channel that um, I really like the most because it has a lot of his like kind of life lessons and things like that. And the dude has a really good philosophy and I just like his vibe man he's just like a really cool dude so he's been in Japan for like 20 plus years probably going on 30 by now and he's seen it all done it all and again I just like his uh his view on life so 
even though he doesn't really make uh, videos for that channel as much anymore, and he's a little inconsistent with the Kyushu Danji channel, um, definitely recommend you guys check his content out. But again, because he doesn't update a lot, um, I'm going to have to give him a D rank. But definitely check his stuff out for sure. And next up, we have another YouTube OG. Put her up here so you can see better. We have Michaela. So she's uh, from Canada. She originally came over to Japan to like study abroad. I believe she was a high school exchange student. Not sure. Um, but she's been in Japan. She's been in uh, Fukuoka, which is southern Japan, the island of Kyushu. Uh, she's been in Fukuoka for like 12 plus years now, um, doing her thing. And I really admire her production value. Like, the videos that she's put out over the years has been top-notch production value. I really like her personality. And, you know, I want to see more videos from her because uh, a couple years back she kind of went through this uh, depressive episode. Um, I don't know all the details. But, uh, you know, since then she hasn't been posting videos on YouTube as much. I think she's kind of let the... Uh, the haters, the negative comments get to her a little too much, and she hasn't been posting as much. And I really miss her her content, man. Like you know, when she makes videos, they're always top notch. And you know, her and her boyfriend have been making videos lately, and they just been nothing but the best. But I just I want to see her back on YouTube making videos on a consistent basis. And, you know, she's just, like, she's got so much good stuff. And she's been making videos for years. So, you know, but because she doesn't make stuff as consistently as she used to, I will have to give you an A rank. It would have been an easy S, but uh, got to make them vids, Michaela. I miss you. So next up, we have a rather unsung hero on YouTube, Mondaiji.com, David Pavlina, um, cousin to a uh, very popular personal development, personal developmentalist, whatever, <laughs> Steve Pavlina. So David is a cousin of his, and that's who I found out his channel, because Steve posted a link to it, and he had a podcast called Japanatron, and it's just, he's a wonderful storyteller, I really like his stories, and his podcasts aren't super long. They're about 20, 30-ish minutes on average, um, but they're really good stuff, and he's kind of tried bringing it into like a video format, which is kind of, eh, especially since the sound quality kind of took a dip, but uh, his older stuff's definitely top-notch. Definitely recommend the Japanatron podcast. Um, Dave, I wish you'd post more, my dude. I needs more Japanatron in my life. For that reason, I got to give you a D. Come back to me, babe. Next up, we have a really popular uh, Japan YouTuber, but he's probably more well known on Instagram, Mr. Yabatan. Mr. Hotori Bikurista! That guy. So he's really found a niche for himself, just kind of playing up this character. His videos are super short, very like fast cut type stuff, um, usually about a minute, maybe a tad over. Uh, and it's just like really funny, dude speaking Japanese, but in kind of like a French accent, if that makes any sense, you know? Um, and he's really getting popular. And he's been on like Japanese TV and stuff like that. Um, but his, his videos are just kind of like candy, you know, short and sweet. Um, so we're gonna have to give him a B rank, right? Meow. For Hotore Bikurista. So next up, we have um, a good friend of mine, another Jim, uh, Molly. Uh, his channel is formerly known as Warmoth Strat. Um, he's been in Japan for over 20 years now. I think he's been in Japan since '91. So he's been there for. Uh, a good portion of his life and it's just like you know for the like the super long long-term expats it's kind of crazy to think about because like they've missed so much like development in american culture and they're they've become so detached from it 
So I remember like talking to him about stuff and I'd mention, you know, like you like completely missed the 90s in America. Like you missed the whole like, you know, boy band thing and rap starting to come into things. And like I would say Britney Spears, he'd be like, who? (laughs) So he's kind of stuck in the 80s as far as that goes. But, you know, he's a great guitar player, great guy. His wife Tomoko is such a sweetheart. And, you know, he's been making videos for a while now. Um, It's kind of a mixed bag of things. Um, They're just kind of like fun, sort of corny, entertaining type stuff. Just think of like dad humor sort of deal. Um, But, you know, they're good people. And I have to give them a uh, rank of B. So don't be letting your meatloaf. So next up, we have another YouTube OG. We got My Argonauts, Jason. So Jason, of the My Argonauts channel, um, has been on YouTube for a long, a long, long time. And he has really um, made a name for himself as um, somebody who's went through the JET program. He has just a tremendous amount of resource when it comes to learning about what to do for the JET program. Um, The videos are a bit old now, so maybe there's some stuff that's been updated. But to get like the basic gist of the program and things like that, you know, I can't recommend anyone else more than Jason. And right now he's still in Japan doing his thing, you know. So yeah, definitely check this guy out if you're interested in the uh, jet program for sure. So I'm gonna give him a C rank. So next up on the list, which is slowly getting more and more populated, might have to like overlay some guys. But uh, next up we have Nama Japan. Nama meaning like uh, fresh, raw, I believe it's fresh. Um, And this guy does kind of like the food tour uh, mukbang-ish type videos where he goes to like ramen restaurants mostly uh, but he does do other things as well and um, he's got some pretty interesting videos been to some good places production values pretty pretty okay so I only see him going up from here and for that reason I'm just gonna give him a solid C and so next up, we have another interesting person. We have Nichibe Trader. So this dude, um, he doesn't really make videos anymore, but he does have an interesting collection of videos from his time in Japan in the 80s. So again, another like retro vlogger type thing. I fucking love these channels so much. Um, again, dude doesn't make videos anymore, so you know, don't expect a whole lot. But uh, definitely check out his 80s Japan uh, playlist of his uh, video clips and stuff in Japan. You know, it's just kind of amazing to me to think, like, how is he able to, like, vlog and stuff with, like, you know, it's one thing to, like, vlog with your phone or, like, a small camera or something. But this dude had to carry around, like, the old-ass, like, VHS tape type camcorders and just to try to fit that uh, around, like, the train station and, like, a capsule hotel and stuff was nothing short of incredible. So um, definitely check this dude out. But again, because he doesn't post videos anymore, you gotta give him an E rank. Poa Showa. Next up, we have Nippon Wandering TV, who is uh, probably the second biggest as far as um, the kind of raw Japan style of videos. Um, They like to do kind of these long walks around uh, different parts of Japan. There's no dialogue or anything like that. It's just them kind of wandering around parts of Tokyo and Yokohama and stuff like that. It's just kind of nice and calm and just kind of, you know, they record the uh, the ambiance of wherever they are so you get to hear conversation and stuff as they're walking around. And, you know, it's just kind of a nice calming channel. You know, it's like watching you know, videos of people riding on a train. You know, it's it's nice, it's calm. You know, the footage is nice and stable as well. You know, it's just kind of like chill out material. 
basically. So, gotta give this one a B. So, next up we have Obachan. So, we have Obachan's class. Now, she is the mother for my boy Jonesy from Jonesing for Japan. And she's made some pretty interesting videos. She's a relative newcomer to the, uh, you know, the Japan video scene. Um, she's Japanese. And she moved to America, living in Michigan. And uh, she makes videos kind of teaching people, like, how to say things in Japanese, little bits of the Japanese culture, and things like that. And it's really interesting to get a perspective from somebody who's older and to kind of glean their knowledge on things. So um, I only see her channel just getting better and better. And um, I'm wishing good things for her. So right now, I'm going to give her a C. And so next up, we have Chris Okano. Okano TV. Okano Shacho. This dude is a mover and shaker in Japan. A um, little fun fact, his mom was a very famous uh, foreign singer in Japan back in the 70s. And um, his dad, while being, you know, Asian in, uh, genetically, um, was raised in America. So he has a very complex history. Uh, but as it involves Chris, um, he's come to Japan. He worked in a lot of companies, achieving like high rank within them. He ran like was Odigo TV, I believe. And then he's um, in the past couple years he started up Tokyo Creative. So he's the CEO for Tokyo Creative. And I first found Chris through his Odigo videos, and then through his own channel, channel Okana TV. Um, he's always had really good, informative videos. Production value has been uh, pretty top tier. And, you know, now that he's the head of a, you know, creative company, Tokyo Creative, in Tokyo, um, I only see it going up from here. But uh, that being said, you know, he is in charge of a lot of other things. So... As far as his own personal channel goes, I don't really see him doing a whole lot more with it. He's probably going to focus more on operational stuff with Tokyo Creative. So his uploading is a little inconsistent, and understandably so, of course. So for that reason, I'm going to have to give him a D rank. Next up, we have John Dobb from Only in Japan. Now, uh, much like Chris Broad, um, for people who have maybe, you know, an inkling of interest in Japan, you probably subscribe to this guy, so you probably already know his stuff. His production value is just insanely good. Um, everything about his videos is top-notch. He goes to a lot of, you know, places ranging from kind of the trendy spots, but also, you know, kind of more obscure spots as well. Um, and he's just <laughs> a lot of, a lot of good videos have come from it. So I definitely recommend this channel, uh, if you haven't already subscribed to it. So there we go. Give him a nice A rank. Next up, we got Ozzy. Ozzy Awesome. So awesome. So he's formerly known as Ozzy78, and I've been following Ozzy for a long time now. And um, his videos weren't always the best. Um, he always seemed very unconfident on camera. And just the production value was a little eh. But I do have to say, he's really stepped up his game. And it's definitely getting better. I can tell. And I hope to see him do good things in the future. And I can definitely tell that if he continues... To up his game, he's definitely going to uh, to really grow his audience. But for now, I'm gonna have to give him an E rank. And so next up, we have another popular YouTuber, uh, Paolo from Tokyo. Now, again, he's probably in like the filthy casual Japan YouTuber 
um, category. So even if you have like an inkling of interest in Japan, this dude's probably been like all over your suggested feeds <laughs> with stuff. But um, he does have really good production value. His pacing and everything is really good. But I feel like uh, he's kind of more in that like host mentality where you don't really feel connected with Paulo the person. Just more like, all right, dancing man, let tell me about Japan and tell me about this thing. You know, it's just it, you don't feel as connected with Paulo. So um, for that reason, I'm going to have to give him a B. And so next up, we have Patricia Vergara. I think it's how you pronounce her last name. I'm terrible with names, by the way. So she's an interesting case. Now, at times recording, she's recently moved from Japan. I think she's back in America in Alaska, I think, last I heard. Um, but she has made a lot of great videos in Japan. Um, she's actually a U.S. Navy spouse, so she's made a lot of good videos talking about that and kind of showing her apartment on base because um, she does have kids and uh, kind of showing stuff like that. So I think it's a very interesting perspective to see on YouTube. It's not something we, we see all that often. Um, but since she's not in Japan anymore, um, that's definitely going to penalize her score. But I definitely recommend you checking her stuff out for sure. So we're going to have to give her a D rank. Next up, we got my boy, Zack Attack Snack from Phoenix787. Now, this dude, um, I met him at a Hanami party a long, long time ago. And, you know, he's doing some good things behind the scenes. You know, he's, you know, working, starting up a production company, uh, working with some movers and shakers in the scene, stuff like that. And he makes almost daily vlogs of his life in Tokyo. Uh, he originally started as a student at Sylvia University. Uh, he's since graduated and is working more uh, behind the scenes in production of things. So definitely doing good things there. Um, but that being said, his YouTube videos have been just kind of eh. You know, like the production value, especially for somebody who works in video production, I feel it should be a lot better. Um, he's gotten slightly better, but really, come on, Zach. I know you can do better than this, dude. Uh, so his videos have been kind of samey for years. So with that in mind, I'm going to have to give you um, an E rank for sure. And so next up, we have um, probably the og of the YouTube OGs as far as Japan YouTubers go. So this guy, Post Tribble, Post Tribble. I can never pronounce his name. Um, Matt, I think his name is, real name. Um, this dude is special for me because he was the first um, YouTuber that I came across that made videos in Japan. And this was back when like, he made stuff on Google Video. So before Google bought YouTube, they had their own video platform. It was called Google Video and you could upload stuff longer than 10 minutes, back when YouTube had a 10 minute um, upload time limit. So he posted some interesting stuff back in the day. Um, a lot of it has been copyright flagged since then. Some of his stuff's been muted, uh, which is sad because I really enjoyed his content. It was literally the first like Japan videos that I've seen on the internet. Um, by today's standards, it's, it's pretty cringy, pretty low quality. But again, you never forget your first time. So um, with that being said, since he doesn't make videos anymore, i um, going to have to give you F tier. So anyway. <laughs> Sorry, Matt. So next up, we have Rachel and June. These are probably like one of the most mainstreamy of the mainstream Japan YouTubers out there. Um, They've been just killing it lately, you know, they've been killing it for a long time actually. Uh, they were living in Nagoya for a while, and they've recently moved out to Fukuoka in southern Japan. And, you know, they've just been making videos of 
all kinds of different topics. You know, it's really interesting to see um, like couples channels. So especially interracial couples, because I think it's really cool to see the different perspectives from each person and how they deal with, you know, the cultures of the other person. And Rachel and June's probably the biggest channel involving that that I know of. Certainly the biggest channel in Japan, that is. And, you know, the production value is definitely top notch. Uh, they have a lot of really good videos. They have like a lot of channels as well. So June has his own like cooking channel and he's made a lot of like viral hits like him restoring like an old Japanese knife from like this rusty looking shank to like something that's all nice and shiny and stuff is really interesting. It's garnered like millions of views and of their own uh, main channel, they've definitely generated a lot of views as well. And uh, my, my only criticism of them is that um, I feel like, again, like with a lot of bigger YouTubers, you know, the production value starts to get in the way of the personal connection that the people have with their audience. And I think that while it's nice to have like the high production, like lights and make sure everything's well lit and everything, um, all that kind of stuff for some videos, but I think it would also be interesting to have kind of like raw content as well, just kind of like them with their phone kind of walking around doing daily stuff for whatever the case, you know, it'd be nice to kind of see a more raw side to Rachel and June. So that's, that's my only criticism. Again, they're great people and I wish them all the best. So with that being said, got to give them an A rank. So next up on the list is my boy, Mr. Rad Ree from the Rad Culture. Uh, he also hosts a podcast called Why Come Japan, where he interviews different people from around Japan and asking them, why come Japan? <laughs> Just kind of interviewing them on how they uh, got to Japan and what was their reasoning and things like that. So I've known Rad for a long time. Um, he originally started up on YouTube making vlogs about his time at Temple University. And, you know, he's transitioned to more serious filmmaking as well as podcasting and things like that. And, you know, I'm really glad that he's getting, you know, good with the podcasting and things like that. So I'm really happy to see him succeed in that field. Uh, but that being said, as far as his YouTube videos go, um, podcast aside, um, he doesn't really do a whole lot as of late. And I wish that he would um, do more as far as, you know, YouTube vids, and things like that. And I think that, you know, if, if he were less afraid of failure, then he would be able to to do more, um, not just on YouTube, but just in life. So, sorry, Rad, but I'm going to give you a D. The next up on the list is Rambalo, Rambalo, Rambalo. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce the name. Uh, but this channel is really interesting because um, this is the first channel that I found of that kind of raw Japan sort of content. Um, they basically just take like long walks around certain sections of Japan. I originally found this channel looking up videos of Yukosuka and I found that they did like a long hour plus walk around uh, the neighborhood in Yukosuka going through a lot of different places that I've gone through. So for me, it was just a huge, uh, just bit of bit of nostalgia and just seeing the same places, hearing the environment and just, you know, chilling out, you know, it's just, it's one of them channels, again, you just kind of sit back, relax, and chill out. So between them and Nippon Wandering TV, um, this one was the first one. Um, I think that their stuff is just, just a slight bit better. But that being said, I'll have to give them a solid B. But if we had, like, sub-rankings, I'd probably give them, like, a B+. Plus. So <laughs> there you go. And so next up, we have my man, Brian, from the Ramen Adventures channel. Uh, Brian is, is an interesting guy. Now, for full disclosure, I have worked for Brian before. 
uh, making videos for him, being his editor and stuff. And uh, he's probably most well known for his ROM Adventures blog, which is a bit more updated than his YouTube channel. Um, but I have helped him work on a lot of videos for him for the past couple years now. And I only see his channel going up, but I really wish that, you know, he would uh, post more content. You know, it doesn't have to be super duper long or whatever, but I wish that, you know, he posts some more content. Um, but, you know, the content's always high quality and it's not just uh, me like humble bragging, but uh, definitely some good stuff. Definitely check him out, especially if you're, uh, you're into ramen. You'll find a lot of good resources with Brian. So uh, that being said, I'll have to give him an A rank. And so next up, we have another recent subscription that I have, the Reformat Show. Now, this guy um, has gone around the world, around different parts of Southeast Asia as well. Uh, so he's kind of well-traveled, and um, he's recently done a lot of videos on Japan, so I decided to include him on the list as well. So he's kind of a, eh, but, um, you know, his production value is pretty high. He goes to a lot of interesting places, got a lot of good food recommendations. That's kind of his main deal. Um, so, you know, definitely got to recommend him pretty highly. But that being said... He also has, you know, Japan's not his main focus. So I'll have to give him uh, like a solid C. But definitely check his stuff out. Got some good material up there. So next up, we have a, another new channel. This is Reina Amplify. Now she's come over from Instagram. And uh, she started her channel thanks to Eric Surf6. Um, and he's really helped her channel get off the ground. And they've really added their own style to it because her and her boyfriend, Frankie, run the channel. And they really have a very interesting take on things. They do mostly food-related things. You know, she cooks stuff. And they also do, like, convenient reviews and things like that. Uh, but she's just started the channel um, they are cranking out videos pretty heavily, so definitely looking forward to seeing where they go from here, but, um, because they're so new, uh, I'll have to give them, like, a D rank, or maybe, like, a C minus, if we were doing sub ranks. Next up, we have Mashu B from the Ryman Gaijin channel. Ryman, che. So, he's probably a little more well-known for his Messy Pro 1 channel, but he does more updates now on his Rhyming Gaijin channel, and he's probably more well known as the Rhyming Gaijin. So he is a music producer out in Japan. Uh, he was going to school out in Japan, and he was working, doing other things out there. He's been in Japan for like freaking ever, <laughs> seems like. He's one of, one of the earliest uh, people I've subscribed to on YouTube, and he has a very interesting history. And uh, right now he's doing a like, song a day type thing for a year which is just crazy so the dude's just killing it right now so definitely got to give mashu b a good very solid b plus rhyming che. and so next up we have someone who's very important to me uh, a, a true youtube life inspiration the late, great Roger Swan. Now, Roger was one of the first YouTubers that I followed um, doing his Japan thing. He was originally an exchange student from Western Michigan University, where I ended up going <laughs> later on. Um, but he was an exchange student. He went out to Keio University, which is like a very prestigious university in Japan. It's basically like the Harvard or Yale of, of Japan. It's definitely top tier for sure. And he made his videos out there as an exchange student uh, under the Tokyo Swan series. And later he went back to Western Michigan to graduate. And afterwards he got accepted into the JET program where he flew back to Japan 
to Hanamaki in Iwate Prefecture and start up a series again as Iwate Swan. And sadly, he passed away from acute pancreatitis. So, you know, it just... His death was pretty profound for me because um, it was somebody who was very close to my age. He's a year younger than me. And to see somebody like that just cut down in the prime of their life just, you know, is an example of the fragility of life and that we're not all guaranteed tomorrow. So, you know, live your life, basically. And, you know, his stuff is definitely, I always go back to watch his stuff. Um, Even though his stuff is like nearly 10 years old now, um, the production value and stuff for the time was really good. Now it's it's pretty dated, um, but for the time, it was definitely top notch. And he was just such, such a wholesome person, such a very caring, giving person. And I honestly can't recommend Roger enough. Like, just go watch his stuff, for sure. If I had an SS or an S plus tier, I'd put him in it 100%. But I'm sorry, S is uh, as high as I can go. So, there you go. Next up, we have Ryan Schneider Vlogs. Ryan is an interesting cat. He is an American working in a traveling circus in Japan. And he started up his vlog channel. And it's really interesting to see his perspective on things because again, um, he's not living the typical expat in Japan life of teaching English or you know, being a student or something like that. So to see these people living you know, extraordinary or just different lives is really interesting. And I really enjoy watching Ryan's vlogs. And he also collaborates with a lot of other well-known YouTubers like Eric Surf 6 So you will definitely hear from him in the future. Only see good things for him. So definitely got to give him a uh, B rank right here. Next on the list, we have Sharla from the Charmander channel. Um, as far as Japan content goes, she's probably more well known for her Charla in Japan series, her channel and series, <laughs> both. Uh, but she doesn't really update that channel anymore, so I decided to just use her Charmander channel, which is the one she does update more frequently. So Charla is an interesting case because uh, she is originally from Canada, and um, she came over as an exchange student in Hanmaki, same city where Roger Swan was, and loved the country. And when she graduated, came back to work and live, um, doing various odd jobs. And her Japanese level is tremendous. Although, you know, I don't think she really showcases it as much as, say, Loretta from Kamushi chan does. Uh, I kind of wish that she would. Uh, some of her older videos were her just speaking entirely in Japanese. Um, I don't know if you go that far, but uh, definitely show off your Nihongo desu yo ne. <laughs> so I'd like to see her show that off a bit more. Um, maybe do like some lessons or some basic grammar, something, man, you know. But that being said, her videos on Japan are certainly very top notch. Um, she goes over a wide gamut of of things, you know, ranging from how to get to Japan to um, good skincare habits in Japan was a video she put out recently. And the thing I like about Sharla is that she's not afraid to, you know, tackle subjects that, you know, might get her demonetized. So she recently went to a, a very interesting uh, frog bar. I think it's called Kaguya Cafe or something like that. And the video got hella demonetized, but it was really fun. And uh, she knew it was gonna get demonetized, but she made it anyway. And I just kind of like her attitude as far as that goes. It's like, fuck it, man. I'll just make it anyway. So 
Um, definitely got to give her props. And she um, did move back to Korea a couple years back to live with her husband. Uh, they got divorced, but now she's moved back to Japan and is making videos once again in Japan. So I'm looking forward to see um, what she makes next. So got to give her an A. Absolutely. So next on the list is Simon and Martina. So another couples channel. Uh, you can tell I have a little soft spot for couples channels. It's always interesting. Uh, these guys, I believe, are from, uh, I think, like Canada, America. I'm not sure. <laughs> But uh, they're from North America, I guess. We'll cover all the bases, right? Um, but they're a foreign couple living in Japan. Uh, they originally got their start in Korea under the Eat Your Kimchi banner. Then they moved to Japan, switched over to Eat Your Sushi, and then they just rebranded to Simon and Martina, which I think makes more sense. Um, so they've been around the YouTube block for a while, made loads of, of great videos, um, and they have like a little podcast series as well. Uh, these guys <laughs> just keep churning out content. Uh, it's fantastic. So gonna give them an A, a very easy A, probably like an A plus. <laughs> so next up, we got my man Dustin from Solo Travel Blog. And we're gonna rate this guy a five out of five dogs. So Dustin here um, does various videos around Japan. And he has this really cool radio smooth voice. And you know, his B-roll is really a top notch. And he also has a side channel talking about the various gachapon around Japan. And he's also recently been married to a lovely Japanese girl. And they run a channel called Japanese Questions Answered. And Dustin, if you're listening to this, please, for the love of all things dog, update that channel. I miss you. So, with that being said, I'm gonna give Dustin a record of five out of five dogs. Or an A rank. <laughs> so, next up we have Striving for Animation. So, this channel's a little different from the other channels that we've gone through so far. So, it's, it's uh, not necessarily Japan YouTuber type, but. It's an incredibly interesting channel because they go over um, how Japanese animation, anime, is made. Like literally, like the programs that the animators use, the process for things. And I think it's like really super fascinating to see that. And it just really gets me giddy to actually see how the anime is made. Like especially current stuff because like... Before they used to use like hand-drawn cell animation stuff, but now it's all digital. And to actually see the programs used and to get recommendations for things is really fantastic. So definitely if you uh, are a hopeless otaku weeb, um, you gotta subscribe to this channel. It is fantastic stuff. So we're gonna give them a solid B. Next up we got my friends Grace and Ryosuke from Texan in Tokyo. Now, um, Grace, who originally started the channel, she is the Texan in Tokyo in question. Um, she originally got her start um, blogging as well as making uh, little short comics. So I met Grace before she got started on YouTube. And, you know, one of her friends um, we're a mutual friend of ours, rather, um, told me about her comics and stuff, and I was like, ugh, great, another, another friggin' webcomic, like, really? But I thought it'd be nice and just read it anyway, and it ended up, like, really falling in love with the comic, and just her personality, everything, and I was, like, when I met her, 
I was like, you should really start up a YouTube channel. Like, I could really see this being a thing. Like, I originally envisioned, like, her starting, like, an animation channel. Kind of like what the, uh, like, the animation story time YouTubers are doing. Like, way before that was even a thing. I mean, maybe Domix and Swoozie were around, but that was about it. So I kind of envisioned her doing something like that. But she kind of went with the route of, you know, couples YouTube channel, a la Rachel and June... But, um, I really liked her videos, man. Like, uh, Grace and Yosuke really did a fantastic job. Um, they were like Rachel and June, but more raw, more raw, more intimate. Um, they didn't have, like, the super production value and the fancy lights and the cameras and all that kind of stuff, like what Rachel and June have. Um, it was just, like, a couple in Japan doing their thing. And, like, if they wanted to show off, like, hey, we're going to make this interesting soup in Japan that costs, like, 500 yen or something like that. They'll make a video of it. And it'll be really interesting. And, you know, they've made a lot of good stuff. But they've decided um, about three years ago to give it all up and uh, raise a family. And while I'm really sad, <laughs> I'm not going to get my... Uh, Grace and Yosuke fix anytime soon. Um, I'm definitely thankful for them for, you know, giving us the content that they did give over the years. Um, they've <clears throat> put out three successful books uh, through Kickstarter, and uh, they're up on Amazon. You can check them out. Um, definitely recommend them. So, but, you know, I do wish they'd make videos again. But I do respect that, you know, they want to focus on family. So, with that in mind, I can't give them anything less than an S. So, next up, we have that Japanese man, Yuta. So, he's been making a lot of, um, he kind of started the whole, like, uh, man on the street type interview um, in Japan. He was the guy that I noticed that really started that up. And a couple other channels followed, but, like, he's... To me, he's the OG of that. And, you know, he has... You know, I can tell that channels like Find Your Love in Japan, uh, Nobita, really emulate a lot of what Yuta does. And you can tell because he has a really interesting style. Um, his production value is pretty good. It's not super cinematic, but it doesn't really need to be. You know, it's just, it's it's serviceable. And the real hook of his stuff is the content of it, not so much the production value. So he's definitely got a lot of interesting perspectives in his videos. You know, he interviews Japanese people about things, foreigners about things, about different issues in Japan and whatnot. And he just has a whole breadth of content. So... I'm going to have to give him a solid B for breadth of content. <coughs> Next up, we have another channel that's been making waves as of late. The Black Experience Japan, The Melanated Files. So this channel is, is really interesting. Um, again, it, it kind of sort of takes some inspiration from... That Jap from that Japanese man, Yuta, and also kind of mixes it in with sort of like a people of New York type vibe. That's kind of the vibe I get from Black Experience Japan. It's just like a people of New York, but more like people of Tokyo type thing. It just so happens that all the people are black. But I tune in for the stories. Um, you see a lot of really, really interesting stories with these people. Um, and they're not all Americans, you know, they come from different parts of the world, so it's not all African Americans, you know, it's from other parts of the world, but it's just fantastic stories from everybody, and it just goes to show that, you know, if you have a dream to do whatever in life, then there's always a way to make it happen, so really, really uplifting stuff, um, the production value is top-notch, and I really want them to succeed. And I think they will. They're, they're well on their way to doing so. So that being said, 
Gotta give them a solid A. Next up on the list is the red value. So this guy is kind of in the same vein as Green Cyclist. He's a bit of a shit poster, but not quite to the extent of Green Cyclist. Um, but he does have kind of clickbaity, but in kind of an endearing way sort of videos. Um, so he's got some pretty interesting stuff up. Uh, he's just recently started, or at least I recently discovered him. Um, but I'm definitely looking forward to seeing where he goes from here. Um, definitely uh, some good value in the red value. So I'm going to give him a C. And so next up on our never-ending list of despair <laughs> is Tokidoki Traveler. Um, she is from New Zealand, Emma, and she's been living in Japan for the hottest of minutes. And she also works at Tokyo Creative with a lot of other, you know, top-tier YouTubers on here. And uh, her stuff is kind of... I don't know, man. Like, it's kind of like your typical girl in Japan type stuff. Um, you know, it's it's nice, but to me, it's just, like, very exceedingly average, I think. You know? It's just, like, it's kind of stuff that I've already seen before, but I still watch it because, you know, I'm <laughs> hopelessly addicted to that shit. Um, but her production value is pretty good, but it's just, the content's just average, so, um, we'll go ahead and put her squarely in the C category. So next up, speaking of Tokyo Creative, we have the Tokyo Creative channel, and they also have a Tokyo Creative talk channel and other stuff as well, uh, but I'm just reviewing their their main channel uh, for the sake of this video. So the Tokyo Creative Channel has some interesting things on it. Um, they have videos of their various creatives under their brand kind of going out and doing things. Uh, they also have the TCT time little talk sessions, kind of podcasty type thing. Um, I don't know if that's on that channel or if it's on the talks channel. I forget. But in any event, I'm kind of lumping them all together in it. In, uh, in any case. So uh, they got some fairly interesting stuff, but you know, if you've watched any of these other channels, you've probably already know the basic gist of it. But it's still pretty interesting to see a lot of other YouTubers kind of interacting with each other and answering questions and things like that. So definitely worth a watch. But um, for me, I've definitely kind of been there done that so i'm gonna give them a d so next up we have norm from tokyo lens who is also part of uh, tokyo creative by the way um i really get some very strong like peter mckinnon vibes from tokyo lens like every time i watch his videos i can just like hear him screaming in my mind I want to be like Peter McKinnon, but I'm not Peter McKinnon. Like, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Y'all gotta cut that out, Norm. But, that being said, he's a pretty interesting fellow. Pretty swell guy. And he's a shamisen player in Japan. And he also does, like, freelance photography and stuff. Um, and he's got some really good videos. He does a lot of traveling, not just around Japan, but he also goes and tours other countries as well with his shamisen playing, so he takes you along for those. And, you know, his production value, because he likes to be, like, you know, Peter McKinnon light, is still pretty high. So, uh, I definitely like his stuff, despite how much I've been shitting on it. But, uh, I really like Norm's stuff. Highly recommend him if you're not already subscribed. So we're going to put him squarely in the B category. You can see the B is pretty heavy. <laughs> but we only got three more left, so uh, we'll just keep pressing on here. So next up we have the Big Papa. The OG OG J Vlogger. The true king of all 
Japan YouTubers, like, this dude is, like, the original. Tokyo Kuni. Much like Roger Swan, Kuni is a massive inspiration for me. Even today, like, he was one of the first people... Like, I go back and look at his videos. All his stuff that he does, all the little, like, camera shots and his storytelling and pacing all derive from television, from his work in TV production, because he was in Japan for over 10 years, did some freelance work. He uh, worked for Fuji TV, I believe, did a lot of Japanese media work as well. That was kind of his main bread and butter. And you could tell that he has some, some serious chops when it comes to you know video making. Uh, that derived from his time in TV. And I just look at, like, all the stuff that he's done and, like, all the stuff that other people try to do, and I'm like, you know, Tokyo Kuni, Kevin Kuni, whatever you want to call him, he started it all, man. Like, he started J-vlogging. He started, like, all this, like, B-roll cuts and kind of pacing it like TV. You know, he kind of had, like, a an Anthony Bourdain, no reservations style of video making. And his Life in Tokyo series is just, like... <laughs> To me, it's like the national treasure. It's like, you know, uh, things you must see before you die type stuff. It's just, even though nowadays there's people who've made stuff like his that's better edited and it's higher quality, like, Cooney started all that, man. Like, he is the OG in all sense of Japan YouTubers. Like, he's the one that really got that all started and... You know, we all gotta, all gotta pay homage to the Don, the Goat, Tokyo Kuni. And I'm sorry, Kuni, there isn't anything better than S, but this will have to do. You know, definitely, definitely check his stuff out, hundred percent. So next up on the list, we have Tomoko Des from the Tomoko Tomoko channel. Um, she's probably most well known for collaborating with a certain YouTuber who you might notice is not on the list because F isn't low enough. But in any event, Tomoko is really nice. She's such a sweetheart. She was always super nice to me. I met her several times um, went during these YouTube get togethers in Japan. This is just a complete sweetheart. And like um, Asagi, uh, she is into fitness as well. She's into yoga. I believe she got certified as a yoga instructor recently. So good on her for that. So you see a lot of videos of her um, collabing with that other guy. But also she does her own thing and doing like yoga and just other things. So um, just a real, real wonderful person. Um, Definitely somebody who's been in the community for a long freaking time. So got to give her a solid B. And so last but not least, we have Yao Wu Films. So this guy, Tatsu is his name. Um, he is the boyfriend to Michaela, and he's also a filmmaker. Um, he does stuff not just in Japan, but also in other countries. And he has just a fantastic sense of video making, storytelling, production values just through the roof. Amazing stuff. Um, and he collaborates a lot with Michaela and making her stuff as well. So uh, when they started dating, her production value, which was already like phenomenal, like went even beyond that when they started working together like it's just crazy dude but that being said just rating his own channel um he doesn't make youtube stuff consistently but of the stuff that he does make again top-notch stuff lots of good drone footage you can tell he knows what he's doing with the camera um just very high quality stuff definitely check his stuff out um but because he doesn't update on a regular basis gonna have to give you a C so there you have it there's all of the 70 people that I watch who are uh, Japan youtubers now again 
if your favorite YouTuber hadn't made the list or wasn't ranked where they wanted to be, I'm sorry. This is my own personal list. This is how I personally feel uh, ranking these people through this popular tier list format for videos. Um, so, what do you think? Leave me your thoughts down below in the comments, in the booby boops. And uh, definitely check all these guys out, um, despite their rankings. I am subscribed to all of them, love all their content. Uh, so definitely check them out online, uh, watch their stuff. Let me know what you think. So, uh, once again, I want to thank you guys for tuning in this video. I know it's a long one, it's definitely a deep dive. Uh, but definitely want to thank you guys for tuning in. And with that said, guys, this is the Andy Son. Sign up for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Before Japandi. In today's episode, guys, I'm going to be talking to you about some more struggles that I face in my return to Japan to study abroad in Tokyo next year, 2020. Woo. So yeah, uh, before we get into that though, I do have some announcements, non-Japan announcements. Military Mondays are still going on on this channel. So every Monday I'm gonna be uploading a video from my Andy Talks Navy channel onto this channel right here. And I have those scheduled out as far as like the end of November, 2019. So if you're watching this in the future, greetings. And this up date is not really gonna mean a whole lot. And as far as school and stuff goes, uh, what's going on right now? Um, things are going pretty well. Um, doing homework, showing up to class, not really much else to say there. So that's pretty much what you gotta do to uh, get the good grades. You know what I'm saying? On to the Japan stuff. Been going through ways that I can save up for my return to Japan for next year. The main thing I was looking at doing was using my BAH that I was getting from going to school here in the States to save up, go to school out in Tokyo. Because the thing is, the GI Bill is great as far as like once you're studying, once you're in school, and once you know the, the system's going, it's great. But it does take a lot of effort to get the system going, and you do have to wait about a month or so for like the BAH and stuff like that to kick in. So it can be a bit daunting, especially for that first month, you know, especially if you're starting out school or if you're coming back from a break or something like that. It can be very daunting to uh, get that all taken care of. So I want to make sure that I have plenty of money saved up for my return to Japan because it's a lot harder to make up that money when you're living abroad, especially as it comes to working to make a little bit of extra money if the GI Bill doesn't cover it all. So I just want to make sure that I'm well taken care of as far as that goes. So. If the GI Bill is a little short that month, or if I need a little something, something extra for whatever reason, then I have the money to do it. So that's that was the plan as far as getting out to Japan, the Japan. <laughs> I went and talked with the VA this week because I was missing my book stipend. So for those who don't know, uh, on the GI Bill, post 9-11, I don't know how it is for Montgomery but you get a book stipend every semester. And usually it's about 300, 500 bucks, depending on the semester. This semester would have been about tree fitty, basically, because uh, they pay a little less for the summer semesters. For the fall and spring, it's 500. Uh, but basically, um, I was waiting for this uh, book stipend to come in. I didn't see any indication that was gonna be deposited into my bank account. And, you know, it usually comes around this time. So I just wanted to, contact the VA, see like if they had an ETA on that or something like that. And everything on school side was good, e-benefits side was good. So I'm like, okay, you know, everything seems good. But I just had this little feeling in my stomach that eh, I should probably take this up a little further. I contacted the VA on the phone and I actually got a hold of a person, which is uh, a surprise. I thought I'd be waiting there on the lines forever, but got in, reasonable amount of time, about 10 minutes or so. And uh, turns out uh, I still owe money to the VA for an overpayment that they made for me about two, three years ago that I completely forgot about. You know, just in the midst of moving and getting everything all settled with my personal life. And I was just in a bad place at that time anyway. So 
you know, it's not a surprise that I forgot about it. So talked it over, got a payment plan all set up. So that's the good news. I'm on track to pay off that debt. But the bad news is they're taking a substantial chunk out of my BAH to, to do it. Now, as far as like living expenses and stuff like that goes, as far as like in the here and now, I'll be fine. It's, it's enough to cover me as far as that goes between BAH and what I make with freelancing. Um, I'll be fine as far as that goes. But as far as saving up for Japan goes, it's gonna be very difficult to do. And not just to save up for Japan because um, this debt's gonna be paid off over the next year or so. And uh, only in the months I'm going to school because it's taken out of BAH. If I really focus on saving pretty much all my BAH, I can make it work as far as getting to Japan. But as far as like staying in Japan and like affording a place to live and eat and all that kind of stuff, I don't know if it's gonna work that well. I'm gonna be dipping my savings a lot and it's, uh, it's gonna be a challenge for sure. It's been really hard on me as far as that goes because I feel like, you know, I've come all this way and I've made such progress and I'm finally putting forth the effort to move forward with what I want to do in life. And I'm faced with like this, this huge roadblock, you know, and it's always, it always seems to be the case with me, right? Cause like I, you know, seem to overcome all these little things and then it's one little technicality that like completely screws everything up. But um, I'm not going to let this deter me. I'm going to keep charging forward and to do what I can to make this whole Japan thing happen. Because for me, it's it's really important that I go back. I've been wanting to go back for years now. And I feel like, you know, if I don't actually put forward the effort to, to make it happen, then I'm just blowing smoke up everybody's ass. And I don't want that to, to be a thing. So I definitely want to make sure I can do everything within my power to make it back to Japan. So it might end up taking me longer to actually get out to Japan. I might have to wait until the summer semester next year to make it happen, or maybe even longer. I'm not sure at this point. Yeah, right now I'm a little deflated about the whole Japan situation because, you know, I wanted to come out at the beginning of 2020 and who's to say that it won't happen? But, you know, as it stands right now, there's a lot of stuff that's, that's up in the air for me. And, you know, with this whole paying off the debt that I owe to the VA and the amount I'll be able to save up with BAH and stuff in the next couple months, um, it's gonna be, it's gonna be uh, difficult for sure. And if anything changes, I'll be sure to update you guys. You guys know that. <laughs> but as it stands right now, like I said, things are in a pretty bad spot as far as that goes. But like I said, I'm going to be doing everything in my power to come back to Japan and to really make this happen because it's very important to me that I come back, like I said. and. I feel like I've been hyping up this return for so long that there has to be some payoff, right? Has to be something, right? Even if nothing comes of it and there's absolutely no way I can study abroad in Japan, I wanna at least use the money that I saved up for a trip out there to fucking get my Japan on, make some videos, collaborate with some people, and at least have something, some sort of payoff, all this. So, yeah. Sorry, this, uh, this episode's a bit of a downer, but that's just kind of how it is right now. And I'm just trying to maintain a positive attitude and, you know, just keep pressing forward, not turning back at this big roadblock and facing it head on. Because that's what the new Andy does, not the old Andy. So, anyway, guys, I think I've rambled and raved long enough in this, in this video. So, with that said, this is the Andy Son, signing for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. And welcome to the debut episode of Andy Talks Japandi, formerly known 
as Andy before Japan. -y. So in today's episode, guys, we're gonna be talking about what I miss about living in Japan or living here in America. And these are in no particular order, so with that said, let's just jump right into it. And the first thing that I miss about living in Japan while living here in the States is that in Japan, people put in great attention and detail to their jobs, no matter what it is. It's a lot of different attention details. I noticed this especially with food, just going to like say McDonald's, for instance, what you see on the, uh, the order boards and things like that is about as close as you're gonna get to what you order. It's just great, man. You know, all the food's really fresh. It's like very neatly prepared. Like, you know, all the different items and stuff are very carefully placed on the sandwich and things like that. And that's just one small example. There's many others I could give. And so the second thing that I miss about living in Japan is that it's way safer in Japan, crime-wise. Uh, that was one of the big reverse culture shocks that I got uh, when coming back to the States. Now, uh, for those that don't know, I'm from a small town in Ohio called Salina, about 10,000 or so people, uh, not that big, but there have been some major crimes going on in the area, mostly involving drugs. A lot of opiate rings and heroin and meth and all that fun stuff. And there was even like uh, a gun shootout near the police station out there. And, you know, to come back to all that after living abroad for two years and being in the Navy for five years was just such a reverse culture shock. And, you know, I definitely got to say in Japan, Never felt like I was gonna get mugged, jumped. Never felt like any of my stuff was gonna get stolen. Even my bike, which I still kept locked up because, you know, old habits die hard, right? Never felt unsafe at all anywhere I went in Japan. And I've been to some pretty seedy spots as well just to kind of test things out, of course. And so the third thing that I miss about living in Japan is that in Japan, you don't really need a car to get around unless you live out in the Inaka, the countryside area of Japan. But I lived in city side, so never had to worry about, you know, how am I gonna get to work? Especially since I had a bicycle that I rode to work. Aside from riding my bicycle to work, I also took the trains, occasionally took buses, but usually just walked to the train station and took a train to pretty much anywhere I wanted to go within Japan. It made things a lot easier to get around and I saved so much money on car insurance, maintenance, gas especially. And so the fourth thing that I miss about living abroad in Japan is that the quality of life is way higher even if you have low income in Japan. That's another thing I, I got a bit of a reverse culture shock on when coming back to the States was that my money doesn't really go as far as it used to, or at least in certain areas. Now, in some areas like food and things like that you know, you can get some pretty cheap food here in America and it'll get you by to the next day. But as far as other things that we'll talk about here in a little bit, uh, but mostly like housing was a big one. You know, it, it's really hard to find uh, good housing on the cheap. Whereas in Japan, you can like rent pretty much like a walk-in closet for a reasonable price as long as it kind of gets you by. But uh, in the States, and especially where I was at in the States, you know, more of the rural Midwestern, type areas, you know, you had to get pretty much like the lowest space you could get was like a one bedroom apartment that was like 700 bucks. And it wasn't even in that big of a city or anything. So it's just like, I don't really need all this space and I don't want to pay that much money to live in a one bedroom apartment. And one of the other things that I miss about living in Japan is pretty much anything medical related. Now. Keep in mind, when I was living abroad in Japan, I uh, was stationed out there as part of the US Navy. So all my medical stuff was taken care of through like TRICARE and all that kind of stuff. So I didn't have to really worry about going like out in town for medical stuff. But you know, I'd constantly see like my uh, expat friends out in Japan going in for like either routine examinations, x-rays, uh, sometimes some uh, surgeries as well. You know, even just like an x-ray was like 30, 40 bucks USD. Uh, I think the most expensive thing that I saw was uh, one of my friends got like root canal surgery and it was like 500 bucks for the whole thing. And I'm like, wow, you could not get that in America. I don't care how good your insurance is. It's just insane to me. And so the sixth thing that I miss about living abroad in Japan is that 
In Japan, people usually leave you alone. Now, this can all depend on where you're at in Japan. You know, if you're in the city side, like in Tokyo, for example, I do hear a lot from my friends that people are kind of cold out there and they kind of interpret them as, as being cold. But for me, they just are more like respectful of, of people. They don't want to like bother people or anything like that. So for me, as an introvert, it's definitely very nice to not get constantly bothered by people just walking around. But in other cities like Osaka and Kyoto and stuff like that, people are more apt to kind of talk to you um, out in the street and stuff like that. So not saying those things don't happen in Tokyo, but they're a lot less likely to happen. And so the seventh thing that I miss about living in Japan is that in the city side, there's always something to do, whether it's going to the malls or going to some landmark. And this also kind of ties in with just uh, my love for the aesthetic, the aesthetic of Japan. You know, there's just always something to do, some festival to go to, some little pop-up shop that happens, you know, some landmarks, some, there's always something to do. Whereas where I was at in rural Ohio or even out in Michigan, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of options to do. And plus you had to like drive all the way out there and it was just like, ugh, man. <laughs> just put me on the train so I can just kind of zone out and listen to podcasts until we get there, right? And so the eighth thing that I miss about living in Japan is that there's open drinking in Japan. So here in the States, I can't have open containers of alcohol out and about. Like I can't like have a beer just walking around town or whatever here in the States, uh, but in Japan, you can do that. And it's just really nice, you know, just if anything, it's just kind of convenient. So, you know, you don't have to worry about like having a little brown bag and just like, oh man, <laughs> you know? And you know, it's kind of essential for things like Hanami, uh, which is the spring gathering where people basically sit under the cherry blossoms and drink and eat and have fun. And so the ninth and final thing that I miss about living in Japan while living here, currently in the States, is that in Japan, there's plenty of opportunities to meet up with foreigners from all walks of life. I met so many different people during my time in Japan from all over the world. Uh, I've met some people from like Turkey, a lot of Canadians, somebody from Finland, all over the place, and even fellow Americans. I've met Americans from all around America, even and it's just such a good thing to meet up with so many people from so many different walks of life. It really gives your own life a lot of perspective and it just allows you to think a lot more globally and gets you out of your little comfort bubble, as it were. Those are some things that I miss about living in Japan while uh, currently living here in America. So let me know in the comments down below in the boopy de boops if you've lived abroad whether it's in Japan or elsewhere, what are some things that you miss from living in that country while you're living either in your home country or elsewhere around the world? Let me know in the comments down below. And with that said, guys, this is the Andy San. It's not it for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. Welcome to a new episode of Andy Talks Japandi. In today's episode, guys, we're going to be talking about what foods from Japan do I miss that I can't get in America? And this question comes from Dustin of the Solo Travel Blog and Japan Questions Answer channel. Big shout out to him. Uh, definitely check out his stuff as well. So I got these listed. These are in no particular order. With that said, let's get right into it. And one of the things that I miss food-wise is the Japanese chains like Mos Burger and America House. Um, I was really big into burgers because you know me, Mr. America Gin, gotta get my hamburger on, right? But I really love chains like Mos Burger, uh, Freshest Burger is another good one. And America House, I didn't even know they were a chain until years later. I just would usually go out to the one in Yokohama they got some good stuff there, not gonna lie. And it's always super fresh. Uh, the burgers at Most Burger aren't that good, but the fries, definitely amazing, and they're always fresh. And with Freshest Burger, I think their burgers are a lot better, but they don't let you customize anything, so you pretty much have to get it as is. So if you're particular about like no onions, no pickles, whatever, or you wanna add something, it's not really something you can do at Freshest Burger. And so another food that I miss 
in, from Japan are my local burger shops, uh, like the one in Yokosuka in my neighborhood, uh, Snug State Door Cafe, which I've heard has recently reopened after two years of being closed. And I'm really excited and really hoping my friends can make it down there and really see like what I was talking about because like I'm a big fan of that restaurant. I've done a video on it. Be sure to check it out in the Andy Japandi playlist. And I'm hoping that the store gets a lot more coverage and that they too can enjoy the same burgers that I had. And so another food that I miss out in Japan, oddly enough, are the, over there, be the foreign foods. So, you know, franchises like McDonald's, Burger King, Domino's, stuff like that. Which is kind of weird because we have those in mass out here in America, but why would I miss the ones in Japan? Well, for one, the ones in Japan have, you know, some different promotional items, which can be pretty interesting. And also just the quality of the food and the attention to detail and everything is much better out in Japan versus in America, where sometimes I feel like they kind of just slap some stuff together and just throw it in a bag and just like hand it to you. It can be very mechanical getting fast food here in the States, whereas in Japan, it's very nice and it feels like you're at a nice little sit down restaurant. It's really cool. And I really love the attention to detail and the freshness of the food. Another food that I miss is from my local ramen shop in Yokosuka, as well as just the sheer amount of ramen that's plentily available in Japan. Not just in the shops, but also instant ramen cup noodle type stuff. Those are even like way better made than the stuff you find here in the States, which is usually just like block of noodles and some MSG filled packet of who knows what that just kind of gets you by. Basically like flavored cardboard. But uh, the stuff in Japan has different packets. They got packets for like dried vegetables. They got one for the seasoning, one for the fat, and you just mix it up and it's so freaking good. And of course, if you get it from the shops, it's even better because it's fresh. And you can usually pair it with a beer for a 10 spotter, Isan Yen. It's actually about 950 USD. And you have yourself a really good meal at a pretty competitive price, all things considered. And I really miss those a lot. And of course, another food that I miss, especially since I lived out in Yokosuka, is all the curry restaurants out there. Now, every city, town is usually known for something particular, whether it's a particular food or like a plant or a tree or something like that. And Yokosuka is primarily known for curry. And there's just a huge, plentiful amount of curry shops out in Yokosuka. There's even curry festivals that occur around summertime. So if you're out in the Yokosuka slash Kanagawa area, I'd recommend you check those out. Give the good old Kaigun curry, Navy curry a try. And if you're looking for something a little more flavorful as far as like depth of flavor and things like that, there's plenty of Indian style curry restaurants out there as well. And so another thing I miss, bottled tea. I can technically get these from the import shops, but at the import shops, they usually cost about like five bucks for like a two liter. I could get them at like Donkey, Don Quixote, or like a Kambini or something like that for maybe like a buck, two bucks at the most. Especially in the summertime, I would just get like a friggin' jug of jasmine green tea, which is my all time fave. Just throw that thing in the fridge, get it nice and cold and just chug it down. Nothing better on a hot summer day, let me tell you what. And speaking of beverages, I think this will get me on a whole like tangent of different beverages that I miss. So I have a whole list of them here. Another thing that I miss is canned coffee. As you guys know, Japan is plentiful with their uh, vending machines. I think it was, what was it, like one vending machine per 13 people or something like that. And in a lot of these vending machines, they have canned coffee. And you can also pick these up at convenience stores, the convenies. Uh, you can also get them at department stores as well, which is a lot cheaper. So if you're looking to get your canned coffee on the cheap, definitely recommend you check out the uh, canned coffee in the stores. A lot of times you can get like a little six pack or whatever. And that's about like half the cost of what it would be if you got six cans of the same exact coffee from the vending machines. So if you're pinching pennies and you still need your uh, canned coffee fix, definitely recommend doing it that way. And there's just so many different varieties. You can get uh, black coffee, which is usually the cheapest and my personal favorite because it tastes so dang good. And it's not like super acidic, so it doesn't like 
completely tear my stomach up. When I came back to the States and tried drinking black coffee, it would just like tear my stomach up and I'd be feeling like crap all day. Uh, but over there, it definitely does have that acidic bite, but it doesn't like mess up my stomach at all. And another beverage that I miss out in Japan is Mitsuya Cider. It's kind of like their version of like Sprite or 7-Up. To me, it's kind of like kind of a mixture of the two. Like it has the nice refreshing snap of Sprite, but also has kind of the deep flavor of 7-Up. So it's kind of a weird in between and it's really good. And it's especially good on a bad stomach. So if you drink a lot the night before and your stomach's kind of flippy floppy, or you drank too much coffee <laughs> and your stomach's a little flippy floppy, a good little bottle or whatever of Mitsuya Cider will do you good. And another beverage I miss so dearly is Match. And I'd usually get this out when I was uh, playing in the arcades. They'd usually have a little vending machine. You'd get Match Soda out there. And I just associate it with memories of just like Having a bottle match on the side while I'm playing some video games, got my little pocket of coins and stuff off to the side, just throwing in coins and just sipping on some match. And just, you know, such good memories, you know, whether I was out and about in Akihabara or even just locally in Yokosuka, going to Plaza Capcom, playing the fighting games. It's usually where I was at. Ah, brings back so many good memories. It fills me with the with the natsukashi, as it were. Moving on to the more adult beverages that I miss, canned chuhai. You can also get beer and stuff like that out in Japan, but it's okay. It's really nothing to write home about. Some beers that I like would be Kirin. That's kind of the standard basic beer. Nothing really super remarkable. You know, just kind of a regular beer. I guess this is the best way I can describe it. You know, it's not bad, but it's not particularly remarkable either. It's usually something I kind of pair with a lot of foods or just kind of as an in-between when I'm drinking some chew high. Another one I like uh, is the Sapporo White Belge in particular. The regular Sapporo, is, eh, it's a favorite a lot, but I'm not particularly uh, fond of it. But the White Belge, definitely got to check that out. That's, that's actually one of my favorite beers from out in Japan. But Getting back to the canned chuhai. Chuhai, for those who don't know, is basically like, a, like kind of like a wine cooler, sort of. It's short for sochu highball. So the combination of sochu, which is like rice wine, uh, can also be made with potatoes and other things. But it's primarily rice and mixture of like club soda and usually like a fruit syrup or juice. So usually at the convenience stores, the common flavors would be like lemon, lime, and grapefruit. Uh, they also have uh, seasonal flavors as well. So if you get it during the summertime, you can get like a cherry flavored one. Uh, during the summer, they usually have like green apple or pineapple, which those are two of my favorites right there. For me, I prefer the strong type of Chuhai. They also have the strong zeros out there, which have a wider selection of flavors. But those always tend to give me a headache, so I usually stick with the Kirin Strongs. Those usually got me pretty drunk at a very reasonable price, and they tasted pretty good too. Like you'd be slamming them, you're not really feeling it until like the second or third one in, it's like, oh. So definitely a good tip for you guys who like to go out clubbing because the drinks at the bar and stuff can get pretty pricey, especially if you're clubbing out in Roppongi or elsewhere in Tokyo. So definitely recommend picking up a couple chew high at the local Hibini, get your pregame on, and then just hitting up the clubs so you don't have to drink as much at the club. Save you a little coin. And so moving on to uh, other foods I miss, speaking of convenies, actually, one of the foods I miss a lot is the convini bento. So usually I would get like the tonkatsu curry bento. It was just like so freaking good. And you can get it heated at the uh, convenience store or what I'd usually do is just heat it at home because I didn't want it to get cold on my way home. And it's just like really good, really filling, and it pairs really nicely with a can of cold chew high, let me tell you what. And moving on to more convenience foods that I miss. Onigiri, which is little rice balls. So you can get it with just the rice and like a filling, or you can get it traditionally wrapped with uh, some seaweed. Didn't really bother me with the seaweed, but uh, usually I'd get like ones that are filled with like tuna. That was like my kind of my go-to flavor. But then I'd kind of mix it up and get some other ingredients as well, but 
Usually like the tuna filled ones were like my go-to. Those would make for a really good breakfast actually. And I'd also pair it with the other food that I miss so much from Japan is anpan or uh, like red bean paste filled little bread that you get at convenience stores. Now a lot of people probably know like melon pan, like a cream filled bread bun and it's like coated with uh, like melon juice and stuff like that. So it tastes like a melon. Uh, I had those before, but for me personally, I find them a little too sugary. So I usually like to stick with the anpan and sometimes you can get them with the uh, like roasted uh, sesame seeds on top, which adds a nice deeper, more earthy flavor to it. You just can't beat a good anpan, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, anpan man. That's kind of uh, my go-to as far as breakfast goes. You know, switching between anpan and onigiri and a nice can of coffee. You know, it's definitely my breakfast choice when uh, I was living abroad in Japan. So guys, if you've lived abroad in Japan or elsewhere in the world, uh, let me know in the comments down below in the boobity boops, what are some foods and beverages that you miss from your time living abroad? And with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign it for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, I'm recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japandi. And today's video was inspired by a video response I did to Andrew Higgins of Higgins in Japan called Living in Japan no regrets. And I made that video response back in 2015 when I first returned to the States after having lived in Yokosuka, Japan for over two years. Today's video, I wanted to do something a little different. So I wanted to kind of twist that a little bit and answer the question, do I regret leaving Japan versus living in Japan? And in order to properly answer that question, we have to propose a what if scenario. Had I got accepted to a university out in Japan versus stateside in Michigan. A lot of things would have changed had that happened. And had I known that I was able to even apply to universities and use my GI Bill money to universities outside of the States and still get paid BAH and all that kind of stuff, you know, obviously I would have applied to a university out in Japan, especially freaking Tokyo. Had I done this while I was still living in Japan, I would have been able to physically go to the campuses out in Temple University and Lakeland University being the two major English speaking universities in Japan. And had I got accepted to one of those universities, the first thing that comes to mind that would have changed is that I wouldn't have bought my desktop computer, the Chillbox, because I love desktop computers, but they're not the most portable computer out there. The reason I got the desktop was because I knew living in America, first off, I would have the space. And second off, I wouldn't be needing to like move around as much. Had I been accepted to a university out in Japan, I would have gone for a mo more mobile solution. So I probably would have spent that money on a kick-ass like high-end laptop. The second thing that would have changed is that I would have had the far majority of my savings. Now keep in mind at the time, I would saved up about 12 or $13,000. I spent a good amount of that money when I came back to the States on a car, and then the rest on living expenses, getting myself all set up in my apartment, basically carried me over for like the first six months. Had I got accepted to university out in Tokyo, I still would have come back to America in September to out process, as well as stay with the folks for three months until the spring semester started in 2016. But instead of moving out to Michigan, I would have instead just caught a flight out to Tokyo. On the surface, that sounds really good, right? Because I would be in the country that I wanted to be in and I wouldn't have to worry about Navy restrictions holding me back. I could continue making the anti japan videos that I love to make. I would still be around my group of friends and still making videos, especially the videos I wanted to make, you know, with the anti japan series and stuff like that, collaborating with people, all that fun stuff. So it sounds pretty good on the surface, right? But you also have to consider the negative aspects of that. And that is my transition out of the military mentally wasn't the greatest. And I went through a lot of processing emotions and just processing a lot of the shit basically that I went through during my time in the service, especially uh, my time abroad in Japan. And I don't know if I would have been able to have taken it the same way as I did in the States. Things could have ended up a lot worse because if 
I didn't do so well grade-wise while in Japan. Um, it would have affected my visa and I would have had to return back to the States if I failed out of the college that I went to. And from there, I don't know where my savings would have been at that point. And I don't know if I would have had a plan to fall back on had that happened. You had to take those into consideration as well as all the positives. And also, my mindset was a lot different at the time, you know? There's times where I go back and look at some of my older videos, and for this video, I went and looked back at videos from just like a year or two ago. You know, all these different experiences and all these different failures really helped mold my resolve in coming back to Japan. And I think had I just got accepted to a university outright, I don't know if my resolve would have been as strong and I might have just kind of accepted my fate and might have just ended there. So looking back at all the failures that I went through, coming back to America, being accepted to a college out in Michigan, going through a lot of just adjustment issues, having low grades because of it, having to transfer to a community college to keep things going, and then eventually coming back to Ohio, stay with the folks for a little bit, figure myself out, and then coming here to North Carolina, where I'm at now, going back to college, doing really well, I might add, and on the grind to come back to Japan. I don't know if my resolve would have been as strong as it is now had I just went to Japan right after getting out of the military. And also you have to consider freelancing because the whole freelancing thing started when, you know, one of my friend's hard drives crashed. You may know him online as Tikio Sam, my good old buddy, when his hard drive had crashed and I decided to help him out and it just kind of grew from there. Those are all what ifs and possibilities of things that are out of my control at this point. So the only thing I can really control is here and now. Taking all that into consideration, and seeing where I am now versus where I was then. Ultimately, the answer to do I regret leaving Japan is no. While there are some things that I wish would have happened which would have made my life easier, the cons of the scenario and the potential consequences of that scenario being out in Japan versus stateside would have made things a lot worse and would have made my return to the country after being kicked out of school a lot more difficult. So I think all things considered, I made the right choice coming back to the States and what happened happened, it was what it was, but overall it's made me into a much stronger person with a much stronger resolve. And when I do make it back out to Japan, I'm gonna be a much better person for it and be able to make the videos that I wanna make and just have, you know, that drive so question of the day, if you guys have lived abroad in another country and have gone back to your home country or to another country, do you have any regrets of leaving that country? And if so, let me know in the comments down below in the booby boops. And even if you don't have any regrets, let me know. So with that said guys, this is the Andy San, sign for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later guys, bye. So yeah guys, uh, we out here. At the post office just got done sending in some stuff that sold on eBay uh, feeling really good about that getting some stuff out there making a little bit of a little bit of extra change and whatnot let's get on with the big news and this is major news so if you guys watched my previous video that I sent out like literally yesterday <laughs> celebrating my four years being out of the US Navy in that video I talked about mostly my return to Japan, and just how the gears are gonna start turning very soon. Well, clank clank, motherfucker, them gears is turning. I'm proud to say that I finally have the funds to go out to Japan. Today also bought a laptop, camera, and even a phone. And they're all used, so I was able to get a pretty good deal on them, so. I even went under budget as far as that goes, so I'm feeling even better about that. And I have a pretty sizable nest egg to, uh, to last me until the GI Bill kicks in once I get out to Japan. I'm just so over the moon. You guys, this has been four years in the making, and I'm actually seeing some progress. I just, I, I feel like my heart's gonna leap out of my chest. I'm so fucking excited about all this. 
And uh, I'm sure you guys are probably wondering, well, Andy, where'd you get all the money for that? Like, did like what happened? Did you find a <laughs> find a suitcase full of like five thousand dollars or something like that? That's not the case. Literally, it's not the case. But uh, no, nah, what actually happened? And I do want to put a disclaimer out here. So if anybody else is thinking about doing what I'm doing, I would highly discourage doing it. Um, what I did um, was definitely kind of a, a last resort sort of thing. And, you know, I ended up losing a lot of money for it, but I gained a lot of money too. So just keep that in mind. I know I'm going to get a lot of flack in the comments for it, but for the sake of transparency, I do want to let you guys know how I was able to get that money. And it was, it was totally legit, it wasn't anything legal, so you don't have to worry about that kind of shit. But basically, I cashed out my retirement fund. And like I said, I know I'm gonna get some flack in the comments for that, but yeah, I did a, an early withdrawal for the majority of my retirement fund. The funds got dispersed to my account today, so that's why I was able to you know buy all that stuff. I'm really fucking excited, man. Like, the camera's shaking because my hand's fucking shaking because I'm so fucking pumped about everything. Again, I just want to emphasize that I don't recommend everybody doing this or anybody else really doing this because um, if you're under 59 and a half, in, in my case, you do get penalized for doing early withdrawals. So you really have to keep that in mind. And I ended up losing a lot of my savings because I did an early withdrawal. Yeah, it's, de it's definitely not something I would recommend, but it was an option available to me, and I wanted to, for sure, give Japan a shot. I didn't want to go in there half-ass it and be like, well, you know, if I just would have stuck it out a little bit longer, if I just would have worked a little bit harder, or if this would have happened, then I would have got to stay in Japan. You know, like, I want to make absolutely sure that I'm doing literally everything I can to get my ass out to Japan and to make it out there. And, you know, what can I say? I gotta put a little skin in the game, you know what I'm saying? So, it is what it is. Again, I don't recommend going the route that I did in order to do it, but for the sake of transparency, that's what I did. And, uh, I'm not gonna go over dollar amounts, but it was enough. So we'll just leave it at that. But now let's get back to the fun stuff. I'm just so fucking excited to finally make some headway in my return to Japan. Um, since I first applied to universities out in Tokyo and got rejected because my GPA was so low, I've done so much to remedy that. Um, just this past semester, I've raised my GPA from well below a 2.0. I don't even know what it was. It was probably like a one point something, if that. <laughs> raised my GPA up to a 3.0 now. And the way this semester is going, we're on our way to at least a 3.5. So I'm feeling very bullish about that. And in addition to that, are going to be continuing to save up for my return to Japan because even though I got a pretty sizable nest egg, it doesn't hurt to have a little extra cash. So that's why I'm going to be selling pretty much all my stuff on eBay and elsewhere. And that's to not only save up for Japan, but it's also to just lighten the load because like I really don't need a whole lot in going out to Japan. Like really just need like clothes, laptop, camera, phone, and a few other little things, and that's about it, really. Like, <laughs> you don't need a whole lot to study abroad, and it's probably best that you, like, minimize, or minimize what you take, your luggage, out there. The next step, in addition to maintaining an exceeding GPA and saving up even more for my return to Japan, is to apply to universities out in Japan. The thing is, I did get rejected from the university I wanted to go to. The way things are going, schedule-wise, ideally, if I'm able to get in, get my application in before the end of this month, and if I get accepted, then the earliest that I could be in the country 
is before the end of this year. And I'll be starting up school beginning of 2020. Ooh. But if that doesn't pan out, then next thing I could apply for is for summer class. And that starts at the end of May 2020. If it happens, it happens. But, uh, you know, if I got to wait a little bit longer, that's fine. I've waited four years for this moment. So what's another couple months, right? And it'll give me more time to save up and all that stuff too. But I do want to push to uh, come this spring, or be technically winter, but semantics. Sent out a message to uh, one of the schools out there. So I got to see if I have to just completely start over my application or if I just need to send in updated information and things like that. And we can go from there. And I want to thank you guys so much for sticking with me through these really hard times. As a lot of times I didn't think that I'd make it, that Japan was just a fantasy, you know, that I would have to give up and work in a factory somewhere in Ohio and that'd be my life. But you guys have helped get me through those hard times and see me through to the good times that are ahead and uh i just want to thank you guys for all the support and with that said before my phone overheats we're gonna sign off here so yeah with that said this is the andy san signing for now and as always see you next time catch you later guys bye so yeah guys welcome to a brand new episode of andy talks japandy and before we get into the super special awesome news that I have to share with y'all. I do have a little bit of non-Japan related news to share, and that is I got a new camera. The Panasonic G85. Got this bad boy used off of B&H Photo. Shout out to the Everyday Dad for showing me what this bad boy can do. And this is gonna be my weapon of choice moving forward. But it literally just came in today, so the battery is completely drained. And I didn't want to wait for the battery to be recharged to make this video because I can't hold in this news any longer. This is literally the best thing that I could have received. And that is, it's official guys. My ass is coming back to Japan. I've been accepted into Lakeland University, Japan. And I've been accepted for the spring semester 2020, which means that I'm going to be moving to Japan at the end of this year, 2019, woo, and I'm going to be starting up school beginning of 2020. So, oh my God, this, this is literally the culmination of four years. As I talked about in the previous Andy Talks Japan episode, I went through a lot since coming back to America after being stationed abroad in Yokosuka, Japan for two years. The original plan was to graduate college in the States and then come back to Japan. But as you guys know, you can follow me for that time. Um, things don't always work out as we planned. And I went through some stuff mentally that I had to unpack and it affected my grades. And I bounced around different schools until eventually the end of 2017, I decided to take a break and drop out for a little bit to, uh, to figure myself out and moved back in with my family and uh, moved out here to North Carolina to go back to school, build up my GPA, save up for Japan. And now, nearly a year later, and we're here, baby. This is the culmination of all this hard work and build up. And honestly, I couldn't be happier. I just, oh my God. <laughs> I don't even know if this is real yet. I don't think, I don't even think this whole thing is gonna sink in until I have the plane ticket in my hand and I'm actually like boarding my flight to Japan. This just seems like, oh man. As a wise person once said, when you fight for your dreams, your dreams will fight for you. I'm just so over the moon with this and uh, gonna be starting up Lakeland at the beginning of 2020. And to start up Andy Japandi again after a four year hiatus, <laughs> I guess you could call it, is the best feeling in the world. I guess for the sake of transparency, I do also want to mention that I'm going to be accepted into Lakeland University 
uh, on a probationary period. And what that means is that I have to get a 2.0 or higher in order to continue to go there. But considering my current track record, I have a 3.0 from last semester, looking to bump that up to like a 3.5 by the end of this semester. I think, uh, I think we're gonna be okay. But I just wanted to mention that for the sake of transparency. Before I start rambling even more, I just wanna thank you guys so much for all the support over the years and for sticking with me during this time. Because honestly, I didn't know if I was gonna make it back to Japan at all. Saving up and getting the gear and everything that I needed just seemed like such a daunting task. But I decided to, to believe in myself and uh, go all in. Cashed out my retirement fund, not all of it, but a majority of it, in order to afford everything and I couldn't be happier. So I just wanna thank you guys so much for all the support. I'm sorry this is kind of a rambly mess, but I'm just so excited, if you couldn't tell. <laughs> so, with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign out for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Get you later, guys. Bye. See you soon in Japan. <laughs> Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japandy. In today's episode, guys, I'm gonna be introducing you to my new channel, Andy Japandy. I'm gonna be giving you guys my vision of this channel moving forward, as well as introducing myself for those who don't know who I am and what I'm about. So that said, let's get on with the show. So yeah, welcome to my new channel, Andy Japandy. This channel is dedicated to all of my Japan-related content moving forward. It's gonna contain my Andy Talks Japandy series, which you're watching right now, where I talk about various facets of my experiences in Japan. And it's also going to host my Andy Japandi series, where I show you around different parts of Japan, mainly focusing on the Tokyo slash Kanagawa area. But I also want to move into other parts of Japan as well, but that's all dependent on budget and time. So for now, we'll just stick with the Tokyo slash Kanagawa area. And there's a lot to explore out there, let me tell you. I also want to get some guests on the channel as well. Not just the big names that you all know and love, but also some lesser known names and even some people that aren't on YouTube just to share their experiences of their life in Japan. You might be wondering like, why even bother to start this channel? I mean, the original Andy Japandi series and the original Andy Talks Japandi series and even before that, the Andy Before Japandi series was on my personal channel. So the reason I decided to splinter that off to here is for a couple of reasons. Um, one of them is just kind of the sign of the times, basically, just how YouTube is doing things. YouTube favors having channels with specific types of content and also just viewing habits. I realize, especially considering my editing channel, edited by the Andy San, seeing the success of that channel where it's gone from here, I decided to splinter off my Japan related content. Now, a little disclaimer, this channel is going to contain all new content. I'm not going to be moving any of my old stuff from my personal channel onto this channel. And I learned my lesson from last time. It was just a huge pain in the ass to like move everything over and get all the titles and the, the thumbnails and all that kind of stuff all taken care of. So why even bother? Let's just spend that time in making a fresh new quality Japan content. And so now I'll take this time to introduce myself for those who don't know who I am. First off, hi, <laughs> my name is Andy. I've been on YouTube since 2006. I've been making regular content here on the platform since 2008. Before that, and even during that, I was also into uh, blogging as well. And from 2010 to 2015, I was a member of the United States Navy. And from 2013 to 2015, before I got out, I was stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan, and I made a lot of videos of my time out there, both showing off different parts of Yokosuka, other parts in Kanagawa, parts in like Tokyo area as well, and I really enjoyed making those videos. They're a bit dated looking at them now, especially considering what I know about editing and cinematography and all this kind of stuff, so I definitely want to up my game with the new Andy Japandi series and show off what I've learned in these past four going on five years since I left the country. After I got out of the Navy, 2015, I came back here to the States and went to school up in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I went to Western Michigan University, go Broncos, and also went to Kalamazoo Valley Community College, KVCC, also known as Valley. Originally starting off in a management information systems major, I wasn't really too jazzed about it, to be honest. I just started it because I thought it was the logical thing to do, but my heart just really wasn't in it, and my grades definitely showed that. 
So I decided to switch majors and switched over to film, video, and media production out in Western. And that was more of a traditional media type major. So we were watching like films and stuff like that. And we were just kind of breaking down the different aspects of them and things like that. But we weren't really doing what I wanted to do, which was learn more about video editing and learning how to edit on Premiere Pro or Final Cut or Avid or just a myriad of different editors, uh, DaVinci Resolve being the new hotness as of late. Over at Kalamazoo Valley, they were offering classes about the Adobe Suite. So I decided to transfer over there so I could learn more about how to be a better video editor and just learn how to do more things with uh, the Adobe Suite and just become a much more efficient editor. During my time, out in Michigan, I uh, was helping out a, a friend of mine. Uh, you might know him online as Tico Sam, my good old buddy. At the time, his hard drive had crashed and he was doing daily content and he didn't want to lose his streak. So I asked him if I could edit his stuff while he was getting his hard drive situation taken care of because I wanted to help him out. And so after his hard drive had gotten fixed, he decided to take me on as his editor and uh, edited his uh, Tico Play series, uh, primarily his Tico Rant series, I did a little bit with Tikio Cinema. So I basically took a lot of the then daily content off his plate so that way he could focus on his vlogs and other videos that he would personally edit. And uh, from there, he introduced me to a lot of different people around Japan who needed editors like Eric Surf 6, uh, Brian from Ramen Ventures. And from there, I grew my clientele and became a fully fledged freelance video editor. It basically became a secondary job for me after a while and it just kind of grew to the point to where I've been doing it essentially full time for about a year now, the time of this recording. Between going to school, doing freelance work, I also sell stuff on eBay. And so at the end of 2017, I decided to take a break from college because I was in a really bad place mentally. I don't want to get too into it with this video, but I was in a bad place mentally and decided to just take a break from college for a little bit. Uh, moved back in with my parents in 2018. Uh, just kind of figure myself out, figure out what I really wanted to do because I had really enjoyed my time out in Japan when I was stationed out in Yokosuka and I really wanted to get back there. But my original plan was to just graduate from college and then once I got my bachelor's degree, just move out to Japan to teach English like everybody else does. During this time, 2018, when I was kind of figuring myself out, I also helped my parents start up a video production company out in Ohio, Leading Line Productions. And uh, we made a lot of great videos, but it never really took off like we had expected it to. Tension kind of grew in the house a little bit because I was still doing freelance work for everybody else in addition to the stuff for the production company. So I was just kind of trucking along, but uh, tension grew in the house. At the end of 2018, moved in with my brother here in North Carolina, and I decided to go back to college, get my GPA up and apply to a university out in Japan. And when I first applied to the university out in Japan, uh, Lakeland University of Japan to be specific, they denied me because my GPA was too low, obviously from all the mental health stuff that happened at the end of 2017. So I decided to take some classes here at the local community college to build my GPA back up. And after the summer semester, reapplied to the same college and the dean was really impressed with my improvements and decided to give me a chance and I've been officially accepted into Lakeland University of Japan to start in the spring 2020 semester. So I'm very excited about that. I'm still going to community college to not only boost my GPA up further, but to help me save up thanks to the GI Bill and to just keep cracking on credits. And so I'll be moving out to Tokyo, Japan at the end of this year, 2019, to start school in Tokyo at the very beginning of 2020. So I'm really looking forward to it. It's gonna be a very exciting time. That's when the Olympics are gonna be out there. It's gonna be a huge boom in tourism and there's gonna be a lot of interest in Japan in 2020 and in subsequent years as well. And I definitely want to make the videos that I wanna make out there and to show people just how awesome Japan can be. But in addition to showing off all the cool parts of Tokyo and all this other stuff, I also want to talk about the more practical aspects of living in Japan. Talking about the cost of living as a student in Japan. 
talk about different ways that you could save money out in Japan, different ways you can make money out in Japan aside from just English teaching. You know, there's a lot of different aspects of Japan life that hasn't really been talked about on YouTube. And I want to talk about those things because I think that they're very important, especially for people who want to come over to Japan, not just to tour around Tokyo and Kyoto and Osaka and stuff like that for a couple weeks, but if they want to come here as a student, or come here to work. There's a lot of aspects to living in Japan that, like I said, just aren't covered. And I wanna cover those. Really looking forward to making more videos on this channel. I have a whole bunch of different ideas for Andy Talks Japan before I move out to Japan. And even after I move out to Japan, a lot of stuff I wanna talk about. So I hope you guys enjoy the content of this channel moving forward. And with that said, this is the Andy San, signing for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japan. Today's episode, guys, I'm going to be showing you how to use the GI Bill to study abroad in Japan. Now, when I got out of the U.S. Navy back in 2015, I initially didn't even know that you could use the GI Bill to study abroad at all. And by the time I found out, I'd already been accepted to an American university and was going on from there. When I first found out about it, there was a very limited amount of information that was out there. And from what I've gathered, the amount of BAH and stuff that you would get would vary wildly from maybe like 1500 bucks a month to 700 to 800 bucks a month depending on which university, which country, and all that sorts of stuff. And the amount that the government would pay the school would vary as well. So I didn't want to potentially be stranded in another country with little to no money and have to worry about paying back a foreign university. So I just decided to go through with going back to school in Amerkajan land. Just a little recap, I went out initially to Western Michigan University out in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Then I went over to KVCC, Kalamazoo Valley, to study some stuff with the Adobe Suite for video editing. And then I took a break for about a year and a half, and now I'm going back to school here in North Carolina uh, just to get my GPA up, get them grades in, all that fun stuff. And then at the end of this year, 2019, I'm going to be studying abroad in Tokyo, Japan very beginning of 2020. So it's been quite a wild ride for the old Andy Sands Amadeshita. I just want to teach you guys how to use your GI Bill to study abroad. When I was initially looking for ways to study in Japan, um, I initially went through the usual like study abroad programs. So uh, Western Michigan has several study abroad programs and I did a whole video on them as well. So if you want to check them out, be sure to, uh, to do that. I'll put a link in the description or something like that. Maybe pin it in the comments. Just be sure to remind me. But in any event, after looking up all these different programs and talking to the study abroad advisor, I found out that since I'm on the GI Bill, I can't use my GI Bill to study abroad unless my major explicitly requires it. So I was kind of out on that front and I just kind of gave up on the, uh, the dream to come back to Japan for a little bit. I figured I'd just stay in America, get my degree and come back to Japan as an English teacher. And then a couple years later, one of my old shipmates got accepted out to a university in Japan with the GI Bill. And I was wondering like, how was he able to do that? So I ended up contacting him. It turns out that although you can't study abroad in a foreign country, unless your major requires it, you can just apply to a foreign university out there. Keep in mind, a lot of foreign universities have certain requirements, uh, most notably language requirements. In this case, you can technically use the GI Bill to go to a Japanese university. You do have to have typically N2 or above level of Japanese proficiency to even get accepted into a Japanese university. And yes, there are some Japanese universities that have degrees that are taught completely in English, Sophia University being one of them, but most of the regular Japanese universities are taught entirely in Japanese. So just keep that in mind. So as far as going to school out in Japan goes, there are three main schools out there for foreigners. Uh, one of them being Sophia University, which I mentioned before. They have several courses that are taught entirely in English, and there's some that are taught in Japanese. So the ones that are taught in Japanese, you have to have the N2 or above to even qualify, basically. Uh, one of my friends, Zach, you may know him online as Phoenix787, he actually graduated from Sophia University, and so he could tell you a lot more about it than I could. But the other one that's probably the most commonly known one is Temple University, Japan. Their main campus is out in the Boston area. And then the third one, which is the one I'm going to be going to, is Lakeland University, Japan. And their main campus is out in the Sheboygan 
Wisconsin area. The reason I decided to go to Lakeland versus Temple is because in my particular case with Temple, unless you've lived in Japan for six months or more consecutively before you apply, you have to stay in their dorms for the first semester. I looked at the dorms and everything and don't get me wrong, they look really nice, but nice comes at a price. They're in a very expensive part of Tokyo and they're very westernized dorms. So it'll end up costing you a whole lot of money in the long run. And I figured instead of just spending all that money to live like an American in Japan, why not just use that money for something else? So I decided to apply to Lakeland, which didn't have any such requirement. I'm gonna be living out in a guest house in Japan, saving a whole lot of money and getting more opportunities to use some Japanese because if you go to live in an international dorm, you know, typically they're gonna be speaking English. So you won't have a whole lot of uh, opportunities to practice your Japanese. That's one of the reasons why I decided to go out to Lakeland. As far as my application process goes, I basically just went to the website, got the email for the admissions people, and they got me in, in contact with one of their reps, and I just went through the application process using them as like a reference point. So if I had any kind of problems with the application process, I just hit them up for an email. It's like, hey, what about this thing or this form or blah, blah, blah. And it was pretty straightforward as far as the application process. If you've applied to a college in America, it's basically the same thing, really. If you're applying to, in this case, Lakeland University from America, uh, they recommend that you use their home campus's address in Sheboygan to uh, send documents to so you don't have to wait two to three weeks to get them all sent out to the campus in Japan. That's where I sent like all my transcripts, all of my different application forms that I had to send in the snail mail rather than just email stuff. And when I initially applied, I didn't get accepted because of my low GPA at the time. So I went and took some courses here at the uh, local community college here in North Carolina and uh, raised my GPA, contacted the admissions people to see like, do I have to reapply or whatever the case since I already had my application on file. And they're like, no, 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 you're good, you're good. You know, they talked it over with the dean considering my new GPA and he was really impressed with my improvement. So he decided to give me a chance and I was officially accepted into Lakeland University of Japan to start in the spring of 2020. And so that's what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be leaving America the end of 2019 to start school beginning of 2020. And just one little uh, tidbit to note here, uh, especially for BAH. So if you're wondering about what the BAH, uh, this basic allowance for housing, it's a uh, housing allowance. Uh, if you're wondering what that's going to be for foreign universities or overseas universities, at the time it's recording, all BAH for uh, overseas universities is uh, maxed out at $1,789. And keep in mind, this changes every year, so if you're watching this in the future, greetings, and uh, be sure to look up the uh, current BAH for whatever year you're watching this video in. And so question of the day, if you're a veteran and you've gone to school overseas, whether it's in Japan or a different country, what are your experiences? Be sure to let me know in the comments down below in the boobity boops. And uh, if you have any questions, be sure to leave those down there as well. And with that said, this is the Andy Sun. Sign up for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, Yang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks to Pandy. In today's episode, guys, I'm going to be talking to you about why I'm studying abroad in Tokyo, Japan. And the short answer is because my school's out there. But there's a bit more to it than that. Um, in addition to my school, Lakeland University Japan, being out in Tokyo, Japan, it's also where a lot of my friends are, especially my YouTube friends. Uh, I made a lot of them uh, when I was stationed out in Nikosuka, Japan, back in 2013, 2015, when I came back to America. And I'd love to meet up with them again, and collab, and make videos, and do all that fun YouTube stuff, because it's been sorely missed. I felt like I was uh, back on my own uh, once I left Tokyo. And it's gonna be nice to have uh, people who understand this whole youtube -y thing to talk to. In addition to that, I just love the country. And uh, especially for what I want to do with media work, you know, whether it's YouTube or just video production in general, there's a lot more opportunities for that out in Tokyo versus other parts of Japan. And plus, uh, 2020 coming up, the uh, Olympics and stuff out in Tokyo, there's gonna be a lot of eyeballs on Tokyo. So 
uh, it's gonna be a good opportunity for me to, to get out there, get my stuff out there, and uh, show a lot more people what Tokyo and you know Japan in general is all about. Some of you might be wondering, like, aside from you know the school, like, why I would decide to choose Tokyo apart from other parts of Japan? Because there are other schools out in Japan that uh, I could have gone to. And those would have been nice to go to, would have been interesting, but really, uh, it's like I mentioned earlier, just the networking opportunities and just, you know, kind of an all-in-one type location that Tokyo is makes it an ideal spot for where I want to be at this time. You know, in about a year or two's time, will that change? I don't know. You know, I was thinking about, you know, once I'm done with school, just moving out to the Kanagawa area, because that's my favorite prefecture of all time. So I was thinking about moving out there, maybe like a little suburb or a commuter town uh, near Yokohama. So I can still, you know, get my big city on, go into Yokohama, and I'm still fairly close by to Tokyo, so if one of my friends wants to do something or I want to do something, it's not that far away, and it's definitely a manageable trip out there. And so question of the day, if you want to study abroad in a foreign country, whether it's Japan or elsewhere, why do you want to study abroad there? Let me know in the comments down below, the boopity boops. And with that said, this is Danny san signing for now, and as always, We'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japandy. In today's episode, guys, I'm gonna be talking to you about what I'll be missing from my life here in America once I move back to Tokyo, Japan at the end of the year, 2019. Woo. So, as always, let's just jump right into it. And typically, when you talk to a lot of expats about things they miss from their home country, they talk about the four F's, and we're gonna be going over those today. The first F is family. Um, I currently live with my brother and his wife. I'm definitely gonna be missing them when I move back to Japan. And also my family back in Ohio and Michigan, we've been missing them a lot as well. But thanks to uh, technology that's come up in the past decade or so, uh, it's pretty easy to keep in touch. So when I was out in Japan the first time around, I was actually in contact with my family a lot more than I am now, if I'm gonna be honest here. So I would always call my mom every Sunday that I could just to talk with her, let her know how my week was, see what was going on with her, stuff like that. So it's definitely something I'm gonna be doing more of once I get myself back out to Japan. So, hi mom. <laughs> you know, it's stuff like Skype and Facebook Messenger and FaceTime and all this other stuff definitely brings us a lot closer together, no matter where we are in the world. Despite that, there ain't nothing like the real thing, so definitely gonna be missing my family in real life. And then the second F we're gonna be talking about is friends. So I'm gonna be 34 next month, and as I've gotten older, uh, my friend circle has widened, or spread out, rather. Um, I don't really have as many close friends as I used to, and the ones that I am close with they're a lot farther away from me than they were before. Just like with family, I'm still able to keep in contact with them thanks to technology and stuff like that. So even though they're much further away from me physically, they're still around and I can still keep in touch with them and see what they're up to in their lives, their wives and kids and jobs and houses and all that kind of stableness that comes with being in your 30s. And then the third F, I'm gonna miss is a food. So as you know, America is plentiful with different types of food. And even though in Japan, there are uh, no slouches when it comes to food, uh, as far as the variety of different foods, uh, your mileage may vary depending on where in Japan you are. Now being in Tokyo, it's a very cosmopolitan city. So there's foods from all different sections of the world. So there's gonna be no shortage of food there. But as far as region exclusive stuff and just kind of stuff that I grew up with, which we'll get to later. There's not really a lot of places where I can uh, get my fix as far as that goes. And also just the uh, convenience of food as well. You know, like since most places here in America have an oven, like a proper oven, it's hard to get like a frozen pizza, throw it in, wait 20 minutes and bam, it's like delivery basically. But you don't have to pay like 40 bucks for a basic medium pizza, <laughs> just saying. And also a lot of foods that are considered domestic here are considered foreign over there, so you'll be paying for that uh, foreignness, basically. So just uh, just keep that in mind. 
then the fourth and final F we're gonna be talking about here in this video is familiarity. So I touched upon that in the previous F. Yeah, it's really hard to get that familiarity in Japan versus here in America, where you can just kind of walk around and it's like you don't have to worry about translating stuff in your head. And, you know, if you speak English, you can just kind of go about your business and just be an ordinary person. You know, one of the things that I noticed the most about living in Japan was just my Americanness, I guess, and just the fact that I am an American. It's not really something I think about being in America where I just feel like I'm just an ordinary dude. When you uh, live abroad, you definitely are more aware of your nationality than you were when you were in your home country. And uh, that can be good and bad. You know, you feel like you're kind of a good ambassador. That's what I always try to portray myself as and put myself out there as, you know. And it's something that, you know, when I was out there the first time being in the Navy, that's something they always tell us, you know, always be a good ambassador to America and to the military and stuff like that. And that's something I feel like I really succeeded at uh, when I was over there last time and something I want to continue doing. But that being said, can't beat the, uh, the familiarity of living in America, even if it's in a different state. Since coming back to America, I've lived in three different states. I've lived in Ohio, lived in Michigan, and now I live here in North Carolina until I moved back to Japan. Even with all those changes in scenery, there's still the overall familiarity of America. And there's a lot of little differences here and there, but uh, as far as the general rules of the road, it's about the same, really. So yeah, those are gonna be the four things I miss about living in America while I'm gonna be out living in Tokyo, Japan. So question of the day, if you've lived abroad or are currently living abroad, what are some things that you miss about your home country? Let me know in the comments down below in the boopity boops. And with that said, guys, this is the Andy San. Sign it for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. And welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japandy. Today's episode, guys, is going to be a follow up to my previous episode. I'm going to be talking to you about things that I won't miss about living here in America once I move back to Tokyo, Japan, at the end of the year, 2019. Woo. So, that said, let's get right into it. And the first thing that I won't miss about living here in America is the rude individualist behavior that I see a lot of here. Your mileage may vary depending on where in America you live. If you live in a small town versus a big city in one state over another, uh, there's a lot of variance as far as that goes. Uh, yeah, I definitely won't miss the kind of rude upfront and directness, kind of the bluntness that comes with living here in America. It's definitely something that I can't really explain properly. It's one of those things you kind of have to experience, you know, living abroad. And it's one of those things that I noticed when I came back to the States. And it's just kind of like, was everybody like this before? I don't, I don't remember. <laughs> but uh, it's definitely something that I won't miss uh, living out in Japan. And so the second thing that I won't miss about living here in America is having to drive to get pretty much anywhere here in the States. Don't get me wrong, I do love driving. You know, nothing like rolling the window down on a nice, cool, crisp day, and just kind of cruising around, just doing whatever. But as far as having to drive to get anywhere, even just like the grocery store, it's definitely a big pain in the ass. And it's, again, another expense I have to worry about, you know, car insurance, gas, uh, car maintenance specifically, especially, you know, if I have to drive to get to my job, which, you know, is another reason why I like doing freelance work because I can just sit here and as so long as I can get from my bed over there to my ass here in my seat, I'm good. <laughs> so I don't have to worry about missing work as far as that goes. But if I was working a more conventional job where I had to drive to work, I'd have to worry about you know, if my car's gonna make it, or if I get in an accident, or I gotta worry about traffic, and all this other shit. So I don't really have to worry about that, at least in a big city in Japan, because I can just take the trains, or I can ride my bike, or I can get like a motorcycle. You know, the traffic laws are a lot more lenient on motorcycles versus cars. You can kind of, you know, pass by cars if they're like in a stop area or whatever. And so the third thing that I won't miss about living in America is the quite frankly, inadequate healthcare. Keep in mind, I am a US veteran, so I do have access to VA healthcare and stuff like that. So I'm kind of sort of taken care of a little bit, but at the same time, if something like really severe happens to me, 
I'm really worried that I won't be able to afford the expenses. And it's something, especially getting into my 30s, that I worry about, you know, when I was back in my 20s, eh, I don't really care. You know, if I get a cough or something like that, I'll just, you know, walk it off for the day and then be fine the next day. But as I get older, it's definitely something I have to uh, take note of. And so the fourth and final thing that I won't miss about living in America when I move out to Japan is overall safety. Not gonna lie, if you guys have read the news about America in the past decade, decade plus, you know that there's a lot of crime and stuff that goes on here. A lot of shootings, school shootings, a lot of gun related stuff, and also a lot of traffic accidents. And as I mentioned before with healthcare, you know, there's a lot of things that could go wrong in the, uh, in the old body that I had to be careful of. Yeah, just overall safety living out in Japan. The crime rate is a lot lower than it is in America. Crime does happen. It's not some kind of weird utopian society where no crime happens, but it's significantly lower. And especially as it comes to firearms, virtually non-existent. And so question of the day, if you've lived abroad, what are some things that you don't miss about living in your home country versus where you are now or where you were then? Leave them below in the comments, down below in the boopy boops. And with that said guys, this is the Andy San, signing for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later guys, bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japandi. Today's episode, guys, I just want to give you a little update. What's going on with my return to Japan at the end of the year, which is next month. <laughs> so we're uh, closing in on that. But uh, before we begin, I just want to mention that today's Thanksgiving here in Mercogen land. So I hope you and yours are having a, have a happy Thanksgiving wherever you are. And uh, I'm just laying here on my bed, just stretching my back out because uh, sitting at my chair a little too long working on stuff. So just in case you guys are wondering, <laughs> just want to let y'all know. But in any event, uh, as far as that update goes, uh, let's just jump right into it, right? So I have some really good news as far as that goes, actually. So a couple days ago, I got an email from my school saying that my COE, which is my certificate of eligibility, which is like the main part of the visa, has been approved. So the main part of getting the visa is done Good to go as far as that goes but the next step is waiting for the official paperwork to come to me here in north carolina via the snail mail so once that comes in i gotta fill out a couple forms because i guess there's like new visa forms and stuff to fill out which you know japan gotta get used to the paperwork right so i gotta fill out them forms and send it to the nearest japanese consulate here in america and since i'm here in north carolina that consulate is in Atlanta, Georgia. Now, thankfully, since I'm over 100 miles away from the consulate, I can just um, send it to them in snail mail. So I don't have to worry about flying out to Atlanta or driving out there and just sitting in a hotel room waiting for a couple days for them to process everything. I can just send it out in the mail and uh, wait for them to send it back to me. And then once that's been sent back to me, approved, all that stuff, then finally, <laughs> after all this time, I'm free to go to Japan. So pretty much once I'm done with school for this semester here in North Carolina, I'm gonna be making plans to uh, get to Japan as soon as I can. Hey, that rhymed. <laughs> so I don't have a definitive flyout date at the time it's recording. Uh, once I do, I'll be sure to post it because that's like the main question everybody's asking me. Hey, Andy Salon, you know, when, when are you flying out? When are you flying out? When's your flyout date? When do you arrive in Japan? What's going on? So I just want to let y'all know, I don't have a flyout date as of yet, but when it does come out, I uh, will be sure to let y'all know. But uh, yeah, man, just this journey back to Japan has been tremendous. <laughs> I know I keep saying that I should get a shirt, hashtag tremendous, but uh, it's been long, it's been arduous, but uh, we're closing in the tail end of the journey to Japan and the beginning of starting the Andy Japandi series again proper. It's just been great, man. And uh, if anything, since, you know, in the spirit of Thanksgiving, I definitely have a lot to be grateful for and thankful for, I should say. And uh, I gotta be thankful for the opportunity to be able to come back to uh, Tokyo once again, because, you know, were it not for 
putting in the work earlier when I was in the Navy and stuff, I wouldn't have this opportunity. You know, like a lot of people, you know, especially when, when I got out of the Navy the way I did, um, a lot of people were like, did you regret joining the Navy or whatever? And I'm like, nah, man, you know, good experience. Got to see the world, got to live in Japan. <laughs> and now thanks to the Navy, I get to live in Japan once again, this time as a student. So I don't have any restrictions or anything like that set upon me, at least by the military anyway. I still got to be a halfway decent person, obey the local laws and all that stuff. So I can't be a complete hooligan, but uh, yeah, as long as I keep it within the limits of the law, I should be in Gucci bag. So yeah, guys, that's pretty much my little update video on my return to Japan. As things progress, I'll be sure to let y'all know. But for now, with that said, this is the Andy San signing off for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japandy. In today's episode, guys, I'm going to be doing a video response to Mr. Dave Trippin, who recently put out a video saying that simply wanting to come to Japan is not enough. While I do agree with what most of what Dave said, I felt he could have elaborated on some other points in being able to make it out in Japan. So today we're going to be talking about the three things, the three P's, as it were. We're going to be talking about passion, persistence, and planning. So the first P, passion, the want, the desire, the passion, as it were, to come out to Japan, I think is the most important of these elements. But you definitely need the other two in order to make it long term. But the passion is where it all starts. In this case, move out to Japan. So whether that's through stuff like anime, manga, the different landmarks and stuff in Japan, simply wanting to experience a culture vastly different from your own, whatever your reason may be, and I'm not judging you on either of those reasons because I have my own reasons for wanting to come to Japan. So who am I to judge, right? But you definitely have to have that passion to want to come to Japan for whatever reason. Second thing, is persistence. And I think that this is a very crucial element because simply wanting to go to Japan, as Dave pointed out, isn't enough. You gotta have a little more meat to the bone. And persistence definitely is that meat. Since I announced that I was accepted into Lakeland University of Japan a couple months back, I've been getting a lot of messages, emails and things like that saying, oh, congrats Andy on making it out to Japan. You know, they finally did it, man. After four years of trying out in America, you finally are able to come back to Japan. Some comments are like, well, you know, it's, it's not gonna happen for me because of X, Y, Z reason. And I feel really bad for those guys because they all have their own uh, situation. But persistence, is what carried me through a lot of hard times. I was always passionate about wanting to come out to Japan ever since I was a little kid and my cousins were out in Yokosuka, as I've said in many of my countless Japan related videos, but it was the persistence that allowed me to move forward and to carry through with being able to get out to Japan because there was a lot of moments, as you guys know, that I didn't think I was gonna make it out to Japan because I didn't have the money, my GPA was too low, I only had so much left in the GI Bill, X, Y, Z, whatever reason for me not being able to make it out to Japan. But it was my passion for wanting to make it happen. It was my persistence in finding different ways to make it happen and then following through in order to make it happen with the third and final P, which is planning. And that's the one that Dave covered the most in his video, but planning is definitely very crucial because you could be passionate and persistent all you want, but if you don't have something for which to forward all that passion and persistence into, then you can't make it to Japan. Like you can't even buy a plane ticket, like, <laughs> you know? So my planning was how I was able to get accepted into a university out in Tokyo, Japan, because I had a ja plan. See what I did there? <laughs> so my plan was to see the uh, situation as it was. Okay, you didn't have a good run of it at school last time. Your GPA was banged to shit because of it. You 
only have so much money and you're closing in on 34 years old. 34 next week, by the way. <laughs> on a day that will live in infamy. But that being said, I assessed the situation and realized what I needed to do in order to make Japan happen. I was passionate about making it happen, never lost the passion. I was persistent in following through with making Japan happen, and I had a plan in making it happen. And that plan was to build my GPA back up. Once my GPA was built back up, then apply to a university out in Japan that I could use my GI Bill with. And then once accepted, save up enough money for me to afford the plane ticket and the nest egg and all these different uh, other resources like camera, for instance, uh, my laptop over there and stuff like that. So once I land in Japan, I can make some muns, whether it's making videos or making videos for somebody else. So question of the day, if you're looking to come out to Japan, which of the three Ps do you need to work on the most? Let me know in the comments down below in the booby boobs. And with that said guys, this is the Andy San, signing for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later guys, bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japandy. Today's episode guys, I'm gonna be giving you the state of the Andy Japandy channel moving forward in 2020. Now, I was originally going to do this on my personal channel, The Andy Sun, but I figured since pretty much the majority, if not all, of the updates involved this channel, I decided to just post it here instead. It could have come at a better time because today, December 7th, 2019, woo, is my 34th birthday. So I'm out here at Walmart, where else? <laughs> and uh, I got myself some uh, little birthday presents. Nothing too special, but. Uh, Pretty cool. So let's try them on, shall we? Got myself some new glasses. I really love these ones. They have a nice little metal frame and they snap pretty uh, snugly over uh, my regular glasses so I can still drive and see even when it's all nice and bright out. But wait, there's more. I even got some ones with the chunky frames. So I couldn't decide between the two. So I decided to just get both and I had a little bit of birthday money. so. Why not, right? So, yeah, let's get the uh, the blue ones back on, though, shall we? Yeah, that's better. I do like the chunky frame ones, though. But uh, yeah, decided to get a couple sunglasses because, as much as I love my uh, my chunky white frame ones, as you can tell from some of the videos, uh, they got scratch marks and stuff on them, and they're just cheap glasses. So you know the hinges and stuff are a little loose, and I've been tightening them, and you know it's. Whatever, <laughs> they've served their purpose. So I decided to get uh, some more sunglasses instead. So yeah, um, so yeah, like I said, today is my birthday, the old three, four today. And so on my birthday, I've decided to announce that in 2020, moving forward, once I move back to Tokyo, in a few weeks now, actually, <laughs> uh, that date is fast approaching. Um, I've decided to take the Gary V challenge now, what is the Gary V challenge? Well, uh, for those who don't know, Gary V, Gary Vaynerchuk, is uh, somebody I've been following for over a decade at this point. I've been following him since his Wine Library TV days, so around 2007, 2008-ish. It wasn't until a few years ago that I decided to actually put his advice into practice as it relates to uh, what I do here on YouTube and elsewhere. So I've decided that once I move back to uh, Tokyo, Japan, in a few weeks, like I said, I'm gonna be taking the Gary V challenge and that is putting out content at scale. Now, the big disclaimer here is that I'm going out to Tokyo to study abroad, be going to school, going to college. I might not be able to put out 100 pieces of content a day, which is what Gary ideally wants people to do. But that being said, I am going to take the practices that he listed in his like super awesome uh, promo deck and outlined his whole content creation process and everything. I am going to be taking those in the deck and making more content, especially since I'm out in Japan. I don't really have any excuses to just stay inside my apartment or my house or wherever uh, like I did here in America for the past four years. I think uh, my time of solitude, isolation, confinement, whatever you want to call it, is done. 
and it's time for me to uh, get my hustle boots on and uh, get to work. So we've been producing a lot of content, not just for YouTube, also for TikTok. Those are going to be the main two platforms I make content for, but I'm also going to be pushing more stuff out on Instagram, both in Instagram stories, as well as more pictures, because I'll actually be making more pictures of Japan rather than just uploading throwbacks from like five, six years ago <laughs> at this point. So I'll be posting a lot more current pictures of Japan on there. Um, as far as Twitter goes, that's just kind of my funsies sort of place to go. And, uh, you know, if I was just counting Twitter content alone, I could probably reach 100 pieces of content a day easily. Because uh, what can I say? I like a lot of stuff on Twitter. So it's pretty easy to get those uh, 100 pieces of content <laughs> doing all the retweets and all those kinds of stuff. But in any event, I am going to get a lot more serious about my content creation once I move out to Japan. I know I've been talking a big game pretty much ever since I left the country. But uh, seeing Gary put out this new deck and putting out the Gary V Challenge is uh, really lighting a fire under my ass. And I want to show people just what you can do out in Japan. And I'm most excited to show people on TikTok more of Japan because I think that that's a very wide open field. It's a, a blue ocean, as it were, in business terms, as far as uh, opportunities for presenting content out there. Because, you know, I felt like with YouTube, it's oversaturated at this point, but it's, uh, it's my main content home. It's been my home since 2006. So, you know, I don't feel like leaving it anytime soon, but I do want to branch out to other platforms and see what's going on from there. And I'm most excited about branching off more into TikTok. Um, I've been spending the past month and a half going on two months, just, you know, learning the platform, kind of putting out some low effort content, you know, just kind of bits and pieces of the day in my life, different anime I'm watching, stuff like that. And that's mostly just to experiment, see what's good, what's not, and just to mostly just learn the platform. So once I get out to Japan, I'm going to be putting out a lot more like Japan centric content. So showing off different parts of Tokyo and stuff like that and doing cool little B-roll montages and whatnot and, you know, doing stuff like that. So, yeah, I just have a whole slew of different ideas as far as content production and side hustles and all that kind of stuff. And I definitely want to get more into those um, once I get out to Japan and start, you know, putting boots on the ground and actually doing them. Because I don't want to just sit here and talk about all the side hustles and stuff I want to do in Japan without actually having done them in Japan. As I'll probably learn a lot more uh, in, the, in the process of doing versus just telling you guys. But point being, you can expect a whole slew of quality Japan content moving forward from the Andy San Samadeshta. And uh, just a little disclaimer, I probably should have put this at the beginning, but uh, I know I'm going to get a lot of comments in this video or maybe some messages or something like that saying, well, Andy, since you're going over on a student visa, shouldn't you focus primarily on school and getting that out of the way? And you're right, 100% right. So before I do any of this other content creation stuff, I'm going to make sure homework and all that kind of stuff is squared away. But once homework is done and all that kinds of stuff, the rest of that time is content creation time, dude. So, you know, if it takes me two to three hours at most to get my homework done, that's plenty of time to get out there and make stuff or put together stuff or get in touch with some people, see if they want to do some collabs or see if they need something put together themselves, you know, because in addition to being a YouTuber, TikToker, content creator, whatever buzzword that, you know, you want to apply to me, um, I'm also a video editor too. And that's uh, my main trade, my main, uh, my main hustle, as it were. So I definitely want to do more of that and uh, collab with a lot of people out there. A lot of my friends definitely want to get out there and uh, do my thing with. So anyway, guys, this car is getting all kinds of stuffed up. You can see like the fog for me talking <laughs> in here. So it's getting pretty hot and steamy in here from all this uh, content creation. So uh, going to head out here, enjoy myself on my 34th birthday. Ultimately, guys, I'm just so fucking happy that I get this chance to live in Japan again, but on my terms. 
and nobody else's. And uh, I just I just really want to make this time count, you know, because I felt like when I was in Yokosuka, you know, I felt like uh, I, I couldn't really do a lot of what I wanted to do as far as making videos. Um, looking back, and especially considering the work schedule I had at the time, I was, you know, surprised I even got anything out at all. Now that I don't have to worry about those 12 to 15 hour work days in the Navy and alcohol cur curtailment restrictions, liberty restrictions, whatever else, or getting underway at a moment's notice, um, I can focus much, much more on making that quality Japan content. So, with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sun. Sign up for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. And welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japan. -y. In today's episode, guys, I'm going to be sharing with you five habits I developed living in Japan. Now, just a little disclaimer before we get too into it. A lot of these habits I already had before coming out to Japan, but since I came to Japan, I developed the habits, as it were, and just kind of refined a lot of these. So with that said, here we go. And the first habit I developed while living in Japan is not wearing shoes indoors. Now, this is kind of a typical American habit is uh, wearing their shoes indoors. Even while I was living in America and even now, whenever I get home or get to a friend's house, if I'm staying there for a long period of time, I look for the first opportunity to just get rid of my shoes, whether that's putting them in the little closet by the door or in my case, going to my room and just taking my shoes off. Uh, I look for the first opportunity to do so. And uh, obviously in Japan, they have a little Genkan area, which is like the foyer. And that's the first opportunity to get rid of your shoes before you enter the apartment, house, wherever. They also have it for a lot of like fancy Japanese restaurants as well. So that's kind of ingrained within their culture. And it's not just a cultural thing too. It's also a cleanliness issue. That's the main thing, especially being a single dude. When I was in the Navy, I was hella busy working 12, 15 hour day, really didn't have time to clean. And if you've seen some of my apartment tour videos, you really know I didn't have time to clean. If I just made it easy on myself and not tracked in more dirt, made my life way easier. And uh, when I came back to America, kept the habit going. And I remember uh, that first apartment when I was living up in uh, Kalamazoo, Michigan, I had suffered some water damage in my bedroom. And uh, the apartment manager came over to assess the damage and he was looking at my living room carpet and he said, wow, this is actually like really clean. Like most people who uh, are in the apartments, the carpet's like all kinds of dirty and stuff from tracking dirt in and all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, ah, just take my shoes off at the door and that definitely helps. So it is definitely noticeable. And so the second habit I developed while I was living in Japan is walking more. Now, I started really going on long walks when I was out in college, out at Urbana University in Urbana, Ohio way back in the day. And I started because my friend Dan would go on walks, um, just kind of out and about either in town or walk the old country roads just to kind of help clear the old uh, head brain, as it were. So I ended up joining him on a couple walks. We'd have some nice deep conversations about philosophical things or just simply enjoying each other's company and just kind of chilling in the environment. Love doing that. And then once I uh, came back to my hometown, Salina, Ohio, um, I started riding my bike a lot more and just exploring my town without having to need a car to do so. And before I got out to Japan, I was stationed out in San Diego and uh, that's pretty much how I got around was, you know, my own two feet and, you know, taking the buses and uh, the train to go to downtown San Diego. But most of the time I was just hoofing it, man, you know, just walking around on my own two feet. And once I got out to Japan and got my own apartment, I bought myself a bicycle, was able to bike back and forth to work, so I didn't have to pay uh, train ticket money for that. Ended up recouping the uh, cost of the bike in less than a month, actually. And it helped uh, keep the old stomach in check for the most part. Actually, since I've been doing daily walks for the past couple months, I've managed to lose about 25, going on 30 pounds, just doing that. And so the third habit that I developed while living in Japan was drinking unsweetened tea and unsweetened coffee, black coffee. Before I came out to Japan, I tried some unsweetened green tea, some Oi Ocha, which is the most popular brand of bottled green tea out in Japan. 
I uh, managed to get a bottle from uh, one of the Japanese import shops out in San Diego, the whole slew of them. And I made some videos of my time out there. The area is called uh, Kearney Mesa, by the way. So I've made like a whole series of videos of my time out there. Definitely check those out. Uh, but anyway, I got a little bottle of unsweetened green tea out there. I tried it and it was just so bitter and it was such a chore to get through. I was just like, ugh, ugh, so bad. <laughs> I could barely handle it. But I managed to finish the bottle and I was just like, Jesus, ugh, so bad. By the time I got it to Japan, I tried a different bottled uh, green tea. Yeah, it was much more palatable to me. <laughs> that rhymed. One of my favorite uh, bottled green tea flavors is Ayataka. Quickly became one of my favorite flavors one day when uh, one of my shipmates came up to me while I was buying it out of the vending machine. She was like, oh, you're getting turtle tea? I'm like, turtle tea? What are you talking about? She's like, yeah. So she pointed to uh, the little pot on the bottle there and she said, yeah, it looks like a, a long neck turtle. You know, here's the neck, there's the body and there's the little tail sticking out. And I was like, Oh my God, that's fucking adorable. I'm gonna call this turtle tea from now on. And I did. So whenever I get a bottle of Ayataka tea, I always call it turtle tea. Yeah. <laughs> and so the fourth habit I developed while I was living out in Japan is bowing. Now I'm from Midwest, as you guys know, from small town in, in Ohio. We have nods and you know, you also see this in Japan too. It's you know typically called like the gaijin nod. So just kind of acknowledging one's existence. So we basically did the same thing out in Ohio. Like if you knew somebody from your hometown, whether or not you knew them very well, but you just kind of seen them around town, you know, just a little, you know, hey, you know, just a slight little nod. And I, I even do it in my videos too. You know, I do the coming up. <laughs> so it's just that little slight nod. So going from to wasn't that bad of a transition. You know, it was a little less tilt and, you know, just more forward head motion. Also, I'm 5'9", uh, 5'10", five five on a full moon with a fully stretched back. So there's some places where the ceiling's a little low and most of the time it can get by, but sometimes it's a little bit lower than usual. So sometimes you kind of have to bow your head to uh, just get through. But, uh, you know, if you're six foot and up, yeah, you're gonna be bowing a lot whether or not you want to or not. So, <laughs> hope you get used to it. And the fifth and final habit I developed while living out in Japan is taking baths and showers at night before bed. I started doing this actually when I was a little kid. Uh, my mom would make us all take a bath uh, before bed just cause it was easier. And in the mornings she had to like get ready for work and there was like no time, you know, you had to like get your stuff and get to the bus as quickly as possible. So for convenience sake, it just made more sense to uh, take baths at night and ended up carrying those habits over into my adult life. And it's actually a nice relaxing end to uh, a long work day for me, as it were. You know, even when I was uh, living out in Japan, and especially with those deep Japanese tubs, I started developing habits of just bathing at night. Every two or three days or so, I would get a bag of Epsom salts um, I could get them on base and stuff like that. And you can get them out in Japan too, although it's uh, different brands and stuff. Get a bag of Epsom salts, uh, put like a cup or so into the bath and uh, just soak. And uh, it's so good for the skin, so good for the body to just relax after a long work week. Just relax the muscles and just the tension just eases from you. And it's also really good for the skin too. So for those who don't know, I do have very uh, sensitive skin, so I have to be very uh, cognizant of what uh, shampoos, detergents, stuff like that I use, because otherwise I start breaking out and it's uh, it's not a pleasant sight. But uh, I do take care of myself, you know, for those who don't know, I'm 34 years old. I think I'm uh, doing pretty all right as, uh, as far as taking care of my skin goes. But uh, yeah, taking a nice hot soak in a deep Japanese tub, and then afterwards having a nice cold can of chew high. Uh, can't beat it, man. It's the best. So yeah, those are the five habits I developed while I was living out in Japan. And so question of the day, if you've lived abroad, whether it was in Japan or elsewhere, what are some habits that you developed from living in that country? Let me know in the comments down below in the boobity boops. And with that said, guys, this is the Andy San signing for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japandy. In today's episode, guys, I'm gonna be sharing with you 
10 steps on getting your student visa in Japan. Now, just a little disclaimer to begin, I am an American student, I'm also a US veteran, and I'm applying to Lakeland University, Japan. So depending on your situation, your mileage may vary, but I'm just gonna outline the 10 steps on how I got my student visa in Japan. So just keep that in mind. So anyway, let's begin. So step one, apply to a school out in Japan. Seems like the obvious first step, right? In my case, since I applied out to Lakeland University of Japan, there was a couple things that I needed, and as a veteran, also needed. So for my case, I needed my joint service transcript, my JST, which basically outlines all the stuff that I did when I was in the Navy. And I uh, also needed my GI Bill, COE, Certificate of Eligibility, which shows like how much time I have left on my GI Bill and stuff like that, as well as percentage of eligibility. Next thing I needed was my statement of purpose. Now, for those who don't know what that is, it's basically just an essay outlining kind of why you want to go to the school, why you want to enter into the field that you want to, and just basically allowing the school to kind of get to know you a little bit better. Then the next thing I needed was a letter of recommendation. So letter of recommendation, you can get those from either, you know, old teachers, professors, an employer, something like that. In my case, since I was in the Navy, I got one from my old LPO, which is like a, a manager in uh, civilian ease. The next thing I needed was a photocopy of my passport. And then after that, I also needed uh, official high, ch high school transcripts as well as official college transcripts. Now again, if you haven't gone to college before, you won't need the college transcripts and you'll probably need like a SAT, a ACT score or something like that. But because I'm old as heck, <laughs> I didn't need that. And after the school has received the items, they will set up a 15 to 45 minute interview. Now, I had never done interviews for a college before, so this is all pretty new to me. So basically what it is, is just a sit down interview that you have with the dean and maybe uh, some department heads and potential teachers and things like that. And it just gives them a chance to kind of get to know you. They go over your statement of purpose and your academic history and things like that. And just again, kind of get to know you and they'll ask you like job interview type questions, you know, talking about yourself, your successes, failures, what you did to overcome those failures, what you did to get the successes. You know, just stuff like that. And the interview can last between 15 to 45 minutes. So if you're not in Japan, like I was, and am currently, time is recording, uh, they'll conduct this interview over Skype. But if you happen to be in the country, then uh, all the better. And they'll set you up with an in-person interview. Now, dress code wise, uh, be sure to dress business casual. You don't want to go like full suit and stuff, but you know, just a nice button down shirt, slacks, Stuff like that. So just uh, look the part. And uh, also if you're doing this from Skype, make sure your room is tidy, your bed is made, and there's not all kinds of stuff on the walls, <laughs> things like that as well. And also make sure that there won't be any distractions. So in my case, since I live on the East Coast of America, when they conducted the interview, it was two o'clock in the morning my time. So like everybody has already gone to bed but depending on where you are in the world and when they decide to conduct the interview, or if you have like night owl roommates or whatever, just you know, make sure that they're squared away before the interview begins. Now step two, once you've been accepted, apply for a visa immediately. Now applying ASAP will give you plenty of time to submit corrections if needed, and we'll speed up the process overall. So once I got accepted, I sent in all my paperwork and all that kind of stuff for the visa right away. And many schools will allow you to apply for the visa on their own website, which in my case, since I was applying to Lakeland University of Japan, I went through their website for applying to the visa. And they basically act as a liaison between me and the Tokyo Immigration Bureau. So I just submit all the stuff that they need on their end, and then they'll submit it to Tokyo Immigration and they'll take care of the rest, basically. Now, the school might have you submit some other items, like photographs for the visa. I actually uh, took my visa photographs with this camera, the uh, Panasonic G85, in case you guys are wondering. And I took the picture against that wall right there, took a blank wall, took a picture, and uh, just submitted it. And they're fine with it. So just make sure, you know, obviously it's not like uh, licenses, so you can't really smile. So you just have to have a 
flat, motionless face. Now you also have to submit payment for the visa application and the school application fees. So at the time of this recording, the school application fee for Lakeland University of Japan is about 35,000 yen, which translates to about $320 American. And the visa application fee is 20,000 yen, or about 185 USD. I actually rounded up in this case because I'd rather you guys expect to pay more and not have to, and plus changing exchange rates and stuff like that. So if you're watching this in the future, greetings, and be sure to check the exchange rates as well as fees and stuff like that for the time that you're applying to this. And then step three, after you apply for the visa, be sure to confirm with your school that your application went through and get an application number if need be. In my case, uh, since I applied to Lakeland, uh, once I submitted my visa application online, it didn't really give me a confirmation email or a number or something like that. So I had to uh, send out an email to my student liaison and he got me the number. So just for that little bit of security, knowing that your application went through and you're not just sitting there waiting for something that didn't get sent out. So definitely do that for sure. And then step BOA. And this is the hardest step of them all. Wait for the Immigration Bureau to process your visa, which can take around six to eight weeks. Now, as I always say, waiting is the hardest part. And the Tokyo Immigration Bureau is notoriously difficult to get a hold of. You can technically contact them if you are able to dial outside of America and get a hold of them on their Japanese number. But if you do that, you have to speak Japanese, know how to navigate through that. And chances are that you're probably not gonna get a straight answer anyway. So yeah, you just gotta wait for it. Like I said, waiting's the hardest part. And step five. Your school might contact you ahead of time once your visa comes back approved and you'll get your COE, your certificate of eligibility, in the mail. Step six. Once you get your COE, your certificate of eligibility, you need to apply to your respective Japanese consulate by submitting your passport, your certificate of eligibility, along with a photocopy, the visa application form, and a two inch by two inch square photo of you glued to that application form. Depending on where you are from your nearest Japanese consulate in America, you can just go in and hand it to them in person. But if you're more than 100 miles away from your respective consulate, which for me, since I live out in North Carolina, the Japanese consulate I had to go through is in Atlanta, Georgia. And that's definitely more than 100 miles away. So since I live so far away, I was able to submit all my stuff in the mail. If you decide to submit your stuff by mail, you have to submit all the paperwork as well as a self-addressed stamped envelope for like priority mail, express, stuff like that. Basically something to where you can get a tracking number just to be on the safe side. As well as a release of liability form, which you can print out on their website. Releasing the consulate from any types of liability if your paperwork gets lost in the mail. So just keep that in mind. They're not responsible if you lose your passport and all that kind of stuff in the mail. So it's a risk, but if you don't want to drive out there, whatever, the risk you have to be willing to take. Now this application process thankfully is a lot shorter than getting your COE and it can take about two weeks altogether between mailing the stuff out, getting it back, as well as the overall processing once it's been received by the Japanese consulate. And if there are any errors in the application, the consulate will contact you for corrections so you don't have to remail everything again. In my case, I forgot to put the arrival date on the application form, so they called me up and asked me when I planned to arrive, gave them a date, and they processed everything from there. And step seven, dance a jig once you get your visa in the mail, because I sure as hell did. And step eight, after you received your visa, then apply for plane tickets and housing. Now, if you live in a Western country, typically what they do is they apply for all that stuff ahead of time before they get their visa. But because I'm such a worry wart and want to make absolutely positively sure everything is going according to plan, I waited until all my visa paperwork came back before I applied for plane tickets and housing. But if you're able to get plane tickets early, chances are they're not going to cost as much and you'll have more seating availability and stuff like that. So. If you're willing to rebook your flight in the small chance that uh, something does happen with your visa, go for it. But if you're not willing to take that risk like me, <laughs> then you'll just have to wait. And so step nine, once you arrive in Japan, you'll have to fill out a landing card form. Now this form basically just outlines a, why are you here in Japan type thing? And you just fill out like student, 
and stuff like that. Now, you can also fill out a form called permission to engage in activity other than that permitted by the status of residence previously granted. That's a mouthful. Also known as a work permit or an autobito form, for short. <laughs> if you want to work part-time jobs in Japan, which I personally very highly recommend you do that at the airport because they'll be able to just approve it from there. But if you decide to do it later, you'll have to wait for everything to process and it's just uh, more paperwork, longer process. So just get it done at the airport, even if you don't plan on taking a part-time job because you never know. And from there, you'll be able to get your Japanese ID card, AKA your Gaijin card, which you need to always have on you in case you get stopped by the police. And then step 10, the perfect 10. And the most important step of all is enjoy Japan. It took you this long to get there. So when you're there, enjoy it. So yeah, those are my 10 steps on how to get a student visa in Japan. If you have any questions about this process, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the boopy boops and I'll do my best to answer those questions. But keep in mind, I'm not an immigration lawyer and I don't even play one on the internet. So chances are I probably won't know the answers for a lot of specific questions, but I'll do my best to answer and at least direct you to someone who does. So anyway, guys, with that said, this is the Andy San signing for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey guys, Andy here and today, on this raw edition of Andy Talks Japandy, I'm gonna be answering the question for you, what makes a good Japan video? So I decided to do this one raw because um, I'm gonna be very busy this week moving myself out to Japan. Here is the status update of that so far. I got my sea bag pretty much full of my clothes. And I still have plenty of room left over for my other things. And then all that huge pile of clothes right there, I'm gonna donate. And I still gotta go through that bin right there. Not much left in it. And then that bin right there, I'm gonna donate pretty much all that. So not a whole lot left, but still gotta get it done. And I'm gonna be super busy these next few days getting all that stuff sorted. So someone's gonna have a very good Christmas this year. So regardless, but uh, yeah. So basically, I'm just not going to have any time to edit any videos until I get myself out to Japan. But I definitely want to make some Andy Talks Japan episodes. So that's what we're going to be doing here. So yeah. So this video is in response to the Red Value, who I've been watching his videos for a while. And I've been corresponding with him in uh, the TQ Sam Discord as well. Uh, we've just been talking about different things like different uh, thumbnail ideas as well as the uh, the idea about what actually makes a good Japan video. So figured we'd answer that today. <laughs> but it is gonna be in raw format so apologies for the ums, the ahs, you know, you knows and all the awkward pauses and all that kind of stuff. And plus it's kind of late so I'm not gonna raise my voice because I don't you know wake people up. <laughs> so just have the deal. But in any event, um, I've been watching the Japan vlogging scene, the J-vlogging scene, pretty much since its inception back in the Halcyon days of Tokyo Kuni and the late great Roger Swan and so many others that have come and sadly gone since those days. And there's a couple that are still around. But uh, yeah, nowadays you have a whole group of uh, way different vloggers than you did back in the day. And the uh, overall styling has changed, not just for J vlogging, but just for YouTubers in general. Um, before it was just kind of seen as a novelty to make videos online and on YouTube in general. Uh, but now uh, it's very commonplace and people even make videos, you know, for the sole purpose of making money. <clears throat> And that was definitely not a thing back in the day. A lot of people saw you as a sellout if you had ads on your video or you did sponsorships and stuff like that. And there's still little crops of them here and there. But uh, for the most part, people are pretty respectful of, uh, you know, putting ads on the videos and sponsorship plugs and all this kinds of stuff. 
And it's certainly a far cry from uh, the uh, the good old days, quote unquote. But uh, as far as uh, what makes a good Japan video goes, um, at its core, a Japan video is basically a travel video, right? So a travel video usually caters to um, a foreign audience so that they don't care, cater to the domestic audience that the, uh, the video is uh, based in. So in this case, with it being in Japan, uh, they're not exactly catering to a Japanese audience, right? Uh, there has been some crossover with some people, but for the most part, they cater towards a Western audience, uh, namely Americans, Canadians, English people, Australians, all them peeps. So, <laughs> like I said, there has been some crossover uh, into the Japanese audience, but Let's face it, that's mostly just uh, a lot of the cute girl vloggers and uh, a lot of uh, dirty old oyaji out there just looking at the kawaii, kaikoku jin, desu yo, ne? So, yeah, they're not really there for the, the, the cool b roll shots and the dubstep editing and all that kind of stuff. So, <laughs> I'm just saying. But, uh, yeah, so, um, what I think makes a good uh, Japan video has to do with balance and balancing um, several different key components. One of them is the uh, connection that you have with your audience. Um, you know, one of the examples he gave was uh, Victor, give me a break, man, and. Uh, you know, just the fact that he puts out these laundry videos and even still he's, you know, engaging. But, uh, you know, he also puts out some edited stuff and it's still engaging. So, um, that was the example that um, Red Value gave anyway. And, uh, yeah, you know, a lot of it has to do with, you know, being an engaging person, having a connection with your audience. So you can put out raw videos like this one and hopefully people are still watching maybe i don't know we'll check the uh the audience retention but regardless um you gotta have that connection with your audience because otherwise who's gonna watch your videos right but at the same time if you just prattle on and on you know eventually they're gonna be like all right i get it i get it you know and they'll be like all right just get to the point already come on tell me the thing <laughs> so that's where the other point comes in which is editing so that's where a lot of uh, the real creative types get hung up on because they think that oh this video only did so well because the video is like highly edited and lots of cool b-roll shots and you know cool camera cuts and drone footage and time lapse and all this other stuff but uh, really that's just you know frills <laughs> it's frills on the packaging but it's not the reason people come and tune in like i doubt the reason that someone like casey neistat or abroad in japan you know got as big as they did was because oh he shoots really cool b-roll and has all these cool slidey shots and all that kind of stuff it certainly helps you know set a pace but you know, he could have done without a lot of those. But <clears throat> the point being, though, is that there is a usage for that editing, and that is to ultimately tell a story. Now, whatever that story is just depends on what the video is talking about, like, you know, going to a certain part of Japan, uh, trying a certain type of food, meeting a person, whatever the case may be. And if you can tell that story with editing and have a connection with your audience, then you'll be able to make some great Japan videos or just great videos in general. You don't even have to narrow it down to just Japan videos. So ultimately, the main two things you got to worry about is having a connection with your audience and having... I wouldn't say like good production quality, but just 
having editing that allows you to tell a story. So just being able to tell a story. There you go. <laughs> Raw, baby. But yeah, um, I could say more, but uh, I don't want to bore you guys even more than I already have. So we'll end things here, and I'll be sure to, uh, you know, discuss these things more and more in the comments as well. So if you guys have any other uh, questions or thoughts or whatever, sure to leave them in the comments down below in the booty boops. And with that said, guys, this is the Andy Son. Sign up for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. And we're just going to keep waving till the end card's over. So, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, I can't believe it's going to be a couple more days until I'm back in Tokyo making Andy Japandi again. <laughs> All right. Bye. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japandi, this raw edition of Andy Talks Japandi, I'm going to be talking to, to you about who inspired me to come out to Japan. So that said, let's get into it. And as I've told this story before, um, what who really inspired me to come out to Japan back in the early, early days were my cousins, who were a military family. They were stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan, back in the early to mid 90s. And they would send me a whole bunch of stuff uh, back home to American land in rural Ohio. And uh, that really got the ball rolling for me as far as wanting to come out to visit Japan and hang out with my cousins and see all the cool sights and all the kind of stuff that they were seeing. And from there, you know, the anime boom happened in America back in the early to mid 2000s. And then in the mid 2000s, you also had the rise of uh, blogs and vlogs on YouTube. So blog wise is not really something I talk about actually. I mostly talk about like the YouTubers and stuff, but blog wise, you know, there's three people that I can remember off the top of my head because it's been so many years. But three people were Tame Goes Wild, uh, Gakuin Man, and of course, Danny Chu. And uh, Danny especially was very inspirational to me. Um, I remember downloading like a lot of his uh, pictures and stuff because he would do photo blogs of his life out in Tokyo. Uh, he's mostly known nowadays as the guy who does the smart doll stuff, which is talking about like highly articulated doll figurines and stuff like that. It's not me personally, it's not really my jam, but uh, you know, I do appreciate the craftsmanship in it and he seems to be super passionate about it. So really stoked for him and seeing the, all the excess that that entails. But before all that, he did a photo blog of his life out in Tokyo. And uh, back in the day, 10 plus years ago, uh, you know, he had a lot of high resolution photos. So I download a lot of them, use them as wallpapers, actually as inspiration. And, you know, when I was moving stuff over to my hard drive, moving a lot of my old wallpapers and stuff over, I stumbled across a couple of those old ones and, uh, excuse me. And, you know, they were at a really small resolution, like I think 1400 by 900, something like that. So they're pretty tiny by today's standards, but back then they're pretty big. But, uh, yeah, I just download a lot of those as inspiration for uh, one to get out to Japan myself one day. And I, I think the post that really, got to me the most was this really long post of his called uh, What Inspired Me to Come to Japan. And I have it up on my bookmarks under motivation. So whenever I'm feeling a little down and feeling like, well, maybe this whole Japan thing isn't going to happen for the Andy Sands Hamadeshta, I uh, go through that long ass post of Danny's and uh, get inspired all over again, even 10 plus years later. So <clears throat> just outlines like his whole upbringing out in England and what he did, you know, to get himself out to Japan and his first visit to Japan where back then he had like a little tape recorder with him. So he'd record all kinds of ambient noise in Japan, you know, like the trains and people walking by, it should be a crossing and all kinds of stuff. And when he came back to England, he would just 
listen to it while he was studying Japanese and, you know, doing work, saving up for his next trip out to Japan. And it's just so inspiring, man. And it just mm, felt that, you know. And uh, from the blogs, I went to vlogs on YouTube. So the, uh, the two main ones that I talk about, even to this day, are Tokyo Kuni and the late, great Roger Swan. And there's obviously a lot of others out there, too. You know, you, you had Myrgonauts, Tikio Sam, Busan Kevin, and uh, many others. You know, some of them still making content today. Others, maybe not as much, and some others, not at all. But uh, as far as, like, Tokyo Kuni goes, Kevin Kuni, he is the OG, the true goat, as far as uh, J-Vlogging goes, and the real blueprint for what you see a lot of nowadays, you know, with a lot of the the now mainstream people like abroad in Japan and Sharla and, uh, you know, all these others out there. But he was the one that started a lot of that type of editing because he came from the TV world. So he basically put together, essentially, TV episodes of certain aspects of life in Tokyo. But he just cut them up really short uh, to fit with the YouTube time limit back in the day. And it was really, really engaging content. And, you know, I often go back and watch some of those old videos. And yeah, the quality you know, especially compared to what you see these days is pretty potato, if I do say so myself. Uh, and, uh, you know, a lot of what Kevin did back then was pretty novel, but now is kind of, you know, you know, pedestrian. Because, you know, back in the day, nobody really edited like that. They, they were just pretty much either dads with camcorders or basically just random dudes with webcams just talking about whatever. <laughs> that sounds familiar but regardless um really enjoyed his stuff and i still go back and watch it even to this day and i also do the same thing for the late great roger swan who um at the time of this recording would have celebrated his 33rd birthday if he was still alive a couple days ago and uh just got done watching a nice documentary that someone put together for him um commemorate that occasion and it really brought me back to uh to that time in my life because you know roger edited a lot like uh toku kuni did kevin kuni uh but the difference between him and kuni was that roger had that relatability you know that sense of connection you know just an ordinary dude you know making his way into Japan and stuff like that. And plus he was really close to my age. He was a year younger than me. So, you know, we were uh, able to relate that way. And he's from Michigan, Battle Creek. And, you know, he went to Western Michigan University out in Kalamazoo, where I eventually went many years after the fact, oddly enough. But, uh, yeah, we just always had this, uh, this connection and, I left so many comments on his videos, and he left a couple comments on mine, but sadly, a lot of those are lost to time because Google, when they did the shift back in 2012 for the comment system, a lot of those old legacy comments were lost. So sadly, you know, I don't have those old comments of Roger Swans around anymore. And it'd be nice to, uh, to see some of them, you know. Uh, but... Such is life, right? So, <clears throat> yeah, sorry I'm losing my voice here. But, uh, you know, kind of is what it is when you're doing it raw, baby. But yeah, guys, that's uh, basically I wanted to talk to you about tonight. And with that said, this is the Andy Sign. Sign for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. And as always, we're going to wave until the end card is over. So, Also, uh, question of the day. Kind of a bad time to ask it, but uh, who inspired you to uh, want to come out to Japan? Let me know in the comments down below. Booty boops. And uh, we'll see you next time. Bye. All right, and we're recording. 
Hey gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japan D. This time, in Japan D. <laughs> so yeah guys, in today's episode, I'm going to be sharing with you five ways to handle your money out here in Japan. And with that said, let's get into it. And so tip number one. Don't exchange your currency at the airport or any other exchange shop. Reason being is that they will take a portion for fees and you won't get the best exchange rates anyway. But if you absolutely have to exchange your money, do it at your final destination so you don't get dinged with extra exchange fees. For example, I was gonna exchange a little bit of USD, a little bit of American money, out when I was in London before I landed here in Tokyo. And what they were gonna do was convert it from USD to pounds and then to yen. So I would've got dinged twice for exchange fees. So if you are gonna have to exchange your money, do it at your final destination. Number two, do withdraw cash from a 7-Eleven ATM. Now, not all ATMs out here in Japan are created equal, and many won't be able to read your cards, but the ATMs at 7-Elevens have worked for me every time. And tip number three, do go through a credit union if possible. So the main reason is that credit unions offer ATM fee reimbursements and the best exchange rates. Now, some other banks might offer those, but for my money, credit unions are the way to go. And plus, you can get a small loan if your credit score isn't hot garbo like mine. <laughs> so number four, do carry cash on you at all times. Unless you're going shopping, you don't really need a whole lot. But definitely having some cash on hand will make things easier in case the shops you go to don't accept cards or their card reader is down. Now as far as amounts go, I'd say carrying around 10,000 to 3,000 yen or about 100, 300 USD in cash should be more than enough. Now keep in mind, you're not gonna be spending that much day to day, but it is good to have that little extra buffer just in case. Number five, do get a Pasmo Suica card. In addition to paying for your train fare near the train stations, a lot of vending machines, shops, and even some taxis accept payments via Pasmo slash Suica card. Just look for a little gray NFC box to see if it accepts Pasmo or Suica. So yeah, those are my five ways to handle money out here in Japan. And if you have any other tips or tricks, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the boobity boops because I'm always looking for new tips myself. And with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign for now. And as always, we'll see you. There we go. <laughs> Next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey guys, Andy here, and today on Andy Talks Japan, I'm going to be talking to you about how much I saved up for to study abroad in Tokyo. So, just a little bit of context on me and where I'm at and all this kind of stuff. So, right now I'm studying abroad in Tokyo at Lakeland University of Japan, which is located in Shinjuku. Now, this is essentially, I guess you'd call it like a satellite campus. Uh, the main campus is located in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. They have a satellite campus out here in Tokyo, and that's where I'm going to school at. So for me, I'm also on the GI Bill, so I get essentially like a monthly housing allowance. Uh, but it does take a couple months to uh, kind of process and get going, especially if it's your first time uh, in, in uh, new school or just in school in general. So it can take a little bit of time to uh, <clears throat> get that going. So. If you have a decent amount in savings, I'd recommend uh, saving up as much as you can. So for me, um, I had a pretty healthy amount in savings, but I ended up spending a lot of that on, uh, you know, just stuff I needed to get myself out here in Japan, equipment and other things, and also lost a lot of, lot of it to uh, taxes. So I didn't really have a whole lot of money um, once everything was all said and done, once I came out here to Tokyo. Uh, I think altogether I had probably less than a thousand dollars, which, uh, looking back on it now, I definitely do not recommend you coming out with that low amount of money, um, especially if it's going to take a while for you to either get like a part-time job or um, whatever the case may be. You know, if you're on the GI Bill like me, if you go in through like a Mex scholarship or something like that, or any kind of scholarship, it may take a little bit for uh, things to process. So. Um, the general rule of thumb is obviously the more you save, the better your, your quality of life will be. And that goes across the board for any study abroad program. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, I definitely want to recommend if you are going to save up to come out to Tokyo or just about anywhere in the world, really, 
Um, but definitely in Tokyo, I'd recommend saving up at least three thousand uh, dollars, five thousand ideally. But I think at least three thousand will get you uh, comfortably by here until uh, some other checks and scholarships and whatever else start kicking in. So <clears throat> for me, like I said, I'm on the GI Bill, so I do get a, a monthly housing allowance. But uh, since this is my first semester here at Lakeland, it takes a while for everything to process through the VA. And uh, at the time of this recording, they just switched over to a new uh, housing allowance um, program or format or whatever. So there was a lot of changeover involved with that. So that uh, further delayed things. But I'm happy to say I'm going to be getting uh, my check. Uh, it will be Saturday, my time. So in a couple more days, I'm getting that uh, a sweet okane, a sweet money. So, yeah. Um, but if you're wondering, like, how I was able to survive for about three months on less than $1,000, well, a lot of that is due in part to, uh, obviously, shrewd spending. Um, I live in a wonderful guest house out in Nakano, Nakano Guest House. I'll be doing a video on that in the future. And uh, it's very cheap living. It's very close to uh, school. So, um, you know, train fare is not too bad. And, uh, you know, just spending as little as possible on meals. Um, because the guest house, you know, the kitchen space and food storage space is a little limited, it's kind of hard to cook, you know, do like meal prep and stuff like that because there's less storage space for it. So that's kind of one of the drawbacks of living in a guest house is <laughs> just less food storage space. Um, so I got to eat out a bit more, get like bento from the gambini and other places. But, uh, you know, a lot of the savings and stuff is transferred due to like rent, which is um, uh, the full price would be about $320 American. But uh, the first two months are discounted depending on when you come in. So, uh, yeah, that's pretty nice. Not going to lie. But uh, another way you can uh, make money out here, and I'll get into more detail on this later, is uh, if you're coming here, um, be sure to fill out the Autobito form, which is uh, a form that will allow you to uh, work part-time on a student visa. Um, even if you don't plan on working out here, it's always good to have in your back pocket just in case you need to make a little extra cash or just something happens because you never know. But if you fill out that form, it'll allow you to work part-time now here in Japan. And again, I'm going to talk a bit more about it in a future video, but uh, if you work part-time, you'll be able to earn a little bit of extra cash and you won't be so stressing. So, yeah, again, I came here with less than $1,000. Uh, managed to make it through, you know, my savings and uh, we'll just say the kindness of others. <laughs> I don't want to get into much more detail than that. And uh, at the end of the day, I guess, uh, if you guys are looking to uh, come out here to Tokyo or just just about anywhere in the world, really. Um, I would recommend saving up at least $3,000 $3, and uh, $5,000, ideally. So, yeah, with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Signing for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. And so, if you have any other questions about studying abroad in Japan, I'm doing a whole series of questions on it. So, be sure to leave them. Comments down below in the boopy boops. <laughs> All right. Just about over. All right. Bye, guys. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japandy, I'm going to be talking to you about should you be worried about studying abroad in Tokyo. So, as you guys know, if you've been following the news at the time of this recording, there is uh, <clears throat> something going around uh, Southeast Asia, and it's been found in other parts of the world. And uh, yeah, so for the purposes of this video, I will not be naming it by its actual name. So we'll just call it uh, Kelowna Chan, we'll say. So um, Kelowna Chan has been found in uh, China, South Korea, and Japan. In fact, there was a whole party hosted by Kelowna Chan. And uh, it was on a cruise ship that was docked out in Yokohama. And again, I'll let you fill in the blanks. So <laughs> anyway, yeah, so because of uh, Kelowna Chan hosting little parties here and there around the world, uh, there's a lot of concern about whether you should uh, study abroad or even travel abroad 
right now. And uh, again, just to establish some context, I'm just a study abroad student out here in Tokyo, I'm not a disease control specialist. I don't even play on the internet. So please, by all means, do your research, go to credible news sources to learn more about things. But this is just from my own personal perspective. So from my perspective, um, it is really hard to find masks these days, especially the ones that help block out um, Kelowna Chan. And uh, it's also extremely hard to find hand sanitizer. They call it uh, alcohol gel. <clears throat> so if you're looking for it uh, out and about in town, um, call it like alcohol gel or alcohol hand gel, or it has certain brands. Um, Topeka is the most popular one. It's the one with like the little um, raccoon on it showing its hands. That's the most popular brand. Um, and I think they got like Purell and stuff out here too. It's, it's hard saying right now because, uh, you know, it's all sold out pretty much everywhere. And if you try to buy it online at Amazon Japan, um, they're <laughs> you're getting robbed royally because they're marking up the prices like crazy. But in any event, uh, as far as like general health safety and stuff like that, um, just from my own experience, um, I haven't really seen anything too out of the ordinary out here. Um, there are a lot more people wearing masks. That's definitely a thing. Um, and that's about it, really. But really, like, during the winter time, that's usually, um, <clears throat> like, flu season. So it's kind of common. And it's just common in general for Japanese people to be wearing masks anyway. So for me, I don't really notice anything too different. Um, there have been, like, some closures of events and things like that. You know, not just, you know out and about in Tokyo, but also on campus as well. But uh, as far as regular day-to-day -day life, nothing really all that different. Um, but what I, re <laughs> what I would recommend you do, if you do decide to come out here to Japan or just anywhere in general, <laughs> some general rules, uh, be sure to wash your hands on a frequent basis. Try not to touch your face. Um, that's a big habit for me. That's why I carry the uh, hand sanitizer. <laughs> I have a bad habit of uh, touching my face. If you do decide to touch your face, use the back hand, not your, uh, you know, front palm, I guess you could say. And uh, yeah, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer. They have alcoholic wipes as well. They also have like an alcoholic uh, like spritz, like a mist sort of thing. Be sure to use that as well. Um, and just, uh, you know, use common sense. Uh, wear a mask if you can find them. Um, there's also like a huge article about what masks to wear and what masks block what. Be sure to uh, do your research. Um, again, do your research. <laughs> but you know, just general common sense stuff. Um, now, as far as uh, other reasons why you might be afraid of studying abroad in Tokyo, whether it's cultural, language-wise, money-wise, um, whatever the case may be. Um, in those cases, you know, my philosophy is where there's a will, there's a way. So if you're worried about not fitting in the Japanese culture and the Japanese way of doing things, um, you know, it's definitely a big worry for a lot of Americans as well because they think, you know, Japanese culture is so different and you know, you stick out like a sore thumb and you'll get a lot of stares and all those kinds of stuff. And don't get me wrong, that does happen. Even out here in Tokyo, I do get stared at sometimes, but eh, it's kind of whatever. <laughs> I don't I don't mind it too much, actually. Um, but, you know, uh, a little bit of research will do you good. So if you're worried about like language and stuff, there's plenty of uh, information out there, both paid and for free. Um, so you can definitely study up at least study the basics you don't have to be uh jozu at the nihongo uh just to order a cheeseburger out here or whatever um yeah just uh study up a little bit study kind of the basics and uh you'll be fine you know i gotta say little sumimasen goes a long way gotta say <laughs> hey that rhymed i just saw that um but as far as like money concerns um and I talked about this in my previous video, how much should I save up for to study abroad? If you haven't watched that yet, be sure to check it out. But uh, if your concerns are financial related. Um, again, where there's a will, there's a way. So research on cheap accommodations, that would be number one, because that's gonna be your number one expense. 
Um, try to find them fairly close to where you're going to be studying at, working, whatever the case may be. So that way you can cut down on your train fare. Or if you have enough saved up, you can just get yourself a Jitencha bicycle and just bike back and forth to work slash school. And it'll save you a lot of months. And it'll help uh, shrink the old stomach up. So if you're fixing to lose a couple uh, LBs or uh, KGs out here <laughs> in Japan, uh, that's a pretty easy way to do it. So yeah, again, there's a will is a way. Um, if you're looking to cut back on other things, uh, there's a lot of really cheap eats out here. I want to really do a video on that, uh, especially. Um, even if you go to like foreign restaurants, you can get just a cheap meal that'll fill you up. Uh, you can get like convenient bentos and you can get stuff at the grocery store and cook at your place if uh, you have the means to do it. Uh, some guest houses like mine, it's kind of hard to get yourself in the kitchen or store food and stuff like that. So, you know, it's all very situational. But again, where there's a will, there's a way. And uh, as Marie Forleo once said, everything is figure outable. So just uh, do your research and uh, proceed from there. So with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. And if you guys have any questions about studying abroad in Tokyo, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the booby boops and I will do my best to answer them. And they could be in the next video, too. So, <laughs> sure, leave me a little something, something down there. Hey, guys, Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japan, I'm going to be talking to you about is it okay to study abroad in Tokyo in your 30s? <laughs> All right, let's get into it. So if you guys don't know anything about me, uh, hi, my name's Andy, and I'm a study abroad student here at Lakeland University of Japan out here in Tokyo, Japan, Shinjuku to be more specific. And uh, I'm 34 years old, 34歳 in Japanese. So I am definitely outside uh, normal college age, and I'm also a veteran too, so I'm studying here on the GI Bill. So again, that also makes me uh, more of an outlier. But as far as answering the question of, you know, is it weird to study abroad, you know, in your 30s and up, you know, I'm not just gonna cap it at 30. But for me, and I can only really speak to, to this school in particular, um, I gotta say that uh, this school, has been the most um, welcoming for me <laughs> out here because um, when I was studying at uh, in Michigan, uh, for those who don't know, I studied at uh, three schools prior to coming out to Lakeland. I studied at Western, Michi Western Michigan University and uh, Kalamazoo Valley, uh, both in Kalamazoo, Michigan. Then I also studied at uh, Fayetteville Technical Community College out in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And of, you know, of all the schools I've studied at, uh, Lakeland has been the most accommodating. It's been the most open and friendly. And it's weird because, like, when I was studying at the other schools, I felt kind of weird hanging out with other students because I'm, like, way older than they are. So I kind of felt like, you know, hey, how's it going, fellow kids? You know, it just it felt weird, you know. But uh, the other students don't really mind it. And, they, you know, I was talking with... Uh, Another exchange student, he's from Sweden, and he says that, you know, a lot of the Western students, you know, are older than college age anyway, and I think he said he was like 25, 26. So it's kind of common out here, especially. And, uh, you know, there's also a couple other fellow GI Bill students here as well. So uh, it's definitely uh, not that uncommon, I guess, but, uh, you know, if you're worried about studying abroad out here in your 30s and up, um, I wouldn't really worry about it. You know, for me, age is just a number. And, uh, you know, you can definitely get in your own head about your age, you know, thinking, you know, I don't want to hang out with all these kids. You know, they'll think I'm old and weird and okay, boomer and blah, blah, blah. But again, you just got to get out of your own fucking head. <laughs> Sorry for the language, but you got to get out of your own head and uh, just get out there, you know? Even though you are older, you're also a student. So, you know, don't be, uh, you know, try to get rid of all the hangups that you have with uh, your age versus uh, other students. You know, just get out there, make some friends, and uh, you'll be able to enjoy your experience a lot more. And that goes across the board, not just here at Lakeland. 
Um, so yeah, that's <laughs> pretty much all I wanted to say um, in this video. So with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign for now. And as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. And so if you have any questions about studying abroad out here in Tokyo, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the boop de boop and I will do my best to answer them and put them in uh, upcoming videos and stuff. So, yeah. Hey guys, Andy here, and today on Andy Talks to Pandy, I'm going to be talking to you about how much clothes should I bring to study abroad in Tokyo. So, let's just jump right into it, right? So, um, for me, um, studying abroad out here, Lake University of Japan in uh, Shinjuku, and again, for me, I brought a lot more than I really needed. So I brought about three, week, ugh, three weeks worth of clothes and a bunch of other stuff, which I ended up having to get rid of actually um, due to weight restrictions. So again, depending on your flight, you might have to uh, um, size out your bags accordingly because uh, for me, there were weight restrictions involved with that. So I had to get rid of a lot of stuff that I packed, so a lot of electronics. Uh, my suit, I had to throw out my suit, and I'm a little, mm, a little mad about that, <laughs> not gonna lie. Um, but I had to throw out my suit, a bunch of other stuff, and uh, things like that. So I came here with about three weeks worth of clothing, um, two pairs of shoes, and some sandals for like inside footwear, which is another thing you should uh, be wary, or at least know about. Um, now, if you're like teaching or whatever and you need like proper inside footwear, not just slippers, uh, I would recommend getting uh, some shoes, preferably in your home country because um, if you're above a size 10 American, um, that's like a size 28, 28 centimeters out here in Japan. So if you're above that, you'll definitely... <laughs> be uh, limited in your choices and it's going to be hard to uh, find something out in town as uh, I found out being a size 11 American which would be a size 29 centimeters in Japan and just a little two size difference made all the difference when it came to finding footwear. I remember back when I was stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan in Kanagawa Prefecture many moons ago I tried finding hiking boots because ironically uh, when I was going to go climb, climb Mount Fuji, I couldn't find any, like, hiking boots at the necks. Which is ironic, right? Because they have, like, regular uniform boots and all kinds of other stuff. But as far as, like, regular, ye olde basic hiking boots or whatever, they didn't have that. So I had to go out in town and went to a place called ABC Mart, uh, for those of you wondering. Of which they do have a pretty nice collection of shoes now. And you can buy them online and you can go through, like, Amazon Japan and stuff like that. So it's not impossible to find shoes if you're above a size 28 centimeters, size 10 in America. Um, but you are going to have to be a little more um, studious, or you have to research a bit more to uh, find places that will uh, accommodate your uh, clod hopper frickin' feats. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. And uh, in addition to that, I also brought uh, some electronics like my laptop, camera, and a bunch of other doodads and things like that. That's the basic gist of it. And really, if I had to do it over again, uh, clothes-wise, probably would have packed about two weeks worth of clothes instead of three. But, uh, you know, kind of is what it is. So, yeah. <laughs> and with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. It's not for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. And so if you have any questions about studying abroad in Tokyo, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the boopy boops, and I will do my best to answer them. So look forward to reading your comments. All right. Bye, guys. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japan, I'm going to be talking to you about what you should bring to study abroad in Tokyo. So... I'm not going to do a uh, like a line item by line item type thing. I'm going to kind of make it a bit more general just to fit your particular lifestyle. And also, you know, types of clothing and things like that. Because, you know, like say, for instance, what I wear is a little different than what the ladies wear. So um, 
you have to pack accordingly. So um, yeah, let's just get right into it, right? So for me, and I talked about this in my previous video, talking about how much clothes should I bring to study abroad in Tokyo. Um, I recommended that you bring uh, two weeks worth of clothes, at least. Um, anything uh, beyond that, probably wouldn't do like anything more than three weeks worth of clothes because again, you have to worry about uh, weight restrictions for your flight. So there are some flights where they have weight restrictions even on uh, checked luggage, which is something I found out the hard way. So I ended up having to dump a whole lot of clothes and other electronics and things like that just to make the, uh, the weight for my baggage. Um, so be sure to be cognizant about that. And um, also, even beyond that, just lugging it around from um, whatever airport you come in through, Narita, Haneda, recommend Haneda, by the way. Um, you also have to lug it onto the train to, or the bus to get to your next destination, whether it's a hotel or your guest house or wherever the case may be. So you have to be mindful about not packing too much because you got to lug all that stuff around Japan. So uh, for me, I would recommend uh, at least two weeks worth of clothing, no more than three weeks. Um, also, I would recommend uh, two to three pairs of shoes because, again, for me, I wear a size 11 American, which is a size 29 centimeter out here in Japan. And if you're a size 28 centimeter and below, again, for men's, don't know what it is for ladies, sorry, ladies, but uh, <clears throat> if you're a size 28 and below in men's, in Japan, uh, you'll be fine. You'll be able to find like a whole slew of shoes out here. Yeah, that kind of sort of rhymed. Uh, but if you're above a size 28, even if it's 28 and a half, I've found, um, you'll have some troubles finding stuff. It's not impossible, but you just got to be a bit more um, studious, I guess, in finding footwear for you. Uh, luckily, there's a lot of places. You know, out here in town, uh, ABC Mart, uh, Amazon Japan, and uh, other places as well. Those are the two that I've gone to for footwear. Uh, in fact, I bought these shoes off of Amazon. Not Amazon Japan, but just Amazon in general. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, but in any event, yeah, definitely three pairs of shoes. Also, maybe like some indoor shoes. You know, whether that's sandals, uh, slippers, things like that. Um, if you are doing teaching... I would recommend getting like a spare pair of shoes as your indoor shoes. You know, just kind of clean up, make them look nice and stuff. Uh, so that way you can like put them in your little foot locker or whatever. And those will be your shoes you're changing to when you're coming into school. Um, and uh, stuff like that. But if you're living at a guest house, you'll definitely need <clears throat> like uh, sandals, slippers, whatever. So I brought a pair of sandals for me. Um... As far as toiletries, it uh, depends, again, on your preferences. And also, if you have sensitive skin, like I do, um, I have to use like special shampoo and detergent and stuff like that. Um, I'm going to be doing a dedicated video on how to do laundry and other types of places to shop for stuff. If you have sensitive skin, like I do, it's not impossible to find. And it's actually pretty plentiful, actually, because there's a lot of people in Japan with sensitive skin. So it's uh, a pretty easy find, but you gotta know what you're looking for. Again, topic for a future video. So aside from basic toiletries, you know, cologne, perfume, uh, you know, shampoo, stuff like that, at least enough to kind of get you by. If you get the little travel size, that's okay. But, uh, you know, I'd recommend something that at least get you by for the first two weeks, maybe three. And then, you know, shaving, which uh, I gotta do. <laughs> you know, just stuff like that. And then uh, electronics, um, definitely recommend bringing a laptop, ideally, um, just because you'll never know what you're working on. Um, if you have a tablet, uh, it's fine, but I wouldn't go out of my way to buy a tablet specifically for studying abroad in Japan. Um, the only one I would like consider going out of my way for buying would be the Surface Pro tablet, because it could also double as a laptop, you know, depending on what types of programs and stuff you work with. You know, if you're a, a video editor like myself, um, you'll have to be shelling out a lot of money to get a uh, Surface Pro tablet that can do a lot of video editing stuff. But for basic day-to-day -day stuff, you know, just the basic models, more than enough. And also a uh, cell phone, which I'm recording on right now, 
uh, preferably unlocked because then you'll just be able to get a SIM card out here in town and uh, go on from there. And uh, yeah, also a, a book bag would do you well as well. So that way if you're out and about in town, you know, you can carry stuff in that. So if you like, you go grocery shopping, wherever the case may be, instead of just holding on to the groceries all the time, you know, just shove them in your book bag, GG. So that's the uh, basic gist of uh, what to bring out here to study abroad in Tokyo, Japan. So with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. And if you have any questions about studying abroad in Tokyo, sure leave them in the comments down below in the booby -de boops and I will do my best to answer those questions. And I definitely look forward to uh, seeing you guys' comments down below. <laughs> All right. Bye, guys. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japan, I'm going to be talking to you about if studying abroad will delay my graduation. So... Let's just jump right into it, right? So for a little bit of context, um, I'm studying abroad here at Lakeland University of Japan out here in Tokyo, in Shinjuku to be more specific. And this is basically a satellite campus for uh, their main campus out in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. And there's also other campuses that do the same thing too, most notably Temple, which we'll be getting to here, getting to here in a sec. <laughs> so as far as will it delay you graduating, um, it just depends on what classes you take and stuff like that. But uh, the cool thing about Lakeland is they have what's called like a two and two program. And what you can do is you can study abroad out here at Lakeland University of Japan, study for two years, get your associate's degree, and then you can transfer over to the main campus out in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, finish up to get your four year degree. And the really cool thing about that is is that you you can also get a ten thousand dollar scholarship as well so it's a pretty pretty nice incentive and another cool thing is that since you studied here at Lakeland University of Japan again hashtag not an ad <laughs> but uh, if you study here all your credits will 100 percent transfer over so you won't have to worry about you know which credits will or won't transfer uh, when you go to your next um, post-secondary education place college university wherever so uh, that's a nice little peace of mind to have if you're looking to get your four-year degree. Uh, but if you're looking to stay out here in Japan and get your four-year degree, what most students out here do is they transfer out to Temple University of Japan, which is also a satellite campus for Temple University, which is based in, I believe, Philadelphia, back in Mercogen land, um, which is also another possibility as well. So again, it just depends on what you want to do out here you know you could study abroad out here for two years get your associates and go elsewhere or maybe just stay out here for a semester or two and then go back you know it just uh, depends on uh, what your plans are so that's uh, pretty much the gist of it so with that said guys this is the Andy sign sign for now as always see you next time catch you later guys bye and if you have any questions about studying abroad in Tokyo, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the booby boops and I will do my best to answer them. So definitely look forward to reading your comments. <laughs> hey guys, Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japan, I'm going to be talking to you about when is the best time to study abroad in Tokyo. So let's just jump right into it, right? <laughs> that. Anyway, so uh, just for a little bit of context, I'm studying here at Lakeland University of Japan out here in Tokyo, in Shinjuku to be more specific. And I arrived here at the beginning of 2020, woo. So I entered into the winter, spring semester. I guess they call it the spring semester here. Um, yeah, I started at the beginning of the year, <laughs> basically. And you know, for me, I found that um, it's the best time to go because it's uh, a fresh new year. It's kind of, you know, especially if you're studying abroad, a lot of times people do it as like a resolution, you know, so it's kind of like a new year, new me type thing. And plus it'll give you like a full year, uh, it'll give your year like a fresh start rather than starting, 
you know, at the end of the year or the middle of the year or whatever. So that's that part's pretty nice. And plus, uh, a lot of people, um, especially if you're traveling at like the uh, like Christmas time slash New Year's time, there's not a lot of Japanese people uh, traveling abroad during that time. So you'll, it'll be a lot easier for you to get like uh, plane tickets and won't be quite as crowded at the airport and stuff. It'll still be crowded, but less so, <laughs> basically. And uh, if you decide to study abroad in the summertime, um, the advantage of that is that if you have to stay in a dormitory, and there are a lot of schools that have dormitory restrictions, so um, if it's your first like six months out here in Japan, a lot of schools will force you to stay in their dorms for the first six months, and then afterwards, you know, you have to find an apartment, guest house, wherever the case. Um, <clears throat> but the cool thing about Lakeland is that they don't have any of those restrictions, so you can pretty much live wherever you want. And also, just a little side note uh, for prospective veterans looking to study abroad at Lakeland or Temple or wherever else. Um, if you were previously stationed in Japan before you transition out, um, I believe those six months can be waived based on your previous station or if you have like a spousal visa or something like that, you ain't got to worry about that. And I think, you know, you might be able to get like a waiver or something like that, depending on the school. But again, you know, it, it uh, is best to just ask them directly uh, just to be sure. But, you know, just, uh, you know, keep that in mind, I guess. So, but again, for the summer, if there are dormitory restrictions and you have to stay in the dorm, the summer semesters are the shortest, so you get charged the least amount of money to, uh, to stay in the dorms. And uh, also, you know, paying for school and stuff like that, same thing. And uh, if you're coming here in the fall, then you are, uh, you know, again, like with spring, uh, you know, fall is probably the longest semester. So, you know, if you're worried about tuition and stuff, definitely pay more in the fall versus the spring. It's marginal, but uh, it's definitely a noticeable difference. Um, you also got to worry about, you know, again, dormitory accommodations and things like that. And, uh, you know, also another point I forgot to mention for the, the summer semester, kind of a disadvantage, aside from the, uh, the really oppressive heat, <laughs> that Japanese summertime heat, hot and sticky, let me tell you. But aside from that, um, the main thing is uh, Golden Week. So the airports are going to be very busy. It's going to be really hard for you to buy tickets because there's a lot of Japanese people looking to travel abroad during that time. And there's a little bit of that for the, uh, the fall as well. There's a lot of uh, travel time for that. Um, but it's most notable, especially for Golden Week, which is, you know, the beginning of the summer semesters out here. So that's another thing to take into consideration. So, yeah, um, if I had a choice, I'd probably do it in the summertime just because, uh, you know, the tuition and stuff's less. If I had dormitory restrictions, you know, I'd be paying less for a dorm. But, uh, you know, for my particular case, wintertime slash springtime, beginning of the year, <laughs> however it divvies up, is the best time to study abroad in Japan. So, with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign for now. As always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. And if you have any questions about studying abroad in Tokyo, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the booby boops and I will do my best to answer them. So really looking forward to uh, reading you guys' comments down below. Hey guys, Andy here, and today on Andy Talks Japan D, I'm going to be talking to you about how hard the coursework is here studying abroad in Tokyo. So just for a little uh, background on me, I'm a study abroad student out here at Lakeland University of Japan, out here in Tokyo, uh, Shinjuku to be more specific. And I gotta say, you know, I've been to a lot of universities, community colleges, things like that over the years. <laughs> and, you know, for me, I haven't really noticed any, any real difficulty difference between courses, you know, here versus back in America. Um, it's about the same, really. Um, and also, it just depends on 
a lot of factors like uh, teachers, uh, the courses, obviously, you know, if you're in like a AP math or something like that, you know, it's going to be a lot harder for me than it will be for somebody who's really good at math. And, you know, some teachers might be uh, more willing to explain things versus others who are just kind of, here's the homework, here it is, that's how we're doing things. Uh, but for me, I haven't really noticed anything, any major difference in difficulty studying out here versus back in America. But I will say that <clears throat> there are some differences in teaching styles. Even though this is an American school, there are a lot of uh, non-American teachers out here. And uh, there are very slight differences in teaching styles. And uh, depending on the teacher and the coursework and all that kind of stuff, um, you might have to get some tutoring or maybe you know, email them or ask for some help outside of class, you know, just to kind of clarify some things, because that's something I noticed when studying for the midterms was uh, just kind of what we discussed in class um, versus what was on the midterm. Things were laid out a little differently, and just the structure of class is uh, a lot different than uh, what I'm used to. So it was kind of hard to, uh, like, figure out what we talked about in class versus what's going to be on the test. So uh, just uh, definitely keep that in mind, and uh, communication is key. So with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign for now, and as always, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. And if you have any questions about studying abroad in Tokyo, Japan, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the boobie boops and I will do my best to answer those questions. So definitely looking forward to uh, reading your comments down below. All right. Bye, guys. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japan, I'm going to be talking to you about what subjects you can study out here uh, when you study abroad in Tokyo. So just for a little context on me, my name is Andy, and I'm studying abroad at Lakeland University of Japan, located out here in Tokyo, uh, Shinjuku, to be more specific. And as far as the different types of uh, subjects and classes and stuff like that you can study out here, um, as far as like the basic courses, you know, like math, writing, um, history, stuff like that, uh, you definitely have those same courses out here versus either at the home campus in Sheboygan, Wisconsin, or in other universities out in America and elsewhere. Uh, but this particular university is basically designed to get a lot of your gen ed courses out of the way and then for you to transfer either to the home campus or elsewhere and then you can uh, specialize and get your major and all that kind of stuff out of the way so uh, there's not a whole lot of electives here versus at the home campus or elsewhere but there are a couple and uh, they're pretty neat i gotta say at least the ones i'm taking um and, you know, this is also a smaller school, too, so there's only so much room for stuff and things, so I just got to keep that in mind. Uh, but as far as, like, the, the Common Core, I guess, like a Gen Ed type stuff, uh, it's the same here as it is back in the States, so you don't have to worry about that. And, yeah, so with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign for now. As always, see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. So if you have any questions about study abroad in Tokyo, Japan, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the boobity boops, and I will do my best to answer them. So look forward to reading your comments. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japan, I'm going to be talking to you about if I knew I wanted to study abroad out here in Tokyo. So this is a little bit of background on me. My name is Andy, and I'm studying abroad out here at... Lakeland University of Japan, located out here in Tokyo, uh, Shinjuku to be more specific. And yeah, as you guys know, uh, if you've been following me for the past couple years, I was formerly stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan, which is in the Kanagawa Prefecture, just, just south of Yokohama and Tokyo as well. And during my time out there, I really enjoyed uh, living out here in Japan and I wanted to come back, but I didn't know of a way me to do that on the GI Bill because I tried doing like a like a student exchange program or a study abroad program through 
the campus I was at previously, but because the GI Bill has certain restrictions, so unless my major explicitly required that I go study abroad, GI Bill would not provide for that. But through an old shipmate of mine who got accepted out to Temple University Japan, also out here in Tokyo, um, you can just apply to a foreign university rather than go through another intermediary university and the GI Bill will accept it just fine. And uh, it took me a couple of years to uh, rebuild my GPA and save up and just kind of get to the point to where um, I could come out here. But uh, I applied to uh, Lakeland and after a while and building up my GPA and getting good, basically, uh, they accepted me. And proud to say, started out here at the beginning of 2020, woo. And uh, things have been going very well for me so far. And I'm really loving the, uh, the campus and just being back in Japan because I really missed being out here. Um, had the time of my life out here when I was stationed out here. And I've always wanted to come out here ever since I was a little kid. And uh, proud to say I've been able to do that twice now. So, yeah, with that said, guys, this is the Andy Son. Sign up for now. As always, see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. So if you guys have any questions about study abroad in Tokyo, make sure to leave them comments down below in the boobdy boops, and I will do my best to answer them. So definitely looking forward to uh, reading your comments and seeing your questions down there. So, <laughs> all right. Bye, guys. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japan, I'm going to be talking to you about what I was nervous slash excited about before leaving to study abroad here in Tokyo. So a little quick uh, context on me. My name's Andy, studying abroad out here at Lakeland University of Japan in Tokyo, the uh, Shinjuku area to be more specific. And yeah, so for me, uh, the things I was excited about obviously was being back in Japan and being in Tokyo, because I've never lived in Tokyo before. I visited plenty of times back when I was stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan, which is in the Kanagawa Prefecture, just uh, south of Yokohama and south of Tokyo as well. And I just wanted to be back in the country for many, many years and to be given an opportunity to come back to study abroad out here was definitely a very enticing opportunity. So I was extremely excited to be back here in the country that I miss so much. And also, as far as things that I was nervous about, um, for me, <clears throat> it was all very, all the like the logistic type stuff. So, you know, am I going to be able to make my flight? Am I going to be able to afford my flight? Are there going to be any delays, cancellations? Am I going to have, you know, am I packing too much? Am I packing like a certain material that I didn't know was banned? And just all these different thoughts racing into my head. Um, as I was uh, getting ready for Japan because like before I was all like super excited and can't wait to be back in Japan and all this other stuff but as the days got closer and closer to where I would you know fly out and come back here then I started worrying about the little things you know and as they say don't sweat the small stuff because a lot of times especially if you're like me you tend to overthink a lot of things and uh, you know it's good to kind of have some things in the back of your mind, but for the most part, you'll just be chasing your tail. So uh, just don't sweat the small stuff and uh, try to focus on the good things. But you know, if there are some things that you got to be concerned about, be sure to uh, address those. So well, that's it, guys. This is the Andy Sound. It's not for now. As always, see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. So if you have any questions about study abroad out here in Tokyo, I'm sure leave me comments down below in the boobity boobs and I will do my best to answer them. So definitely looking forward to seeing your comments and uh, questions as well. So yeah guys, we out here at the good old coin laundry out here in Nakano, Tokyo, Japan. And I wanted to do a video response today to a good old buddy of mine, Jim from the Kid Shoryuken channel. He's a fellow US military veteran just like myself. 
of he was in the Air Force and I was in the Navy. But in any event, uh, today I want to do a response to him talking about why you should start a YouTube channel. Now, originally I was going to do this on just my regular old The Andy San channel, but I wanted to make this video a bit more Japan centric. So we're just going to narrow it down to why you should start a video if you come to study abroad out here in Japan or anywhere really in the world. But these can be applied to starting a YouTube channel in general, so it's not just narrowed down to traveling stuff. Just for a little bit of context on ya boy, the Indy San Samadeshta, I started on YouTube way back in the day, way back on March 1st, 2006. It's a long ass time. And I originally signed up for YouTube just to leave comments because back in the day uh, for video sharing websites, it was all curated, so it would go through a mod or some other type of admin before it was put up on their website as it was deemed worthy enough, whether it's usually funny or amazing or just otherwise noteworthy. And the cool thing about YouTube was that anybody could post pretty much anything. And this was before the Viacom lawsuit and all this other stuff. It was definitely the Wild West back then. Everybody was just kind of posting whatever. But this also began the rise of user-generated content on a regular basis. So versus back in the day, somebody might submit like a viral video and that'd be it for them. This was the beginning of regular series-based content around just regular old people. Now you also had uh, some series-based content, you know, like you had ABGN, you also had Nostalgia Critic, and a bunch of others as well. For me, I got really interested in the J-vlogging scene, and so a lot of the early creators from that era, you had Tokyo Kuni, the late great Roger Swan, and with the YouTube system, it also allowed you to sign up, and uh, if you started an account, you could leave comments on uh, your favorite creator's videos. You could also subscribe to them as well. So whereas before you'd have to go back and like check the site just to see if you know your favorite creator uploaded something, this would just send you a little email ping saying, hey, Tokyo Kuni uploaded a new video. Hey, Tokyo Swan uploaded a new video. And so it was for those two reasons that I decided to start my YouTube account in the first place. And it wasn't until a couple years later when I decided to make videos on my own. Now granted, before that, the only other videos that were up on my YouTube page were stuff from, you know, my friends. Um, little clips of uh, their karate class, tournaments, things like that. Um, my friend Ben's uh, band practice back in the day. And just other random little doodads and things like that. But it wasn't until 2008 when I got my own camera to where things really took off for me as a creator and was able to make whatever, whenever. Didn't have to borrow my friend's camera anymore. Originally I started vlogging just so I could put it up on my own website. And it was just a way to kind of differentiate content back then because before I started YouTube, I was a blogger. And I saw vlogging as just kind of an accompaniment to uh, just regular old text-based vlogs. And once I really got into the weeds of vlogging and really started doing it on a regular basis is when I became a lot more interested in it than I did blogging. And subsequently, my blog posts became less and less frequent and my vlogs became a lot more consistent. But I do have to say that uh, I wasn't really very well received by the community just because whenever anybody starts something, there's always gonna be the naysayers saying, ah, oh, you're too cringy, you're too this, you're too that. And especially back in those days, the uh, internet community was a lot more uh, vocal about those sorts of things. The community has since calmed down a lot, and YouTube has also put into place a lot of protective measures against spam and stuff like that. So it's a lot easier to suss those comments out and uh, deal with them accordingly. But regardless, I still kept at it because I enjoyed making videos and just loved the video making process. And back then I was also learning video editing as well. Uh, I cut my teeth originally on uh, Sony Vegas Pro back in the day. During that time was also uh, the great recession in America. So jobs were very scarce and I couldn't even get a job working at Walmart or McDonald's or anything really. It got to a point where things become, became very tense in the house and it was either join the military or be homeless. And it was pretty black and white like that because I didn't really have any other place to go 
Uh, my friends were just kind of starting their their own lives, and they had little shoebox apartments, so they couldn't, you know, even have me crash on the couch for a little bit because they didn't have a couch to crash on. So decided, you know, join the military. If anything, I'll be able to get that nice college education at the end of it. During that whole time, I vlogged out my entire experience being in the U.S. Navy from 2010 to 2015. And I'm so glad I did. Even though, looking back at the videos, yeah, they're not the best quality. Yeah, they're not in super crisp 4K or whatever the resolution du jour is when you're watching this video, if you're watching the future, greetings. Regardless, it still is nice to look back at those videos and see where I was uh, during that time in my life and to see uh, all the countries that I visited, all the different little things here and there. It's just so amazing to me. And I'll be able to actually show my kids and grandkids and further on down the line, this is what your dad or grandpa Andy was doing back in the day. Versus, you know, a couple grainy photographs and some uh, sea stories. We'll be actually able to see it in grainy 1080p quality, right? Or 720p for the early shit. So after I got out of the Navy in 2015 and came back to America to go back to school in my 30s, I still continued vlogging, but I didn't quite have this, uh, the sense of purpose that I did back in the day because it was a lot of uh, personal development, a lot of personal rediscovery of who I was. And so I was in a pretty dark place back then. But throughout it all, vlogging helped keep me sane and helped keep some manner of consistency in my life. So no matter what was all going on during that time, I still had vlogging to fall back on and at least I can have some little glimmer of hope, something to work on, even during the most trying of times. And it was during that time that I began my career as a freelance video editor. So back in the day, uh, one of my friend's hard drives had crashed and so he was, he was posting daily content at the time, and I decided to just kind of help him out for all that. And then once he got his hard drive and stuff fixed, he took me on as his editor, and uh, we just kind of went from there. In doing that, I also got referrals to uh, some other people that I worked with, and then those referrals gave me more referrals, and then I continued to grow from there. In the meantime, I was also learning more about uh, video editing programs and just how to be a much more efficient editor so I could uh, get the projects out in a timely manner and just work on more projects. And it really became my passion, I guess, and also a career in, in some sense, even though it's still very much in the early stages. And to be honest, I actually enjoy helping other people find their creative vision more, more so than I do my own. So, you know, being able to see uh, the videos that I put together for other people out on their channels and to like read the comments and stuff like that so it gives me a lot of satisfaction so i began to transition more to being uh, somebody else's video editor versus just doing stuff on my own i really want to do youtube full time but i realize with changing preferences and youtube's uh, changing climate as well it might not be a viable option to do something like that but there is always the option to sell my skills. So my skills as video editor. And I say this, you know, not with the pretense of, oh, I'm so good and I'm like some super video editor man, but you know, just making some YouTube vids, especially for people who make stuff on the regular, but are just completely befuddled by video editing or it just takes them a long time. Um, I'm more than willing to help those people out. And I think I really found my calling, but I wouldn't have found that had I not started YouTube back in 2006, or had I not bought my first camera off of eBay in 2008. It's just one of those things where I know some people kind of give me some crap about, well, Andy, you've been on YouTube for like going on 15 years and you only have so many subscribers and this, that, and the other. But uh, for me, I just do YouTube for fun. Now granted, I like to get paid. I'm working to get uh, this channel monetized and working to build up my other monetized channels, but my main source of money comes from stuff outside of YouTube. To be honest, I'd actually prefer to keep it that way and just having YouTube just be someplace I can upload stuff just for fun. So you notice that a lot of my uploaded content isn't like super well cinematic edited with like cool B-roll and all this other stuff. It's just me talking to people 
on my phone. Like I'm not even using my DSLR camera. It's easier, it's a lot lighter. You know, when I got that big ass DSLR up there with the heavy lens, you know, I can all hold it for like maybe five minutes and then, you know, my arm's like shaking and stuff. So should you start a YouTube channel, I would 100% agree. I think everybody has a voice and I think that everybody's voice deserves to be heard. But as far as like making yourself marketably viable or other stuff, that's up to the market to decide. But that being said, I think everybody should start a YouTube channel, especially if you're studying abroad in a foreign country, you know? I know a lot of um, J vloggers back in the day, even now, started a YouTube channel just to show their friends and family back home what they're doing and what they're up to. And I think, if anything, you should start your channel for that, just to show them what life in a foreign country is like and just kind of get to see how you personally are doing. So I wouldn't say go into YouTube for the sake of money, but just go into it with a sense of connecting with other human beings. Then the money and all this other stuff will, uh, will come afterwards. The market's decision is the market's decision and that's out of your control. The only thing you can control is you. And for me, like going on 15 years out from uh, starting up my own YouTube channel, um, I have no regrets. So yeah guys, I look forward to hearing what you have to say in the comments down below in the boopity boops. And feel free to post like a little video response in there as well. I'll be uh, looking through the comments and seeing people post uh, video links and stuff like that. It may not appear right away just because of you know YouTube spam, stuff like that. So give it a little bit, but uh, I'll be looking through and keeping an eye on it. And with that said guys, this is the Andy Sign. Sign it for now. We'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. So yeah, guys, this spring 2020 semester has come and gone, and I wanted to make a little video talking about my experiences for my first semester studying abroad out here in Tokyo, and also of a lot of the challenges that I faced along the way as well. So, with that said, let's start at the beginning, right? At the end of December 2019, woo, I came out here to Tokyo, and then I started class in mid-January. And from there, things are going pretty good. One of the interesting things that I noticed in my classes is that more often than not, I'm usually the only American there. Uh, the only other class that had another American besides me was my Comp 2 class. It had uh, two other Americans there. And uh, it was primarily Japanese students of the foreign contingent that were there were uh, Swedish, oddly enough. So for those who don't know, the school I go to is Lakeland University of Japan out in Shinjuku, and its home campus is out in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. So it is, for all intents and purposes, an American university, and so it is taught like an American university. So the class dynamics are very interesting. Whereas, you know, most American universities, the teacher would ask a question to the class, somebody would raise their hand and answer the question, and they would carry on to the next piece of business. Uh, here, the Japanese students are a lot more reluctant to answer the question unless they are specifically called upon. So just having the teacher ask a question to the class, more often times than not, there'd just be an uncomfortable amount of silence. And it would just make things really awkward. And after a while, I started speaking up a lot more, <laughs> just if anything, to kind of hurry this along and to uh, get rid of the, uh, the awkward pause. And it got to a point, and I actually talked with one of my professors about this uh, during a little student meeting. Is it always like this? And he's like, yeah. <laughs> so he's, he actually looks forward to uh, more talkative students kind of answering the questions and pushing things along. After a while, I decided to kind of hold back a little bit, let the other students answer some questions, and to also get some participation points. You know, still usually I'd answer some of the first questions, just kind of give other students the confidence to like, yeah, I'm going to answer the question and then I would start to pull back a little bit. So that was very interesting, especially considering my introverted nature. More often than not, back in Mercogen land, I would just uh, sit in the back of the class and not say anything. And so during this time, um, money-wise, I was really living hand to mouth. I only had a little bit in savings at this time, and I was just hanging in there as best I could until the GI Bill would kick in at the end of February and then I would start to live like a normal human being again. <laughs> so I was just kind of holding off and then I was just waiting until March, you know, I'd have the money and be like, yeah, let's go karaoke or whatever the case. 
But uh, as you guys know, if you've been following the news, uh, a certain global pandemic that I can't mention by name reared its ugly head. Lakeland decided to close down its campus and switch to online classes. Now, originally, this was just gonna be for a couple weeks and then we'd uh, get back to class business as usual. But uh, the pandemic lasted a lot longer than we had anticipated. So then it was decided to carry on the online classes for the rest of the semester. Now, the interesting thing about that was just the change in teaching styles. So uh, before my previous university, I think that they did it right to where they would give you X amount of homework at the beginning of the week and then expect you to have it all done at the end of the week. And so you'd have all this time to work on tests, quizzes, homework, whatever the case may be. As long as it's all submitted by the end of the day on Sunday, you were good to go. But uh, Lakeland decided to uh, conduct their online classes as if it were a normal class. So you'd hop into like Zoom rooms, and a lot of times it was just really difficult to get a hang of some things. You know, obviously the first couple of weeks there was a lot of technical issues. Just the uh, the idea of holding like real time classes just for me wasn't very appealing, and I feel it didn't really take advantage of the concept of having an online class to where you can just present homework and then if students have questions or something like that, or if they want to meet up with the teacher or whatever, privately, they can do that. But at least this way you can kind of go at your own pace and uh, work on things because everybody has different uh, living situations and you know maybe work schedules, things like that. So it could be very difficult for students to go to these sessions and to participate actively. Especially with my living situation, because I lived in, live in a guest house, it was really hard for me to be in an environment that was quiet to where I could participate in classes. The guest house was either too loud <laughs> to where the teachers and students couldn't hear me, or if I were to move into a quiet environment, it would be almost like a library to where you couldn't speak. I had to find that nice little balance of things. And oftentimes, I would actually come out to parks like these or just walking around in this little loop here and then when it was my turn to speak I would push to talk. Depending on weather and whatnot that wasn't always an option so then I would have to go to like restaurants and stuff like that. But yeah it really did affect just my ability to get stuff done because not only was the guest house that I'm living at not really a viable option for me to go to class normally. It was also hard for me to uh, to do homework as well because this global pandemic also affected a lot of jobs for the residents of the guest house. Whereas before I would usually do my homework in the mornings, go to class in the afternoon, or if I had morning classes, I would do it in the afternoons. This time around, there really wasn't any uh, spots available for me to do my homework in peace because it'd be a lot more crowded common areas. So it was really hard for me to concentrate. I couldn't concentrate in my personal area either because that's the area that I'm used to relaxing and sleeping and stuff. Oftentimes when I'm there, you know, my mind starts to wander to like sleepy town or relaxation, you know, kick back, watch some anime, go to sleep. So I had to make some concessions. And for the major assignments, I rented out hotel rooms for the weekend so I could sit down and write and catch up on assignments. And thankfully, I was able to recover from that. We were to treat this as like a basketball game or something like that with four quarters. Quarter one, quarter two, was doing pretty good. Uh, but quarter three, a little shaky baby, but uh, thankfully I powered out at uh, quarter four and ended the semester strong. So that said, let's go over overall grades. I got two A's, a C, and an AB. So for those who aren't familiar with what an AB is, and I didn't even know what it was so I had to look it up, it's basically in between an A minus and a B plus, so somewhere in there. So with all that tallied up, I got a 3.4 GPA. So I was so ecstatic and it also got me off of academic probation. Just a little backstory. Um, when I first got accepted to Lakeland, my previous, previous college experience wasn't so good. I had a lot of failed classes, withdrew from the uh, college, took a break for a year, and then came back into it. And so uh, the dean was looking that over and decided I did have improved grades with the college I had previous to Lakeland. He decided based on my previous, previous academic track record, he decided to put me on academic probation so I had to maintain above a 2.0 uh, in order to keep going. So obviously I met and exceeded that goal, so now I'm officially off of academic probation and it feels great, man. 
Overall, I'd say this experience was very unique. As you guys know, it has been documented. It took me a very long time to even get out to Tokyo. And that was a journey in and of itself. You know, it was a lot of self-development, a lot of saving up, a lot of trial, a lot of error, a lot of failure. But uh, eventually came out and we came out strong. I couldn't ask for a better semester. So what's the future hold for the only Andy Sands Hamadeshta from here on out academically? Um, so I have one more semester left at Lakeland University of Japan. And then from there, I'm gonna graduate, get my associate's degree and move on to a new school. Now, as far as what that school will be, will just depend on where I'm able to go because of obviously what's going on in the world and uh, my own academic options, I guess you could say. So the school I want to go to, first and foremost, is Temple University of Japan. It's another American university. This one, the home campus is based out in Philadelphia. They're kind of like the main school for foreigners wanting to come out and study out in Tokyo. But I wanted to get my associates before transferring over there so I wouldn't have to stay at the school for very long. If I do get accepted out there, then I'll continue on for three more semesters and then get my bachelor's. Currently at this time, uh, there was an issue with the main campus and how they dealt with their veteran students. So the VA pulled uh, their funding for the main campus and subsequently Temple University of Japan as well. I did check the, uh, the GI Bill website. It doesn't say anything about not being able to go. It just has like a little warning saying that they had some shady practices and stuff like that. And then I checked on Temple's own websites and they still have GI Bill information and stuff like that on there. So I'm assuming that they're still able to take the GI Bill at this time and they've resolved that issue. Uh, but I've also reached out to admissions uh, to see officially if they're able to take me on. And if so, you know, submit my transcripts, go through all the paperwork for that and uh, move on from there. If Temple is not a possibility for me, the next move would be to uh, go back to America because there's really no other uh, American school option out here for me. Transferring to a Japanese university, they may not be able to accept all my credits. So if Temple isn't willing to accept me, then I'll have to go back to America. And as far as my options there, well, I could go to the uh, Lakeland University main campus out in Sheboygan, Wisconsin. One of the nice things about that is that they'll give you a $10,000 scholarship as a transfer student, and they'll also allow all your credits from Lakeland University of Japan to transfer over one-to-one. -one. For all intents and purposes, I could get my degree there and then come back to Japan. But ideally, considering all the paperwork and all the hustle that I had to put forth to uh, get my student visa out here, I would definitely prefer to stay out here in Tokyo, graduate, and then uh, move on from there. As for uh, right now, I'm on a bit of a, an extended summer break because originally I was supposed to be off for about a month, but uh, because the Dean wants to actually physically open up the campus again, he decided to delay it an additional three weeks. So I have essentially another month's worth of summer vacation before we start up the summer semester. You know, the good news with that is that the amount of time that'll be in school hasn't changed, it's just shifted over three weeks. If I do get accepted to Temple, then the amount of time between transferring from Lakeland to Temple will be very minimal, maybe like a week or so. So as far as GI Bill goes, I'll still be able to retain payments and stuff like that, so there's not that huge payment gap. But the bad news is there is gonna be a huge payment gap at the beginning because, you know, obviously if you're not going to school, you don't get paid on the GI Bill. I just have to be very careful with my spending for uh, the next couple months until things start getting back on track. But once they do, I'm pretty much good to go for uh, the rest of the year. Now, as far as uh, other little bits of news here, I do plan on moving to another guest house and that's to not only be closer to Temple, should they accept me, but it's also to get my own private room as well. So that way, should something like this happen again, I'll have my own private room, be able to work in peace, won't have to spend all that additional money on hotels and whatnot, and be able to uh, maintain my focus. So yeah, that's pretty much all I want to say in this video. Um, if you guys have any questions about uh, studying abroad out here in Tokyo, Japan, um, I'd be happy to answer them. I'm no 
expert by any means. I'm only one semester in at this point, but uh, I do want to answer your questions as best I can. So if you have any, be sure to leave them in the comments down below in the booby boops. And with that said, guys, this is the Andy sign. Time for now, and as always, and forever, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japan. Today's episode, guys, I'm going to be doing a video response to the Red Value. So for me, I've been following the J-Vlogging community, Japan Vlogging community, pretty much since its inception back in the mid-2000s with the advent of YouTube. And so I would follow guys like Tokyo Kuni, the late, great Roger Swan, Jason from the My Argonauts channel, Hiko Simon, Busan Kevin, and just a whole slew of others out there. And a lot of them who have sadly come and gone from the YouTube platform over the years. And so back in the day, it was actually pretty easy to get an audience because there wasn't a whole lot of people on YouTube making content, and certainly not a whole lot of them making that quality Japan content as we've come to know and love. So like I said, it's pretty easy for a lot of new expats and even some older experienced expats to get an audience just sharing their stories on camera, whether it's in the rooms like I'm doing now, taking it back old school or going out and about and showing you the sights of Tokyo, Osaka and elsewhere in Japan. And back in the day, I actually used to joke that every expat who landed in Japan automatically got 2000 subscribers just from landing in Japan. <laughs> but uh, sadly, those days are long over. And the reality is that over time, as more and more people got onto YouTube, both an audience and creators, it's a lot harder for people to reach that audience than it was back in the day. But just because it's harder doesn't mean it's impossible. There are certainly a lot of success stories of people making vlogs in Japan who have reached subscriber counts far exceeding those of the original J vloggers. I mean, some great examples of that would be Rachel and June, Sharla, Michaela, Chris Broad from Abroad in Japan, John Dobb from Only in Japan, Greg Lamb from Life and Rhyme From, and that's just a small sampling of some of the big creators out here in Japan, who I'm pretty sure you know of if you're subscribed to me. I'm positive you're subscribed to those guys too. But a lot of people see their numbers and get discouraged because people are thinking, well, if these guys have millions of subs and all the views, like, why are people gonna give a shit about what I have to say? I gotta say that I do value everybody's different perspective on things. And even though, yeah, you may not have the production value like those guys have, or the camera savvy, but you do have your own perspective on things. And I think that everybody's perspective should be shown to get a broader, no pun intended, but a broader picture of living abroad in Japan. You know, for me, I'm a 34 year old US Navy veteran studying abroad in Japan. I originally came out here as a member of the United States Navy when I was stationed out in Yokosuka, Japan for about two years. And while there's certainly a large military community that comes into Japan, there wasn't really anybody vlogging about their experiences being stationed out in Japan. Certainly none that were active duty. I could tell you that for sure. Even though a lot of veterans also come back to Japan or some never really leave Japan once they get out of the military. They just study abroad like I do on the GI Bill and I don't really see too many veterans doing that either. So even though, yeah, I don't have the numbers like Chris Broad and all them, but I do have a fairly unique perspective and I'm pretty sure that there's other veterans out there who are looking to study abroad, maybe not necessarily in Japan per se, but just abroad outside of the US and want to learn how to do that on the GI Bill and just how the how the process works and what life is like on the other side. And that's who I make my videos for. In addition to people who are interested in the, the goings on in Japan and whatnot. But I believe that offering your own perspective will be the best way to make vlogs in Japan that your audience will enjoy. Now. That being said, I wouldn't put too much stock in the amount of viewers, comments, all that sorts of stuff. A lot of people tend to get too metric happy with those sorts of things. And again, this is the harsh realities of vlogging in Japan, but really those numbers don't matter. It's the people behind those numbers that matter because with numbers, you can just keep going up and up and up and up. 
and it's just a race to the top. And you may not even get that high. But if you really put some effort into your community and really connect with the people who do give a fuck about your content, I think you're gonna have a much more enjoyable time here on YouTube. And so speaking of community, one of the things that I absolutely love about vlogging out here in Japan is the IRL community. Uh, before I was stationed out in Yokosuka, I was basically known as the YouTube guy among my friends. Like nobody among my IRL friend group did YouTube aside from maybe one or two videos that I would have to like push them to put out. And uh, beyond that, they just didn't really care. But once I got out to Japan, I was able to meet with a lot of the creators that I watched regularly on YouTube, got to talk shop and just talk about YouTube stuff, you know? And it was really fun to be able to talk to somebody about that in real life. And it allowed me to connect with so many other YouTubers in the area. And it was because of these connections that I established going out to a lot of these YouTube gatherings. Uh, in Japan specifically, there is the YouTube Hanami gathering as well as a summer gathering. And it was due to showing up to these events and networking with people that allowed me to get into freelance video editing. I've been doing it for about four years now. And when I got back to the States after I got out of the Navy, I started working for other channels on Japan, like uh, Eric Surf 6, Brian from Ramen Adventures, just to name a few. I wouldn't have gotten a chance to work with these guys were it not for my time out in Yokosuka or my time going to these networking events when I was stationed out in Japan. And I really love doing freelance video editing. It's allowed me to use my creativity for a different purpose. And I just love seeing someone else's creative vision through and just seeing how they react to the video as well as their audience. And it's just, it brings me like all kinds of joy. You know, I love making videos for myself, don't get me wrong, but it's, it's a different kind of joy making videos for other people. And I've been doing it for four, going on five years now. And I absolutely love it. And financially, freelancing has been such a game changer for me. It's allowed me to not have to financially rely as much on a J-O-B job. So I don't have to work quite as much outside of doing that. And, you know, since I've been out here in Japan, the majority of my income has been from the GI Bill as well as freelancing. So, not for nothing, but it's allowed me to really focus on making videos as a career. And so again, just to emphasize, it's not the numbers in the community that really matter. It's the people behind those numbers that matter. And I think if you focus on building a relationship with the people behind those numbers, then eventually you'll see those numbers grow. And even if you don't, you'll still have a much better time on YouTube if you focus on the people and not the numbers. So yeah, that's pretty much all I want to say in this episode of Andy Talks to Pandy. And what is that, guys? This is the Andy Sign. Sign for now. And as always, and forever, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang. Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks to Pandy. In today's episode, guys, I'm going to be doing a video response to one Mr. Dave Trippin. At the time of this recording, I've been studying abroad in Tokyo for nine months now, although due to current circumstances, the majority of my education here was spent in online classes. In addition to my time studying abroad in Japan, before that, from 2013 to 2015, I was stationed in Yokosuka when I was in the US Navy. So getting right into it, the obvious reason I don't fit in here in Japan is because, well, I'm not Japanese. I'm unapologetically American, and I love it despite the fear porn about America in the news and on Twitter. If anything, being outside of America makes me feel way more American than I ever felt when I was actually living in America. <laughs> Jeez, so many mentions of America. Who am I, Rachel from Rachel in June? In America. In America. In America. In America. In America. America. In America. In America. In America. In America. In America. America. Fuck yeah! So the reality is that in Japan, if you're not Japanese, you're seen as other, AKA big scary gaijin who doesn't understand the delicate intricacies of Japanese culture, such as ikegomi or garbage arrangement. Well, that takes care of that.
Now I've seen a lot of foreigners fresh off the boat make the mistake of trying too hard to assimilate into the Japanese culture, i.e. speaking only Japanese even when talking to foreigners who speak English, bragging nonstop about how many kanji they know, what JLPT level they're at, etc. And while it's best to take time to learn the language, something I myself need to do more seriously if I want to stay here in Japan long term, don't beat everyone over the head with how you appreciate the culture of Japan and that you're not like those gaijin who appreciate the culture. I think that in order to maximize your enjoyment here in Japan or elsewhere in the world is to embrace the fact that you are different and that your unique experiences and perspectives bring something refreshing to the table. Most Japanese people don't really know about foreign culture, so as I was always told by my Navy leadership, always be a good ambassador for yourself, your culture, and your country. Talk about what makes you unique. For me, although there are many veterans who live outside of America, especially in Asia, there aren't too many of them making videos talking about their experiences being stationed abroad and or living abroad as a veteran. And there aren't many students these days talking about their experiences studying abroad in Japan either, especially students in their 30s. Also, there aren't as many freelance video editors talking about their experiences in the field as there should be. This might be a topic for a future video though, so let me know if I should make a dedicated video about it. I'll also see if I can get some of my fellow creator friends to weigh in too. So ultimately, I would say that if you want to come to a foreign country, whether to study or to work or to visit, don't worry about not fitting in and instead embrace what makes you, well, you. If you're gonna be staying there longer than a few weeks, it would behoove you to learn the local language and customs, but don't lord your knowledge over people's heads. Use it to better understand and communicate with other people. So yeah, guys, that's why I don't fit in while studying abroad in Tokyo, Japan, and I'm perfectly okay with that. And with that said, this is the Andy san signing for now. As always, and forever, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. All right, and we're recording. Hey, gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks to Pandy. In today's episode, guys, I'm going to be talking to you about the people that are left behind to come out to uh, good old Japan. This video is a video response to uh, one Mr. Kurt Bell from the Softy Papa channel. I watched one of uh, Kurt's videos recently talking about his experience coming back to America and just the people that he left behind from his old life when he was out in Shizuoka, Japan. And it really inspired me to uh, kind of talk about my own experiences of leaving people behind. As you guys know, I was in the US Navy from 2010 to 2015. And during that time, I've uh, made a lot of friends, a lot more than uh, most introverts, I'd say. Sadly, a lot of them have kind of come and gone for my life. That being the, uh, the nature of the beast, as it were. With uh, being in the Navy, you get a lot of people who uh, come and go from commands. You know, they get transferred to elsewhere or they end up getting out of the Navy. In some cases, you yourself are the one getting transferred or uh, getting out of service. And uh, during that time, I kind of learned to uh, make peace with the fact that, you know, just because my friends are my friends now doesn't mean that they're gonna be my friends forever. And it's something that really took me a very long time to really come to, to peace with, you know, because I always maintained the fact that, you know, my friends are my friends forever unless, like, something happens, you know? And with uh, a lot of social media out there, you know, like Facebook and, you know, Twitter and such, you know, it allowed me to still keep in contact with everybody back home or elsewhere in the world. But as you guys know, long distance relationships are pretty hard to keep going after a while. You know, you're able to still kind of keep in contact and keep on the up and up with what they're up to. But since you're not there, it's, it's not re really uh, quite the same thing. And after a while, you just tend to grow apart from people. But thankfully, thanks to social media and uh, other circumstances, it's also allowed me to reconnect with a lot of old friends too. Like uh, my, uh, my best friend Eric, also known as Ariopolis. Like I'm wearing his, his shirt right now in fact. Twitch.tv slash Ariopolis. There's your plug, Eric. <laughs> but uh, in any event, just knowing that just because your friends may not be your friends forever, doesn't mean that they won't be your friends forever. Or at least for a pretty long time. You know, for me, when I came back to America in 2015, after I got out of the Navy, it was very hard for me to transition back to just being a regular dude back in America. And uh, it was very hard for me to, to connect with people. 
which is one of the main reasons my transition out of the military was so rough on me. And, you know, I didn't want to open myself back up again to other people, you know, with the knowing that uh, friendship doesn't always last forever and that, you know, if I put in all this time and effort to get to know a person and to hang out with them and share some moments and bond with each other that, you know, eventually either they're going to leave or I'm going to leave and it'll seemingly be all for naught. But I think that's just uh, part of the human experience, you know, people come and people go. Coming back out here to Japan has uh, really helped solidify that with me. When I came back to Japan at the end of 2019, I was really in some ways kind of surprised, uh, pleasantly so, that a lot of uh, my old friends from back in the day would uh, even give me the time of day, you know, after I came back. And that's kind of it's kind of shitty to say. It's not it's not an indictment on them at all. It's just just my own like neuroses, I guess, with uh, thinking about how well, if I left people behind, then they left me behind too. But really, you know, the mark of a good friend is someone who, even if you haven't like talked with them in a while, that you can just pick the conversation back up again, you know, once you do manage to reconnect. And uh, really, really glad and uh, appreciative of the, uh, the small friend circle that I do have. And I know there's gonna be uh, some people who come out to Japan either to study abroad like myself or uh, come out here to work or whatever the case and you know they're gonna be afraid of leaving their circle of friends behind or their family behind but uh, just want to let y'all know that it's perfectly okay to, uh, to feel that way and that uh, you know thanks to the wonderful technologies that are available you can still keep in uh, keep in touch with everybody the reality is that yes there are gonna be some people that you fall out with just based on the distance and everything. It's just life, basically. But uh, put forth some effort to uh, keep in contact with people. And with family, you know, like, shit. I can talk with my mom on my cell phone, like, right now, <laughs> you know? Um, even though I'm thousands of miles away from where she's at in Ohio, you know, I could say, Ohio from Japan. You know, I think back to uh, my main inspiration to even come out to Japan which uh, were my cousins, you know, back in the early 90s, they were stationed out in Yokosuka. And I just remember as a kid, they would, uh, you know, call every once in a while, long distance at like three in the morning, our time in Ohio. And, you know, we just talk about what's going on over there and just about school and TV and whatever the heck else was uh, going on in our lives back in the day, you know, to see how technology has evolved has allowed us to uh, stay connected in some form or fashion, even though it may not be ideal in some cases. But uh, just the fact that we even have these options is, uh, in a word, tremendous. So, shout out to Kurt, Kurt Bell from the Soccer Pop channel. Glad he's making videos again. He kind of dropped off there for a little bit. I guess he was writing a book or something. But uh, it was it was good for me to uh, to reconnect with him as well as his friend Molly from the uh, Molly's Place channel. They both kind of stopped making videos for a while and I had to like resubscribe to their channels to uh, figure out what was all going on with them. Didn't really know how to end it here. <laughs> I'm just kind of rambling and raving, I guess, just outside here at uh, Tamagawa or Tama River out here in uh, good old Japan. So anyway, with all that said guys, this is the Andy san signing for now. And as always, and forever, we'll see you next time. Catch you later guys, bye. All right, I'm recording. Hey gang, Andy here. Welcome to a brand new episode of Andy Talks Japandi. In today's episode, guys, I'm going to be talking to you about my experiences living cashless in Japan. And just for some clarification, by cashless, I don't mean being completely broke in Japan, but rather using cash alternatives such as my Passmo card or my credit card if I'm going to department stores. Now the idea for this video came about from a lot of Japan-based videos where they would talk about how Japan is largely a cash-based society. Most shops don't take cards, it's all cash only. Over the past few years, and especially past few months considering uh, what's all going around, 
um, Japan has been expediting the usage of cashless options, namely train cards as well as some credit cards in certain stores. And I decided with more stores accepting cashless alternatives to uh, try to live as cashless as possible in Japan, or even if it was possible at all. Here are my experiences. With Japan, like I said, it is largely a cash-based society and there are a lot of instances where you have to pay in cash and it can vary from store to store. Like uh, there's some places, like if you go to like a, a food truck or something like that, it's cash only. Also paying bills is cash only. So if you go to the convenience with your uh, little bill you get in the mail and uh, cash it in, uh, they'll only accept cash. They won't accept uh, the Passmo card or anything like that. Um, same with medical bills. So. I had to get some dental work done, which I'm gonna be doing an upcoming video talking about, and they don't accept cash. Another thing that hasn't been given a cashless option is laundry. So, out here in Japan, with the coin-based laundry, um, it is coin-based, so um, there are some laundry services that have some kind of card set up, but uh, they're pretty few and far between, so for the most part, you gotta use the, uh, the coin in the coin laundry. But for pretty much everything else, I was actually able to get by just fine in Japan just using my Passmo card. So if I were to go to uh, the convenience store, the grocery store, whatever, pick up something to eat, um, it was actually pretty easy to uh, get things cashed out with uh, either my Passmo card or with my credit card for certain stores. And uh, same with uh, department stores. Like usually if I'm buying a whole lot of stuff at like Don Quixote or something like that, using my credit card is uh, perfectly viable option. Yeah, I was actually really surprised with uh, how easy it is to live cashless in Japan. So right now, I have a full breakdown of my expenses for my Passmo card. And I got this on the Android store. It's called Suica Cable. It's an app that allows you to scan your card using the NFC reader on the back of your phone. So you just pop it on every couple days and it'll keep track of all your expenses. And if you get the premium version, the paid version, then it allows you to keep like a full log of all your expenses. And it was actually this app that let me know that my original Passmo card, because this is the one I got when I was first stationed out in Yokosuka, it let me know that there was actually an active balance on there and that I could still use it when uh, I would arrive in Japan. And it even has like old logs from my last time out in Yokosuka, like five years ago. So if you get the paid version, you can get like an unlimited log length, but if you get the regular version, it only allows you to keep your first uh, 20 transactions. And that's another thing to keep in mind is that this card can only hold up to, I think like 20 or 25 transactions. So that's why you gotta scan it every few days, especially if you use it a lot. And uh, it'll allow you to keep track of uh, what you're spending your money on. For the month of September, I spent 62,493 yen, or about 610, 615 dollars American. 6,435 yen on train costs, that's about 60, 62 bucks. Then I spent 440 yen, or about four bucks, on the bus. Then I spent 4,366 yen on vending machines, or about 40 bucks. Okay, hi, Editor Andy here. And uh, something I noticed while working on this video is the huge amount of money that I supposedly spent on vending machines. I know for a fact I didn't spend quite that much on vending machines last month. And one of the things that I'm thinking is, uh, for some of the things that I purchased at the Gamini, it's counting it as a vending machine purchase. So most likely drinks. So drinks that I buy at the Gamini and stuff like that, it's counting as a vending machine purchase. Um, I don't know for sure, there hasn't been any uh, documentation on the app that says this, but uh, that's just a little theory your boy has here. So I just wanna let y'all know that I'm not spending quite that much money on vending machines and that I'm not buying too much Mitsuya Peach. There is no such thing as too much Mitsuya Peach. And with that said, let's get back to the video. And the rest of it, 51,252 yen, or about 505 bucks American, was spent at uh, the store. In most cases was convenience store, either buying food or uh, other supplies, whether it's like uh, soap or uh, cleaning supplies or you know, like a scented stick diffuser <laughs> off on the side here. It's hard to get like a full breakdown as far as what I spent it on. You know, as far as did I spend it on food, did I spend it on toiletries? clothes, whatever, but uh, this will at least give you a general idea of what you spent your money on. It also shows you how many kilometers you've traveled on training the bus. 
So for the month of September, I, I traveled 236 kilometers. Definitely check out the, uh, the Suica Cable app on Android. I believe they also have one for uh, Apple Store as well, but uh, I'm an Android user, so can't say for certain, but uh, definitely check it out. And uh, the paid version, I think it's like five, 10 bucks or whatever. It's not really that much. And I think it's definitely worth it, especially if you want to track your uh, spending over a longer period of time. Definitely check that app out. And this is a uh, hashtag not an ad. So uh, I just really love the app. So, so overall, my experience is trying to live cashless in Japan. I was really surprised by how many stores had cashless paying options. I believe that it's only gonna get uh, more pervasive as time goes on. And I think more stores and more services are gonna have cashless paying options. And uh, really looking forward to seeing that. Also keep in mind that uh, yes, Japan is a cash-based society. So there are some things that you do have to pay for in cash. So always have a couple extra bills stacked away just in case. And with that said, guys, this is the Andy Sound. Sign up for now. And as always, forever, we'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey, guys, Andy here. And today, I'm going to be talking to you about the question that every foreigner in Japan must ask themselves at some point. And that is, should I stay in Japan or should I go somewhere else? And that's something, to be honest, is what I'm dealing with right now and for the past few months now, actually. As you guys know, the old cloney macaroni going around in the air. It's been really hard for me to really get used to a lot of different aspects about this new normal. And one of them has been social, which I didn't really think would be much of an issue for me because, you know, being an introvert, I don't really need a whole lot of social interaction to get by, but I do need some social interaction at some point. And with what's going on in the world right now, making it very difficult to talk to people one-on-one, -on -one, not gonna lie, it's definitely really affected my mental health. Now, that's not to say that I don't have anybody to talk to out here, because as you guys know, I've been hanging out a lot with uh, Eric from the Eric Surf 6 channel, not just for video shoots and stuff like that, you know, we just hang out as friends as well. You know, it's really been helping me get through these rough times, but I had to ask myself, you know, is it really worth it to continue to stay here in Japan? Not just for the, you know, social aspect, but for other aspects as well. And it's just something I've been working through right now. I think at this point, I don't really have a definitive answer either way, but I am looking at different options for myself post-graduation because right now, not really a whole lot I can do about it just because I'm going through college, gonna be finishing up around this time next year with my bachelor's degree. So at that point, I'll be able to apply for a work visa here in Japan. And that's something else that's also been gnawing at the old head brain is just kind of the future of not just myself in Japan, but myself in general. As you guys know, I've been a freelance video editor essentially since 2015 and been working with so many different channels, a couple of different production companies out here in Japan as well. And I've just been loving doing what I do and I want to continue to pursue that in the future. But as far as getting visa sponsored gigs out here in Japan, doing that sorts of stuff, it's definitely hard to come by. It's not impossible. I will say that there are definitely gigs out here for that, but they are pretty hard to come by. And a lot of it does come down to network as well as timing. So you just gotta get in while the getting's good, basically. And it's been just really weighing on me lately. Now, I know I'm probably gonna get a couple guys in the comments saying, well, Andy, you could just apply to be a Joe Blow English teacher and just get the easy visa and a paycheck and just continue to do this little hobby of yours on the side. And yes, that is a possibility. I could definitely very well do this as a side income, but this is my passion, you guys. And it's also my future career as well once I graduate and can actually pursue it full time instead of just doing freelance work. It's just one of those things where I, I strongly believe in what I do, my skill set, and everything, and I want to continue to do this. That might mean leaving Japan. And it's a reality that I'm beginning to accept 
It's not one that I really want to happen. And it's something that a lot of foreigners out here have to accept as well, that, you know, you eventually reach that ceiling of opportunity, especially if you don't know Japanese and don't have a strong network out here, uh, that ceiling is very low. You know, I've talked with a lot of other English teachers and that's just kind of the reality of the situation. You know, you just hop from one school to the next, your rate of pay doesn't really increase all that much for the most part, because if you go to another school, you start off at the base pay, whereas if you stay with that school, your pay slowly goes up. So you can't even negotiate for a higher salary coming into another company like you would in America. You know, as a single guy, it's not really that much of an issue. Like I could get by just fine teaching English out here with if it's just me that I have to worry about. But I'm also thinking a bit more long-term, you know, like I want to start a family at some point. You know, I'm not getting any younger. And if I want to start a family, it's gotta be at some point in the very near future, you know? I just want to make sure I'm in a good financial situation to accommodate having a family. But looking into possibly moving back to the States, there's definitely a lot more opportunity out there for video production work and editing and all this other sorts of stuff. And it's not just in LA and New York, although that those are the main hubs for that sort of work. With the proliferation of the internet, there's definitely a lot of other places out there in America for jobs with video production, including even near where I used to live in Ohio. Not to say I'm gonna move back there. <laughs> My goal is to stay as far away from that place as possible, to be honest with you guys. But it just goes to show, you know, how far these opportunities have come in recent years. And that should my time in Japan come to an end, that I'll be okay. You know, I'll have that strong portfolio, be able to apply to a job out in America, get something and continue on during this time and be able to make a career for myself doing video production. Because that's ultimately what I'm passionate about and can't really say much more about that, to be honest. Every foreigner has to ask themselves, ultimately, what's keeping them here in Japan? And for me right now, in this moment, it's continuing to go to college out at Lakeland University of Japan and being one of the inaugural bachelor graduates from that school. That's really my goal in the short term, in the less than a year category, I'm proud to say. And from there, you know, continuing on to build a career in video production, whether that's here in Japan or elsewhere in the world. So I guess this is also <laughs> a video response to Jim of the Kids Show You Can channel. He put out a video recently talking about what's keeping him in Japan. He's been in Japan for going on 10 years at this point. I think he's at like seven or eight, but I watched his video and it really got me thinking about where I stand here in Japan. Gave me the inspiration to make this video as well. So with all that said guys, this is Andy. Sign up for now. And as always, forever. We'll see you next time. Catch you later, guys. Bye. Hey, guys. Andy here. And today on Andy Talks Japandi, I'm going to be talking to you about five ways I would do college differently on the GI Bill if I could go back in time. And so just for a little bit of context, I got out of the U.S. Navy on September 24th, 2015, which was a little over six years ago now. I had already been accepted into Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo when I was still active duty, but the fall semester had already started by the time I got out. So I stayed with my parents for three months until I got my apartment right before starting the following semester in 2016. And not gonna lie, it was rough for me at first because at that point I had just turned 30 and went into college three months after I got out thinking that I was basically just gonna be the old fuck. And in most cases I was. Hearing stories about 9-11 and how most kids weren't even born when it happened made me feel old as fuck, let me tell you what. So even though I'm an introvert, I find most college kids these days are very open to being friends with somebody older than them and with a way different life experience. But like with anywhere, you do get shitbirds who need a few more years to grow up, but don't let them ruin your college experience. Now I'm gonna be graduating next summer and turning 36 at the end of the year Ooh, my old bones are aching just saying that. And if I had to do the whole thing over again, I would, number one, do research on not just the college, but the whole area. It's hard to get a full beat on a place without physically being there, so don't commit until you've toured the campus and driven around town. 
The first two colleges I went to were in Kalamazoo, Michigan, which were Western Michigan, like I said before, as well as Kalamazoo Valley Community College. And unless you have family in the area, and aside from going up to Grand Rapids for the weekends, there's not a whole lot to do there, really. Not to mention the traffic could get unbearable at times. And the drivers are the usual Michigan flavor of mega crazy. If you've driven to Michigan, you know. Also, grab some Culver's for you, boy. So number two, give yourself time to readjust to things. I had a lot of anxiety and depression problems rear their ugly heads when I went from being four deployed to a college degree seeking student in America. Although they would have surfaced eventually, my problems that is, if I had better resources to deal with them, then I would not have failed many courses initially and wasted my GI Bill. Having a support network of friends, family, therapists, and so on is essential, especially in the beginning when you're adjusting. Now, based on the people that I've talked to who have gotten out, I find that the married folk have a much easier time readjusting to things than the single folk, but your mileage may vary. All right, and number 30. Take a break from college if you need to. If you're going through some shit and it's just not getting any better, don't try to suck it up and carry on. Taking a gap year when shit hit the fan was honestly the best thing I've done. I lived with my folks for a while and it was great to spend some time with them. As everyone gets older, you don't always have that luxury. And taking time away from college also allowed me to regroup and come back into college with a clear mind and goals rather than, well, this is my college and major, I guess. Number four, don't spend money like you did when you were in. I burned through my $12,000 of savings in a few months because I thought I could live off of just the GI Bill. So I would just buy stuff and not worry about it. But I didn't account for not getting my first full check until three months into college. That, along with buying a car and moving expenses, whittled down my savings quickly. Also, don't be too proud to work a job just because you think it's beneath you. I eventually started working at McDonald's on the weekends to help cover expenses, but at that point my savings was completely gone and I was just barely keeping my head above water. And the last one, number five. Don't limit yourself to just going to colleges in the states where your family lives, or even just America in general. When I was in my gap year, I contacted an old shipmate of mine who was going to school in Japan. I didn't even know that you could do that on the GI Bill. But after some research and a recommendation from my friend and fellow veteran, Jim of the Kid Short You Can channel, I decided on Lakeland University, Japan, rehabbed my GPA at the community college, and I arrived right before the country lockdown. Plus, the cost of living is generally lower abroad than stateside, so you aren't stressing about bills as much. And since American holidays aren't observed here, I don't get my GI Bill dinged since school is still in session. The longest break period I get, though, is a month-long break in between semesters. And yes, unfortunately, those are unpaid. So yeah, those were five ways I would do college on the GI Bill differently if I could go back in time. And if you could go back in time and redo college, what would you do? Whether you were on the GI Bill or not, let me know in the comments down below in the boopity boops. All right, so before we close out the video, I just want to talk about some updates to this channel and other things. So if you're not interested in that, appreciate your time. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, do all that YouTuber shit and deuces.